Between Williamsburg, Virginia and Richmond, Virginia, runs the Virginia Capitol Trail. It winds 51.7 miles from the first English colonial settlement in Virginia to its modern day capital. The trail runs through the beautiful countryside of the state, parallel to the James River. When walking or biking on the scenic, separated paved route, you can breathe in the 400 year history of Virginia in the United States, spanning from 1607 to today. The story I have for you spans a shorter period of time by a factor of 20, starting on November 18th, 2002. But I think that this theme of time and distance is instructive. 51.7 miles is 272,976 feet, and there are 631,152,000 seconds between November 18th, 2002 and the same date in 2022. To map the total time between the November 18th of 2002 to 2022, with each foot representing a span of time, we can use simple arithmetic to arrive at a scale of 38 minutes and 32 seconds per foot. In other words, if you put one foot in front of the other about every 40 minutes, you'd cover the distance in 20 years. Looking at some other scales, that's 37 feet per day, 261 feet per week, around 1,050 feet per month, and 2.53 miles per year, or, believe it or not, anywhere from four to five and a half feet for your typical speed run of Metroid Prime, which is actually about the length of this bike, which will be our vehicle, both literal and metaphorical, to traverse this story. Dear viewer, you have not clicked on the wrong video, but you may be confused. The title promised a brief history of Metroid Prime speedrunning. We've barely talked about speed, running, or a game called Metroid Prime. We'll get to all those soon enough, but if belabored metaphor is expounding on abstract concepts explained with tedious detail over a long period of time aren't your thing, then you may have actually clicked on the wrong video, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. 51.7 miles in 20 years. The history of Metroid Prime speedrunning. <laughs> You might be wondering what you're looking at, and if you are, that's a totally reasonable response. I'm here in Southern Ontario, which actually contains an unusual concentration of Metroid Prime talent. I'm sitting here with Tom, who's been playing the game pretty much ever since it came out and knows virtually everything there is to know about this game. A little bit later, I'm also going to interview Fusion Varia, who tasses the game, and we'll explain all of this later, but we might not explain it to the depth of detail that is possible to explain. I want to introduce these people first of all, because we're going to be showing the interviews a bit later, but also just to say right at the front end that this game has an impossible to explain level of depth, and that's part of the reason that people have loved it for so many years. So without further ado, let's get into it. Metroid Prime. Maybe this game was a staple of your childhood, and this music instantly brings you back to the hours spent exploring the planet of Talon 4. Maybe you've never heard this music, yet this foreboding and mysterious melody is appealing. Either way, if this music stirs something up in you, I think you'll find something of interest in this story. This is a story of a community that loved this game, and the people that still love it today. There is something about this game that has kept people coming back to play it for almost 20 years, and not only play it, but discuss it, pry it apart, and reassemble it from the pieces to build up shared passion around it. Metroid Prime did pretty well when it came out. It's the sixth best-selling game on the GameCube at 2.8 million copies sold, although it was outsold by a factor of almost 3 to 1 by console bundled titles like Smash Bros and Mario Kart. Its immersive story and beautifully crafted worlds gained the emerging developer Retro Studios several Game of the Year titles, and it was a smash hit among game critics at its release. However, let's compare, using ounces of water, the sales numbers of Metroid Prime at 2.8 million or 2.8 ounces to more popular and recent Nintendo titles such as Animal Crossing New Horizons 39 million, bundled titles such as Wii Sports 64 million, cultural phenomenon games like Minecraft 238 million, or just for fun, entire franchises like Mario 768 million copies across all titles. 
By sales numbers alone, Metroid Prime is basically an historical footnote, a beloved title on a beloved yet commercially middling console. Going by the numbers alone, you might expect that Metroid Prime would go down as another item of nostalgia in the progression of video game development. And yet, with the growing mainstream popularity of speedrunning events like Games Done Quick in the early 2010s, streaming platforms like Twitch, and sites compiling speedrun times like speedrun.com, many popular titles from the late 90s and early 2000s would enjoy a massive renaissance as nostalgia and the profligate expansion of content created new booming communities around developing and watching speedruns. Speedrun Runners streaming titles from the Mario and Legend of Zelda series gained massive followings. There was, and still is, a booming competitive scene for the Smash Bros. franchise. Nintendo games from over 20 years ago once again occupied a dominant place in the contemporary video gaming ecosystem. Now, you've chosen to embark on a six-hour video about speedrunning, so there's a decent chance you already know all this. And if you know about Metroid Prime, you may also realize that in the midst of all this resurgent popularity of older Nintendo games, Metroid Prime was somewhat overshadowed by by other titles. However, if you haven't heard of or haven't considered Metroid Prime, you are overlooking one of the longest, and in my opinion, most interesting speedrunning histories of any game. Despite solid commercial success and critical accolades, the popularity of speedrunning Metroid Prime never quite exploded like other games of the era, and all the proof you need is to look at the most popular games by run submitted on speedrun.com. The bright worlds and beautiful third-person movement of Super Mario 64 has generated over 25,000 runs. Its follow-up, which for many years was considered too long and cutscene heavy for speedrunning, Super Mario Sunshine has generated over 8,000 runs. Its popularity surged as its community began to discover tricks to drastically bring the time down. Super Metroid was the last Metroid game released before Metroid Prime in 1994 and is considered one of the best games in the series and a masterpiece of the 2D platforming genre. It sits at over 9,000 runs on speedrun.com. Yet, as of this recording, Metroid Prime sits way down the list at just over 1,000 runs between Final Fantasy X and... Uh, Grant, Granny? What is this game? It's like a mobile, like an iPhone horror game? I, anyway, whatever. As we'll see in this video, the community surrounding Metroid Prime and its shared passion for the game pioneered many of the aspects dear to speedrunning today. Yet, most of its history has been largely overlooked. Maybe it's the first person view, which admittedly isn't exactly spectator friendly. Maybe it's the antiquated insistence on using the in-game timer, or the large number of cutscenes in the game. Maybe it's the fact that this game has the horrible curse of being about a thousand times harder to play than it actually looks, which is often commented on at Games Done Quick. This is like a hundred times harder than Miles is making it look. That is also much harder than it looks. But it's definitely quite a bit trickier than Justin made it look there. It's a lot harder than it looks. That jump is so much harder than it looks. <laughs> much harder than it looks. That is also much harder than it looks. Much harder than it looks. It's much harder than it looks. What's the hardest thing people don't know about running Metroid Prime. It's so complicated. If you successfully spell DF with power beam shots before the Ridley fight. <laughs> Harder than it sounds. Perhaps this game will never truly be popular, but it will always be loved. And that love for this game has made some pretty incredible history over the past 20 years. While the community for speedrunning Metroid Prime has never been large, it's always been dedicated. It's also never quite gained the following or interest that other games have enjoyed. Despite a half decade of the popular world record history format, no one has told the unbelievably fascinating history of Metroid Prime on YouTube. The iceberg went way deeper than I ever could have realized. And even at over six hours long, I feel like this video is really only giving a cursory overview of the depth of this game. Nonetheless, in this video, I'll do my best to give an honest and thorough account as to what makes the game interesting, challenging, unique, and even historic. Still, it's an outsider's perspective. I played this game a great deal as a kid, fell in love with it, and even browsed many of the websites I'll mention later in the early 2000s. But I lost track of the community shortly after. When I rediscovered the game 15 years later, I was astounded by how much had been discovered ever since. Researching for this video was a combination of joy in personally discovering it and curiosity towards finding an answer to some simple questions. How could this game be developed so consistently for almost 20 years, yet not have exploded in popularity in the same way other speedrunning games have? How had a well-defined Metroid Prime speedrunning community existed for years prior to the explosion of popularity in speedrunning, yet Metroid Prime itself was never really in the limelight? Ultimately, I think there's a good reason for both why it never sat atop the charts of popular speedrunning games, but also why people have loved it for so many years. And it's an easy explanation. It's so hard to play, and you wouldn't guess it just by watching people do it. But some people seem to love a challenge, and they keep coming back to it, because there's always room for improvement. Long before people fell in love with the challenge of speedrunning as we know it today, they fell in love with the beautifully made game.
Since Prime's release in 2002, there's always been a small group of people who have played it and discussed it online. Among that small group, there's an even smaller handful of people who have worked to beat the game as quickly as possible with no restrictions on items. The category is simply called Any Percent. The runs in this category are held up as the sample specimens of Metroid Prime speedrunning, and some are even lovingly crafted over many years, piece by piece. It's my opinion that this small group of people pioneered many of the things we love about speedrunning today. Yet, the thing that tied this group together and drove them towards that development was a game. And that game has remained unchanged in 20 years, even as the community has meticulously picked it apart. This is a history of that community and the game that they loved, the things they fought over, and the things they discovered about the game. This is a history of the Metroid Prime Any% Percent world record. This video is divided into sections, linked in the comments or on the play bar below. There aren't many world records in the Metroid Prime Any% Percent category, or any of the categories for that matter, but every run is interesting in its own way. So we'll be talking about basically every run in some detail, as well as the people that completed each run. In between the runs, we'll talk about certain topics which help give context to the game, the community, and the broader culture of speedrunning which grew up with and around Metroid Prime. Before we get into all that though, all that being like everything about this video, I thought I should introduce myself. Hello, my name is Nick and I made this video. Uh, it took me almost three years to do. Um, I actually just interrupted myself when I recorded the previous audio in 2021 uh, with what I'm recording now in like late summer of 2023. I'm gonna like move different studios in the video because I'll like, I actually physically had to move, but uh, anyway, that's, that's a long story. Before we get into any discussion of the game itself, I actually think it's gonna be helpful to discuss a little bit of my personal history with it. To do that, I actually think that the city that I live in, Richmond, Virginia, is a good illustration. And it's part of the reason that we'll be using it as the uh, destination in the timeline of events for this video, which you'll be uh, introduced to in just a little bit. Richmond is about as old as cities get in the United States. You'll find layers and layers of material history here to peel back and investigate, even as daily life charges forward in time. One of my favorite examples of this is this old hydroelectric plant on Belle Isle, which literally means beautiful island, and it lives up to its name. It sits in the middle of the James River, and it's an example of the collision of the distant past and the present. On the one hand, you have these old industrial ruins and you know frames of old buildings, and on the other hand, you have joggers and hikers and bikers and all manner of uh, people enjoying the outdoors and the beautiful views of the city. In that vein, another one of my favorite places are these massive granite pillars in the James River, which used to form a railway bridge over the river. But they haven't carried a train in over 140 years. Instead, these granite pillars serve now as a venue for rock climbing for the outdoors crowd here in Richmond. History and the present always collide in cities. And when there are people enlivening a space, the physical material of the past always gets absorbed, appropriated, and used in new ways every day. But what if a city, but no people? Here is one of the core reasons that I love Metroid Prime. It is by far one of the most convincing games I've ever played in conveying an atmosphere of mystery, abandonment, and former vitality. So much of the game's design and lore revolve around this idea of a once powerful race which was driven from their home, a home which feels so close to being vital and alive, yet is being reclaimed by wild creatures, invaded by the scourge of intergalactic pirates, and choked out by a deadly poison. Here's a fascinating chicken and egg sort of problem. I played this game a lot when I was young, when I was about eight years old. In the many years since then, I've uh, since become interested in photography, especially landscape photography. Some of my favorite subjects in my photos, which are here on the screen, are desolate cityscapes and industrial buildings, which are suggestive of some of those same things that we find in Metroid Prime. Buildings which convey life and vibrancy, but also an emptiness and foreboding, which is shown through the absence or minimization of people. So, which came first? An innate or even genetic interest in this style based on some immutable quality of my personality? Or was this taste shaped by the formative and inspirational effects of good art of the video game Metroid Prime? Part of the reason that this game has meant so much to me is that I really do think that it lit a creative spark in my mind, even if some of the dry kindling or latent interest was already a part of me. Figuring out whether 
the inspiration of good art or other inherent interests in me were more operative is ultimately an unanswerable question. But in considering this question, I think there's fertile ground for discussion on how art and video games can have a formative effect on us at any age. I believe that good art should enliven and broaden how we think about the world and the people around us. Good art, including video games, present new horizons of possibility. They spark discussion and they foster community around a shared enjoyment of the same thing. Metroid Prime fits all of these criteria. I'll say this plainly at the beginning of this project, and I think it's important to understand. The design of this game's world, the environment, and the characters just feel like they could go on and on. Unlike many of the games of the time in the late 90s and early 2000s, with their massive polygonal cliffs and the clear sense of void beyond, this game's world really does feel like if there were just one more door, you could go on exploring the ruins of Talon 4 and the Chozo. But also, in contrast to the more contemporary design philosophy of open world and worlds which really do go on and on, the conciseness and intentionality of Metroid Prime and the care put into each individual room convey massive amounts of information through environmental storytelling in fascinating ways. I'll give you just, uh, I can't help myself. I'm gonna give you like one example before we move on into a broader discussion of what the game is. I, I can't stop myself from geeking out about this game just a little bit. Throughout the game, there are safe stations. As you enter one, the music shifts, and as you step into the safe station, there's an animation which suggests Samus's suit is being repaired, your health is replenished, and you have the tangible relief of knowing that your progress has been saved and you've just reached a moment where you can relax as a player of the game. Additionally, when you step into most of the safe stations of the game, each one is kind of styled in the, in the sensibilities of the world that it's in. Almost all of them have the safe station featured very prominently as soon as you walk into the room. You know that you are safe once you see that column of light. But there's this one safe station in Phazon Mines, one of the later and more dangerous levels of the game. Once you arrive in the level, you go looking for the typical safe station found at the beginnings of most of the worlds. But its location isn't convenient or obvious. You have to traverse up this spider ball track, and once you're actually in the door, you're not greeted by the familiar and calming safe station, but rather with a pile of burning rubble blocking a hallway which suggests further depths. It's not until you turn the corner and actually scan some bars which block your progress that you have access to this familiar relief. This doesn't functionally really add anything to the game. It's not a puzzle. Uh, there's no, you know, story meaning to this safe station being the way it is. It's just, I mean, like, look at these fish. I don't, it's really cool. There's, there's, there's so much extraneous detail packed into this single room. And really, all of the rooms in the game are like this to some extent. I could go on and on about the tiny design decisions like this one, which are functionally very small aspects of gameplay, but they make a tremendous impact towards making the world of the game feel immersive. And even though the world is relatively small, at least by today's standards, it really does feel like it could keep going. But let's not tarry here too long. Metroid Prime is a 20-year-old game that you probably have never heard of and almost definitely have never played. So there's a good chance you don't know anything about it. Let's all get on the same page. What is it? Metroid Prime was the first time that players would have the opportunity to control the series' protagonist, Samus Aran, in 3D space. Every other major Nintendo franchise had made the transition from 2D top-down or side-scroller game into three dimensions. But the N64 had lacked a Metroid game of any kind. The responsibility and the opportunity to take the property into three dimensions was given to a fledgling outfit in Austin, Texas called Retro Studios. There was initially some skepticism that this could be done well, or even at all, but Retro proved the haters wrong. The game was overwhelmingly a critical and commercial success. Let's get oriented with our map. The timeline zero point is November 18th, 2002, the North American release date of Metroid Prime. The world events around this time are not particularly pleasant, and I don't write history, I just report it. Literally two days before Metroid Prime's release, the first case in what would become known as the SARS epidemic was reported, caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-1. And yes, if that name sounds familiar, there's a reason. The prior month, in the US, we had the DC sniper attacks, so we have a brief little moment here in 2002. Retro Studios releases a video game about fighting pirates and aliens in a mysterious world, yet out of this fearful time in our own mysterious world, just a week's worth of feet away, a mere five one hundredths of a mile down the trail, we have the Homeland Security Act, fallout from the big epical event only three miles behind us. Yet. 
admittedly on the other side of the river. But hey, just a bit further down the timeline is my eighth birthday. Before we go, Caroline and I would like you to join us for a little celebratory dinner. Up Talon Overworld. Nice. Celebrate. Celebrate what, David? Is it the sniper attacks? Is it the, the looming global pandemic? Is it the encroachment on American liberty from an unprecedented terrorist attack? What are we celebrating? It's my birthday, Pope. Perhaps I got a copy of Metroid Prime. And what is Metroid Prime? I don't expect you to have perfect knowledge of a 20-year-old game. So first, let's talk about what the game is. The first level of the game, the space pirate frigate Orpheon, or just the frigate, is the tutorial level. Sometimes explicitly, and sometimes implicitly. Explicitly because the game literally walks you through how to control Samus in three dimensions and how to interact with certain objects. And implicitly because it familiarizes you with how the overall story of the game is going to be told. There's no narration and very little forced exposition beyond the lines of on-screen text. Yet through the eerie environment, the haunting score, and bits of writing accessed via the scan visor, the player learns all about the world they are stepping into on their own terms. For the casual player, it's a perfect introduction to 3D Metroid and the story of the game. For a speedrunner though, it's just a warm up. Samus defeats the boss of the world, the Parasite Queen, and must evacuate immediately as the frigate falls apart, losing all her power-ups in the process. All the while, the timer counting down from 7 minutes imparts urgency and tension. The on-screen timer is an often repeated element of Metroid games at critical moments, and from the very outset of the game, the player is thinking about playing the game to a clock. Samus sees Ridley, a recurring boss of the Metroid series, and it seems as though she must square off with the wicked creature. But it flees, and Samus tails it to the surface of Talon 4, where the rest of the game takes place. Once she's landed on the surface, ground-based reconnaissance begins. And what does ground-based reconnaissance entail exactly? Samus travels through the five major worlds of the game, Talon Overworld, Chozo Ruins, Magmore Caverns, Fendrana Drifts, and Phazon Mines. Recovering her abilities and power-ups and learning the plight of the Chozo, whose planet was infected by the Great Poison brought by a meteor hitting their planet. Samus, our silent protagonist, travels to the depths and heights of Talon IV, hunts down her perennial nemeses, the Space Pirates, and finally rids Talon IV of the Great Poison itself, Metroid Prime. Very good. But what are the actual things you have to do to complete the game? Well, let's look at the map. Coming from the blue dot, the frigate, you have to end up at the orange dot, the impact crater, to fight Metroid Prime. Here to here. Not hard, right? The only thing stopping you from entering the crater are 12 artifacts scattered throughout the world by the Chozo in an attempt to seal the great poison in the impact crater. They're hidden all around the map, like so. Unfortunately, you can't simply go pick them up, as many paths are restricted until you gain certain abilities or power-ups, also scattered around the world, like so. The game isn't totally linear, but the path is fairly restrictive. For example, when you start, you can really only go here. With missiles, you can go here. You get the picture. When it comes to the artifacts, you have some wiggle room to pick them up along the way if you're astute or have played the game before, but you can't get all of them until you have all the upgrades. Let's imagine a short route through the game, going from one item to the next without major skips or tricks, close to a dev intended route. Disclaimer, this map isn't a perfect one-to-one -one with the actual rooms in the game. There are many little buffer rooms which allow the game to live the next big room. Most of the big rooms are on this map and I'll- Let's take a look. Bear with me, as the progression of this game can be confusing if you've never played it. But if you follow along, it will help make sense later of why certain skips are so important. From Talon Overworld, you go to Chozo Ruins to get the Missile Launcher, Morph Ball, Charge Beam, Morph Ball Bombs, and finally rounding out the first section of the game, you get the Varia Suit after fighting the cutscene monster. And through Magmore Caverns, and you can grab the Artifact of Nature here, you go to Fendrana Drifts to get the Boost Ball. Then back to Talon Overworld to the room right behind your ship Spoilers. to get the Space Jump Boots. Then back to Fendrana through Magmore, getting the Artifact of Strength on the way, and acquiring the Wave Beam. Hmm. Wow, that's a nice artifact right there, right next to the- You use this to enter the pirate research facility, and you get the super missile and thermal visor, then fight Thardis to get the spider ball. Then you go back to Chozo Ruins to get the ice beam, snagging the artifact of Wild on the way. Then it's one of the longest backtracks of the game to go back into Fendrana Drifts to get the gravity suit, which you use to pass through the crashed and mostly flooded space pirate frigate to enter Phazon Mines. In Phazon Mines, you get the power bomb and grapple beam, only to leave and return to Magmore Caverns for the plasma beam. 
Now, the game doesn't tell you to do this, but you can swing through Chozo Ruins to get the artifacts of Life Giver and World, which conveniently puts you near this elevator to Talon Overworld to get the X-Ray Visor and Chozo Artifact. At this point, you'll have opened the bars to enter Phazon Mines without going through the crashed frigate. So you'll enter Phazon Mines to get the final upgrades, getting the Artifact of Warrior on your way to fight the Omega Pirate to get the Phazon Suit and Phazon Beam. Now you'll be able to get the Artifact of Newborn. Heading back through Magmore Caverns and into Fendrana Drifts, you'll sweep up the last three artifacts there, pass one last time through Magmore Caverns, and head to the Impact Crater, getting the Artifact of Truth therein. With the final item in hand, let's just take a quick look at everything you've collected and the order in which it was collected. We'll reference the schematic view a couple more times, showing how various runners have completed the game, and it is going to change a lot. With 12 artifacts in hand, the impact crater is open, but Meta Ridley attacks. Samus clocks that bird cold dead and can finally enter the impact crater. Let me just say, by the way, that the impact crater is such an aesthetic change of pace, such a different environment from everywhere you've already been in the game, that I can still remember the chills I got when playing this game for the first time as a kid. Samus makes her way through this nightmare zone to fight the eponymous beast of the game, Metroid Prime. This freaky hanging crab nightmare face. Anyway, once you defeat the two phases of Metroid Prime, you've beaten the game. The player is given a final cinematic where Samus looks down on the collapsing temple, thinking of all the trials she's been through. And finally, after all the struggles, bosses, backtracking, the gripping finale, you see the credits. And after the credits, the numbers which have captivated generations of Metroid players. The completion percentage and in-game timer. Ah yes, in-game time. Let's cover one of the first quirky aspects of Metroid Prime speedrunning. If you're thinking of speedrunning, you're probably thinking of the total amount of time between the first input the player has and the last. And in most cases, you're right. Almost every major speedrunning game is timed with the total elapsed time from the start of the game to the last frame of input. But not Metroid Prime. At the end of the game, the in-game timer is displayed, right here where it says total time. This is the total amount of time that the player has controlled Samus. If we look at the artifact of nature being collected in real time, you can see that the menu dialog takes up a significant chunk of time, whereas the only thing that's counted towards the in-game timer at the end of the game are the actual frames that the player has controlled Samus. Cutscenes such as bosses or item pickups, and I see you infamous 40 second various suit cutscene, and the 20-ish second elevator transitions between worlds. form a decent chunk of real time out of any Metroid Prime speedrunning, but they don't count at all towards IGT. This timer is imprecise yet totally accurate. It is a perfect account of every instance the player steered Samus through the game, yet only records to a precision of one minute increments. It's also the number that every Metroid Prime speedrunner has eagerly awaited at the completion of every single run for the last 20 years. Even as the conventions for timing a speed run have changed, the Metroid Prime community continued to use this rather old school method of timing. Most of the games in the Metroid series before and since have featured full game completion time either on the end screen or related in some way to the ending. This makes the game somewhat unique among Nintendo's marquee action adventure platforming games. Even the original Super Mario Bros, which was meant to be played in one sitting even by casual players, didn't have any indication of the time it took you to beat the game despite the well, timer in the corner, which only counted down the time you had to beat each individual level. Yet now, as a speedrunning game, the game is timed down to the thousandth of a second. As Mario, Legend of Zelda, and other Nintendo games got longer, time was included on the file select as a way to help differentiate the files, but Metroid was relatively unique in displaying the time at the end of the game. Metroid, the NES contemporary of Super Mario Bros, also featured an in-game timer, though it didn't show you the time at the end. An early indication of the fact that Metroid was meant to be played quickly was that the reward for a quick completion was an increasingly disrobed, or a dissuited, I guess, view of Samus. At over 10 hours, Samus looks away from you. 5 to 10 is the normal ending with Samus waving at you. 3 to 5 hours gives you a view of Samus without her helmet showing, Gasp! She's a woman! One to three hours gives you a view of Samus without her suit entirely, and under one hour gives you a view of Samus in a pixelated bikini. Now, more could be said about this, but considering that the character under the suit was made a woman arbitrarily, and for shock value among the developers, the reward for a quick completion is rather gross. 
Turning the bog standard script of man rescues damsel in distress on its head is an interesting move, especially in the 80s. And Samus's womanhood has slowly been explored as a narrative fixture of the story in interesting ways in later games. But Nintendo's real posture is belied by the end screens. Making the female protagonist take off more of her clothes at the end of the game if you played it well seems to betray a historical reading of a Japanese company in the 1980s being progressive. I'll give them credit though. At least Super Metroid just had the shit. Oh, Oh, no. Okay, that comes later. All right. Fortunately, Retro Studios leaned away from the objectification of the series heroine. The best ending in Metroid Prime is just a cinematic painting shot of Samus surveying the destruction of the temple. Also interesting in Metroid Prime was the fact that the time was no longer the deciding factor for the best ending of the game, which is given for 100% completion after acquiring all of the expansions, which may be more in keeping with the true spirit of Metroid as an exploration-based game. But since there was a long lineage of Metroid and Super Metroid prominently featuring the clear time on the last screen, there was also a long record of who beat the games the fastest, and as such, Metroid and speedrunning have always been closely tied. The history of Lois Times had always been recorded using the actual timer from the game. Before people had computers that assisted in timing a game based on the first and last inputs, the time on the console was likely the only thing that made sense to players when thinking about the fastest time beating a game. Why would you overcomplicate it with something like a stopwatch when the game already shows you the time? However, as Metroid and Super Metroid attracted more players and the routes became optimized to the point of standardization, it no longer made sense to have a ton of tied times. Metroid and Super Metroid both shifted over to RTA timing as the standard for reckoning the world record time, but the Prime series has never shifted. It's still timed with the in-game time. The short answer for why this is the case is that the community has had little to no interest in changing the timing method. The in-game timer is accurate down to the scale of a single frame, despite only showing minute increments. The progression of time has basically ticked down minute by minute, and although the record has been briefly shared at some points, the community hasn't lost any sleep over it. At any given stage, there's usually only a small handful of runners with the skill and experience necessary to contend for the top slot. Furthermore, if real-time running were adopted as the standard rather than in-game time, the focus of optimization would change completely from making movement through rooms as quick as possible and finding the most efficient route through the game to avoiding cutscenes at all costs. With over 20 years of optimizing the time based on one parameter, it would be a huge mentality shift for the speedrunners to change now. IGT is just the de facto standard of the community, and there's no indication of that changing anytime soon. As we'll see, the world record will go through huge shifts as new strategies are adopted, new techniques are discovered, and new allowances are made for how the game is played. The in-game timer, though, is emblematic of the community striving and working to lower that final number that everyone can see when they beat the game. The Metroid Prime community was never primarily interested in the sort of record trading and dramatic segment-by-segment -segment splits that RTA timing fosters, as world records are broken by mere fractions of a second in quick succession. Metroid Prime speedrunning is quite a bit older than streaming on Twitch, and on-screen splits just weren't an option. Most people that stream the game now use RTA splits just as a method of keeping track of their pace, but the IGT is the thing that they're looking to beat. Beating Metroid Prime is a complex and multivariate problem with endless ways to progress through the game. When the world record time is lowered by one minute, it's representative of dozens of people discussing and brainstorming, and one person putting a run together which never fails to blow everyone's mind. Let's take a look at the earliest days of Metroid Prime speedrunning. As we've already seen on our timeline, Metroid Prime was released in November of 2002. Some of the earliest discussion about the game took place on the GameFAQ forums and dates back to within just a few weeks of the game being released. In the words of one runner we'll meet later, it wasn't a group of speedrunners so much as interested users noticing each other's work. The first user to claim a world record time was user Monty Pylon 10189 who claimed an in-game time of 2.29 in January of 2003. This user wasn't an established member of the community, and some doubted the veracity of the claim. However, on February 2, 2003, user Funky Toad, a more established member of the community, posted a 2.31 time with a route that used all the strategies known at the time, but no proof other than documentation of the route survives. But we can at least talk about the route. A few things stick out. We see that he got the Ice Beam and Plasma Beam before fighting Thardis for the Spider Ball, and then the Power Bomb immediately after Thardis. Within three months of the game's release, 
Most of the exploration items required for overcoming puzzles in the world were obtained early, with the earliest surviving documentation of getting the ice beam early being posted on January 18th, 2003. And it's not like this game was exceptionally broken or anything. People were just figuring out quickly, within weeks even, how to circumvent puzzles and make this open-ended game even more open-ended. I think it's a unique characteristic of the Metroid Prime community that within weeks of the game's release, it's barely a five-minute walk behind us on our timeline, it already had a passionate online community discussing and testing various ways to expand the possibilities within the game. Many speedrunning games only experienced a renaissance of activity later on, but with Metroid Prime it was there from the start. Even before we get to video evidence of the fruits of their labor, we have message board posts from two decades ago proving the game was promptly being played out of order. And that's how most of this discussion started. How do you get items out of order? How do you skip barriers in certain rooms and so on? Speed wasn't the primary concern quite yet. To the extent that people were concerned about numbers, they were initially trying to lower the completion percent, which the game also informs you of on its last screen. One post that bears mentioning in all the flurry of activity is by a user named Solar Flare on February 3rd, 2003. And for context, the Fendrana run was a plot to get through Magmore Caverns without the Varia suit, like a hell run in Super Metroid Parlance, and was one thought on how to get the completion percentage lower. But take note of a little phrase at the end though. And with that post, the term sequence breaking entered video game parlance. If the term seems obvious in retrospect, it's only because it's become such a staple of speedrunning. Sequence breaking is the core mechanic of what makes the confusing routing of this game possible. The basic problem of routing within Metroid Prime is figuring out the most efficient order to get all the artifacts, while also picking out the items you need to achieve the most efficient route. You'll always be balancing the complexity of certain tricks against their potential benefits, and another trick may crack open a different puzzle, or sequence break, and change the calculus entirely. You can see on this graphic here the various order that the items, the rows, will be collected in throughout this world record history by the various runners, columns, with the item names and runners removed. No spoilers. Green is closer to the beginning of the run order, and red is closer to the end with white in the middle. The blue cells are items that are skipped in any given run. Basically, this just means the run order will change often as we go forward, and some items which disappear will be back later. Sequence breaking, getting items out of their intended order, is the basic thing which makes speedrunning Metroid Prime so interesting and so confusing. By the way, tuck that concept of refreshing Sun Tower in the back of your head, because we'll see it again soon enough. Routing in Metroid Prime can be a little complicated to understand. Some games are a picture of linearity, like Super Mario. Other games have clear objectives, but some variation in how you might achieve them. And here, think of Super Mario 64, where there are basically roadblocks which prevent progress without a certain number of stars. It's up to the player which stars to collect to pass the barrier. The route only changes when someone either finds a faster way to collect different stars, or figures out a way to bypass a barrier entirely, both of which have happened many times in Super Mario 64. Yet, on a conceptual level, the game is point A to point B, with roadblocks and options in between them. Metroid Prime is a little different. The objectives needed to beat the game, the items, and the artifacts are scattered all throughout the world, and the design of the rooms is such that movement through them can be blocked by both spatial barriers, such as a jump you need space jump for, or a gap you need the grappling beam for, or item-based barriers, such as a plasma beam door or a rubble which requires the power bomb to clear. Metroid Prime players will have long discussions about how to circumvent certain barriers by various means, and because the entire map is interconnected, Sometimes, when one new thing gets discovered, an entire new route can open up. After long and careful thought searching for an accurate analogy for routing in this game, the best I've come up with is to think of a golf course. And now, for a brief analogical diversion brought to you by golf. I'm not going to take anything for granted with the zoomers. If everything is going to be overexplained in this video, I might as well also explain golf. Golf is typically played on courses with 18 holes, separated into two halves of 9 holes. The object of the game is to hit the ball the fewest number of times, going from the tee box to the hole located on the green. For the sake of this argument, let's reduce the game of golf to an exploitable abstraction. All you need to do is hit 18 shots from each of these and end up in all 18 of these. That's accurate, but also not at all. If you go to play at a golf course, you're supposed to play the holes in a specific order. In fact, the course and players will get rather frustrated if you don't. But let's think of this from a pro-gamer mentality. What if we just didn't? What if we allowed ourselves to play from any tee towards any green in any order? What would be the quickest route? Finding the shortest route through an arbitrary number of points is called the traveling salesman problem and has been a signature problem for computer programmers for many years because of its complexity. 
Of course, in golf, all routes are not equal. There's water, out of bounds areas, tall trees, all of which will inhibit your ability to hit a decent shot. When you add the restrictions that natural obstacles place on this imaginary game of out of order golf, you're not far from imagining the map of Metroid Prime. There's another similarity with golf that's important to mention before we show any run footage whatsoever. Here's a video of a well-known golfer hitting a few shots at a major golf tournament. Without the on-screen graphics, do you have any context for where the shot took place, what course, what hole? Not really. I mention this only to say that to really explain every route taken, why it was taken as opposed to other routes, and what had to be figured out for that run to work would have made this video even longer. In some games, when execution alone improves the time or something is discovered which carves off part of the run, after a bit of explanation, it can be easy to understand in its entirety why that improves the world record time. In Metroid Prime, however, someone may discover something which actually adds certain items back into the run order, and that's just the way it is. I'll do my best to contextualize what you're seeing, but sometimes without context, especially since this is a first-person game, it might be hard to know exactly where the runner is and what they're doing. I mean this both in the spatial sense of, where is Samus in the map, wait, what's going on, how did that runner do that, and in a conceptual sense of, I don't understand where in the run this is or why I'm seeing it. Unfortunately, that's just what this game is and just what this world record history video is like. You'll be seeing the highlights, but I've worked hard to make sure that you can understand those highlights, why they're in each run, and what's unique about each run discussed. Finally, to continue this wonderful golf metaphor I've worked so hard on, I think golf shares another trait with Metroid Prime, being way harder than it looks. Golf gets a lot of guff for being a fake sport because you're walking and swinging a club and that's it. It's not as physically demanding as other sports, sure, but that doesn't make it any less challenging. Famous golfer Bobby Jones is quoted as saying, golf is played on a five and a half inch course between your ears, and I think this has a lot of overlap with Metroid Prime speedrunning. Like golf, this game is comprised of hundreds of tricks and techniques which are applied over time and after much practice to the point that being able to consistently execute them becomes unconscious. A common drill to improve one's golf game is to attempt 100 three-foot putts in a row. Any golfer will tell you that most games can go from good to bad quickly over the cumulative short game, the strokes taken around the green. Missing one short putt is the difference between a par and a bogey, and if you miss 18 putts like this in a game, one for each hole, You'll go from a par game, 72 strokes, which is a respectable score, to a bogey game, 90 strokes, which is really not a great score, but it's decent, it's okay. Most golfers would be happy to get it. Much like golf, Metroid Prime speedrunners must execute dozens of tricks throughout the course of a run. Missing even one can quickly ruin a world record attempt, and missing several in a run will ruin a time going from world-class to the average speedrunner if you take just one extra attempt at every major trick. For this reason, I'll take note of every trick that's harder than it looks and write it on a golf ball. Just to remind you, every trick is in fact harder than it looks, and the cumulative advantage of being able to sink 100 putts in a row is what separates the good from the remarkable. Back to our world record history, already in progress. The world record any percent time was lowered again in an undocumented run in April of 2003, this time to two hours and one minute on hard mode by user Gold Leader, another runner whose claim carried enough reputational clout to let it stand without any sort of proof. It's notable that this is the only record in the any percent category to be completed on hard mode, which was more common in the early days for reasons no one can remember. The main difference was enemies and bosses having more health, which made the run slower automatically as it took more time to kill enemies. Since this route was still being established though, there was plenty of time to come off by execution alone. The first hour barrier was on the cusp of being broken, and the game hadn't even been out for six months. Finally, on April 9th, 2003, the first world record run with video proof that survives to this day was posted. The runner was named Henry Kaufulio Wang. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to periodically check in on this timeline to keep ourselves oriented in time as we move through time. We started back here in November of 2002 with the release of this game for teens about space pirates and power-ups. In the broader world, we have this little piece of legislation passing just a few weeks later. Then moving a few months down the timeline after that, we have the release of the new and improved year, 2003, much better than the old year. The Billboard number one song for 2002 was How You Remind Me by Nickelback, a song that, according to math I made up, every speaker in the world has played at least once. Back in Metroid Prime Land, we have the earliest discussion of sequence breaking happening mere months after the release of the game. 
and armed with that knowledge, the first run with documentation of any kind was completed shortly after, a 231 with the route documented in text by Funky Toad. A few months after that, an undocumented run on hard mode by Gold Leader earns its place in this history with one unverified form post. And a few days after that, we get the first full game speed run with full video documentation of any video game ever, not just Metroid Prime. I'm pretty sure that's correct. Feel free to fact check me. Could be wrong. Calfulio, let's get into it. Calfulio's run was completed in 12 segments. Segmented runs were ubiquitous for about the first decade of speedrunning Metroid Prime. There were several reasons for this. First, the in-game timer was the main object of optimization and it was unaffected by saving and resetting. This allowed for a higher level of play, waiting to lock in a segment until you were satisfied with it. I can't emphasize this point enough, the game is hard to speedrun. Even a few months in, people were finding tricks which required a great deal of skill and a bit of luck to execute. Second, there were also two fairly well-known crash points in the game which were somewhat random, which was another discouragement from trying single segment runs, at least to start with. The community emphasis on the in-game timer allowed for segmented runs and the mentality of embarking on a large project to achieve a target time. The segments allowed for crafting a run over weeks or months with many attempts that showcased the best possible route, tricks, and movement possible. This was not that run. Not exactly, at least. Still, this run deserves special attention as the first record with video proof. It's worth pointing out how difficult it was in 2003 to record video game footage and put it on the internet. I mean, like, this this is what you were working with and to put it on the internet you you probably were going to hear this at some point ah wow well, it's it's just it's easy to forget how far we've come the most common method was to record through a vcr and have the tapes captured into digital files thanks to the archival work of nate who we'll talk about later we can still view this speed run in its entirety 18 years later in a glorious 240p resolution so let's Let's dig in. The beginning of the run demonstrates the two basic methods of moving faster known of at the time. L jumping, seen here, which I'll explain more about later, and rolling in the morph ball, which is not really a strategy, but it is faster than walking. Calfulio plays and moves confidently, gets through the frigate escape at 413, and already this is a demonstration of his movement abilities because it was a mere three seconds off the fastest frigate escape at the time. Once on Talon 4, Calfulio begins the run in earnest. At first though, there's little to distinguish this gameplay from an experienced casual player. Early in the run, most of the speedrunning strategies are just hopping in a straight line towards the destination, skipping fights that are skippable, and ignoring several save stations. This run features a few things though which are only in this run and never repeated in a world record run. For example, this is the only recorded any percent world record that features a hive mecha fight and it isn't a particularly fast one, so just enjoy this 240p footage of a world record fight against Hive Mecha from 18 years ago, because we, we won't ever see it again. The music is pretty cool though. Anyway, in the third segment, Calfulio does something that was amazing in its time and strange in the present. I can't overstate this trick's difficulty. In fact, let's let our next runner describe this trick. Let us behold. This one is notorious because everyone knew it was one of the hardest tricks to pull off. A lot of people despised it, and it basically killed all motivation to speedrun for most people, except for crazy people like Calfulio. I mean, look at look at this. It's deranged. It's uh, it's psychotic. It's it's so deeply unsettling. Now, you might be saying, what gives? I thought this was a speed run, not a bad tutorial video. I thought segmented runs were basically perfect. Patience, dear viewer. But we are going to speed this up a bit because Calfolio tries and fails nine times, but he finally succeeds in achieving the only method known at the time of acquiring space jump without the boost ball. Even today, the trick is definitely on the harder end of the spectrum. It consists of performing a double bomb jump at an awkward angle and hitting an extremely precise unmorph while moving away from the ship in order to get to the ledge. In Calfulio's words, the trick was so hard that failing nine times and getting it on the tenth attempt 
was satisfactory execution to continue, even in a segmented run. Getting this trick on the first try would have saved about a minute and a half, and there was nothing to stop him except resetting every time he failed. Yet, the will to optimize being what it was at the time, he continued on. If you remember how long the backtrack to get space jump in normal gameplay is, you realize how much time this trick saves. Furthermore, having space jump early makes movement much faster overall by opening up access to more platforming options and allowing Samus to stay in the air longer, which is generally faster. It may have been a pain, but the trick was necessary for saving a huge amount of time, and it's a true gem from the earliest recorded speedrun. Through the rest of the run, Calfulio basically nails every major trick that was known of at the time. This first part of early Ice Beam exploits some unique and unintended design quirks of this particular spider ball track which allows Calfulio to wedge Samus into the corner and jump up. The second jump on the way to early Ice Beam is actually not much harder than it looks. The two little ledges here are fairly easy to jump to, and by doing so, Calfulio skips a bit of the puzzle here in Hall of the Elders. Then it's on to collect the final beam early, Plasma. Here's another cool trick not repeated in later runs. If you needed more proof that Calfulia was no slouch, here it is. To bypass the spider ball track, he bomb jumps out of lava and finds a small spot to jump from. Very pog. With tiny margins to stand on this little spike and abusing the physics of movement to make jumps just a bit longer than they otherwise would be, Calfulio navigates up to the ice beam door, bypassing the massive spider ball track and acquires the plasma beam. Now with this late game item, all doors will be accessible and much more of the map opens up. The route now looks like this, with ice and plasma beams moved up into earlier slots. The route this early on doesn't really seem to be more thought out than go get the beams as early as possible, but having the beams this early does make it possible to scoop up several more items while cutting down on a great deal of backtracking. Calfulio grabs a few other upgrades that would be dropped in later iterations of the Any% percent route. At various points in the route, he grabs super missiles, which we'll never see again, Grapple Beam, the Ice Spreader, and Spider Ball, all of which would be abandoned at various points as the route became more optimized. The evolution of the low percent category and how certain items would eventually be dropped would take an entire separate video to cover. However, I'll mention here that collecting fewer items doesn't automatically equal a lower time. Certain items are almost free to get time-wise and allow for other rooms or bosses to be done faster, such as the Ice Spreader, which helps with Metroid Prime Exo. Other items might take a bit of extra time to get, but not getting them would cause other parts of the game to be harder and more time consuming to complete. As Calfulio collects the thermal visor here as it's seen from an IGT perspective, you can see that you'd save a bit of time passing through this room without collecting it, which you can do, but the Metroid Prime Essence fight would be a lot slower. Also, just remember this room as you'll see it done a lot faster. Again, I, I didn't say this run was perfect. <laughs> All this means that what is thought of as the right number of items and what order to collect them in will change multiple times throughout the history of the Any% percent record. Having already acquired the Ice Beam, Calfulio was able to quickly sneak out of the Pirate Labs after getting Thermal Visor and go straight to picking up Power Bombs early, which then allows him to enter Phazon Mines backwards. Uh, yeah, let me explain this a bit more. Getting into the last main area of the game, Phazon Mines is locked in a few ways and is important to understand since its routing will change a few times throughout the world record history. Normally you enter Phazon Mines the front way, after first going through the Crash Space Pirate Frigate, which by the game's logic requires Gravity Suit. However, this slow underwater section can be bypassed entirely by either bomb jumping over these bars, which would normally be opened after going through the frigate, and think of this as being put in by the devs to allow you to enter Phazon Mines without going through the frigate every time. Or you can enter by first power bombing the rubble in Magmore Caverns to go in through the back entrance. This is really the exit of Phazon Mines, because the game expects you to do this after going through Phazon Mines from the normal entrance and getting the grapple beam and power bombs on your first trip there. That's this section of the normal route. Since the power bomb ability is obtained in Phazon Mines and all of their power bomb expansions either require a power bomb, grapple beam, or plasma beam, all of which are acquired after the main power bombs, it was expected that this power bomb expansion in Fendrana, which requires grapple beam, would be inaccessible until after you had gone through Phazon Mines like the game expects you to and gotten the first round of expansions there. But Calfulio bypasses this requirement with some very tricky jumping and scoops up a power bomb expansion, unlocking the ability, and unlocking a ton of new routing options. Yeah, like I said, this game's routing is tricky to understand, but thanks for hanging in there. Although, while we're on the topic of the power bomb, there is one interesting thing about it. 
The first power bomb you're supposed to get in Phase on Mines technically just increments your power bomb counter, a trait which is shared with another item. The main power bomb adds four power bombs to the total available rather than one, which an expansion would normally give you. By adding one to your power bomb count when you start with zero, this suffices to unlock the ability. With a shiny power bomb in hand, phase on mines can be entered from the rear, drastically cutting down on time by skipping the trip to the gravity chamber in Fendrana for the gravity suit, which is really only useful to get through the frigate and to grab the life giver artifact. Even a few months into this game and this entire section of the game, the whole gravity suit power up and the biggest backtrack of the game would never be seen in the any percent category. Calfulio goes through phase on mines backwards, fights a security drone and passes through the maze to get the main power bomb which is necessary to trigger the spawn for Artifact of Warrior, and then picks up the grapple beam as well, which helps navigating through the lowest level of phase on mines, though it was possible to skip this at the time. Heading back out the front entrance of phase on mines, Calfulia opens the gate we saw earlier, which will allow him to get back into phase on mines much easier. From here, Calfulio basically sweeps up the rest of the items needed to beat the game with no major tricks. However, there's still a fair bit of backtracking and movement needed, as Caulfulio has to go all the way back to Fendrana to get the Artifact of Sun, which was next to the Wave Beam, and then back into Choza Ruins to get Wild, or the Artifact of Wild in the Cutscene Monster Arena, and then get the Artifact of Life Giver near where he got the Morph Ball. Before leaving Calfulio, it's worth making a note of another charming aspect of this run, the only recorded world record appearance of a missile station. Talked in the Impact Crater right before Metroid Prime. Calfulio finishes the game with a 40% item acquisition and 146 on the in game timer. It is the first recorded Metroid Prime any percent world record. Calfulio's segmented run would stand for only 51 days, yet, with the recording that survives to this day, he gets the notoriety of being the first recorded completion of Metroid Prime, which was aiming for speed. His run also springs forth from the conventions of the day, focusing on segmented completions of games and looking only at the in-game timer as a benchmark. There's plenty of history as to why that's the case, and it's worth considering the online communities that gave rise to it, and the genesis of the first community dedicated solely to Metroid games. Segmented runs of an entire game came out of a practice of speedrunning individual levels of games such as Quake, GoldenEye, and Doom. These games were Metroid Prime's forerunners in the 3D first-person shooter adventure game genre, especially with speedrunning in mind. Quake and Doom both had timers at the end of their levels during normal gameplay, a characteristic shared by Super Metroid. The timer at the end of levels had a direct influence on many fledgling speedrunners, and the timer at the end of Super Metroid has even specifically been cited by multiple speedrunners as the reason they wanted to run the game faster and faster. Doom even showed you a target time for the completion of a level, borrowing lingo from golf and giving you a par time at the end of each level. I guess I wasn't too far off on my golf analogy from earlier. These games were more mature and attracted an older segment of player, and with an older demographic comes a more diverse and developed set of skills. One of these skills was web design. As early as 1998, there were websites dedicated to hosting videos demonstrating the fastest times, strategies, and discussions for games like Quake. The main hub of discussion for Quake speedrunning was Speed Demos Archive, or SDA, which we'll talk much more about later. Within a few weeks of Metroid Prime's release, there were already a pretty well-established group of people which were discussing and theorizing on how the game could be pushed lower. But all this discussion was scattered around the GameFAQs forums and taking place in ephemeral chat rooms. Metroid Prime didn't yet have a dedicated hub like SDA for all its community members to gather on. Users knew each other by name and reputation, but it was far from a stable community with a single hub of discussion and a centralized collection of all the strategies that people had come up with. In June of 2003, the same month that the next run we'll be talking about was posted, a man by the name of Nathan Jank, or just Nate as he would be known, logged on to GameFAQs. One thing he saw when he logged on was a well-established thread with over 1,500 replies. He describes it as having almost an aura. Calfulio's time had been printed in Electronic Gaming Monthly, bringing print media attention to what people were discovering online. The thread on speedrunning and sequence breaking was important. It was where everything had started. After all, Calfulio's run didn't just drop out of the sky. It was a result of dozens of people tinkering, testing, sharing knowledge, discussing, hashing out ideas, and starting to solve puzzles in this extremely open-ended game. 
When you added in sequence breaking, the game became even more complex and the routing possibilities multiplied. The game had barely been out for half a year and it had already generated a tremendous amount of posts and attention, but the information was scattered all around on various forum posts and replies, and it was hard to get a sense of where to start for a new player. Nate was looking for information on how to sequence break Metroid Prime, and after poking around on the GameFAQs forums for a bit, he got an invite to an IRC chat server, which, if you've used Discord, it's really only so different from that at its heart. Nate introduced himself to the channel. After getting to know the community, it seemed fitting to him that there ought to be a single website that hosted all the videos that a certain user was creating of how to do various tricks. In 2003, after all, a full two years before YouTube was released, it was still a significant technological hurdle to create a website with embedded video. In Nate's own words, building websites was one of the few true skills that he possessed, and he wanted to give back to the community that he was quickly becoming embedded in. Coming from that older demographic of gamers, he already had some experience and skill in setting up websites, so it wasn't an idle pipe dream. He set himself a launch date of August 2, 2003, and began to work on the site which would become known as Metroid 2002, and it launched on time. The site quickly became one of the main hubs for Metroid Prime's speedrunning knowledge, discussions, and theory crafting. The discussions on beating the game faster and with fewer items shifted from the GameFAQs forums to Metroid 2002's forums, or M2K2 as it was often referred to. Other sites were popping up as well, such as samus.co.uk, started and hosted by Andrew Mills. We'll meet Mills and talk about some of the differences of opinion between the two sites and their users a bit later, but one of the reasons that Metroid 2002 quickly became the home base of discussions was the quality, upkeep, and ease of use of the entire site, not just the forms. Metroid 2002 would grow and start hosting more and more videos of speed tricks, sequence breaking strats, and other random trivia about the game. The design you're seeing here is how it looks now and how it looked then. It just works, and gave people an opportunity to easily learn more about the game. When I was young in the early 2000s, it's actually one of the first websites I remember frequently using. Although, it is worth highlighting again how difficult of an undertaking this was in the early to mid 2000s. During my research, I found this amazing post which is just a relic of how different things were. In 2004, Nate alerted the forums that April 26 was their last chance to mail him VHS tapes to be captured and digitized before he left the country for a few weeks. That was just how people submitted video, as most people had VCRs but not the equipment to digitize the tapes. There were no capture cards or direct upload quite yet, let alone a free public website to host them on. There's also a tale from the old old days when a set of master tapes mailed to Nate was lost when a UPS truck crashed into a lake and the footage went to a watery grave. So let's just take a moment to be grateful for how easy YouTube is, I, I guess. Even when Metroid 2002 launched, there was an impulse to archive and chronicle the discussions on GameFAQs, which were quickly becoming relics. By the mid-2000s, some information about Metroid Prime was already dated enough to be considered historic. In 2005, several users of Metroid 2002 had compiled many of the early GameFAQs topics and discussions. It wasn't just the major posts either, but the entire chronicle of idle speculation and discussion between users. The GameFAQs forums have been lost at this point, even to the Wayback Machine. So this is the only record we have of the earliest days of Metroid Prime speedrunning. We now turn our attention back to one of these early posts by our current world record holder, Calfulio. It's a time-honored tradition of speedrunning. Any runner holding the world record, obtained after some effort, is free to speculate on what the lowest possible time for the game might be. Many runners will at least asterisk that claim with a statement like, with what we know now. But Calfulio didn't do that, and he made a blanket statement that his estimation for the lowest possible time for an any percent run would be between 1 hour 30 minutes and 1 hour 35 minutes. Our next runner had been in the Metroid Prime community since its earliest days. I think we foreshadowed and teased this runner enough. It's finally time to meet the legend, the mastermind of Metroid Prime, discoverer of about half of what's possible to do in this game. You've been waiting for it. Our next runner's name is... Okay, Kip never had an avatar or any public photo of any kind. Most of these cool early players didn't. So we'll have to make some kind of artist rendition. Okay, there we go. That'll that'll have to do. Let's make one for Nate too, just for fun. That's my headcanon for their avatars right there. Kip didn't discover all of the tricks for breaking certain rooms, skipping items, rearranging the item order, and moving through the game quickly. It's just most of them. Kip was instrumental in documenting, explaining, combining, and making sense of the many things that other people were discovering. And to be fair, there are a few discoveries with Kip's name on them. 
Kip's first record notched onto the leaderboards was a 135 on May 30th of 2003, equaling Calfulio's prediction. But it had no video and was referred to as very disappointing. On July 16th, 2003, Kip finished a run which blew away Calfulio's time prediction. The most important thing which sets this run apart from Calfulio's run is the first thing that happens when Kip gains control of Samus on Talon Overworld. With a little positioning towards the back of the ship, a switch to the scan visor, and a flick of inputs, Kip executes what has remained a staple of Metroid Prime speedrunning for 18 years. Almost everything else about the run will change, but this is the first execution of Space Jump First or SJF in a world record run, and it's remained ever since. It looks intuitive, simple, and easy to execute. It almost looks like the developers wanted you to do this. The ledge is right there after all. Just this once, I'm gonna say this trick is still hard, but not impossible. When I started writing this back in February of 2021, I practiced this trick for about a half hour and could eventually get it. I had originally wanted to come back and record a bunch of my attempts to get it to drive home the trick's difficulty, but having figured out the inputs, it was like I couldn't forget it, and I got it on the second try. Still though, some people have problems with it. It's vital for speedrunning the game, and it is harder than it looks, but it's attainable. So don't let harder than it looks stop you from trying. It is fun to try, and really is a rush when you get it for the first time. Kip does make it look quite easy though. With the space jump attained first, the route just changes like this, right? No, the route will change like this. Not just because of space jump, but I do want to illustrate that routing in this game is a mess. Hard to understand and even harder to explain, but Kip is going to change a lot in this run. Kip continues on with a massive advantage in hand, or in foot, I guess. In boot? Whatever. You will see Kip frequently use an early speed trick that he and Calfulio developed together, which I mentioned earlier, L jumping. You can tell when the L button is held because this little reticle shows up in the center of the screen. In the most basic terms possible, the L trigger causes Samus to quickly accelerate roughly to her maximum walking speed and if held while jumping, it allows her to change direction in midair. If the L button is held when jump is pressed and then released within 13 frames, it blocks the normal jump behavior where Samus slows down slightly and then accelerates. The short of it is that every time you see that reticle on screen, you're seeing a trick that requires an input within one fifth of a second window to maximize movement speed. In reality though, there's many small tweaks to this technique to improve its effects and gaining and maintaining speed with the L button is more like dribbling a soccer ball than running with a football in your hands. The technique is almost infinitely improvable, and there may not be a perfect way of doing it. There's more, much more, to the story of movement in Metroid Prime, and we'll go further down the rabbit hole later. For right now though, just think normal walking is the slowest, L jumping is a little faster, plain morph ball is faster still, and boost ball is the fastest. I bring this up now though just to drive home the point that there is no spare second of movement that's taken for granted, even in 2003, so just keep that in mind. In Chozo Ruins, there's another simple sequence break that's become a consistent staple of speedruns, getting missiles out of the way without fighting the Hive Mecha. As stated earlier in reference to the power bombs, the missile ability locked behind Hive Mecha is just the first missile expansion that's available to a player in a normal playthrough. While this missile expansion in the main plaza is apparently a boost ball locked expansion, it's fairly easy to jump up the slope once you have the space jump and attain the missiles. I'll actually put this on a short list of actually as easy as it looks. Just press into the wall and space jump. Easy. In addition to the time saved by skipping the hive mecha, Kip saves even more time in the early stages of the game while grabbing the first few items. The platforming is much easier with the space jump because you can jump twice. Between the acquisition of Morph Ball and Varia Suit, Kip had already shaved about a minute and a half of real-time play off of Calfulio's time. After Varia, there's the first world record appearance of another absolutely vital trick which has been featured in every world record run since. Remember the mention of refreshing sun tower and the first use of sequence breaking by Solar Flare? One question which perplexed early sequence breakers was exactly how the cutscene monster's arena was reset after you left the fight, spawning the version of the room which contained the artifact of Wild and the Chozo Ghosts. If you walk down the hall and turn right around, you'll get an empty arena like you left it but there was some trigger after falling off this ledge which caused the other version of the room to load. You needed spider ball and super missiles to get back up. Maybe it was acquiring one of those items? Maybe the room changed as soon as you hit the ground in Sun Tower? The developers didn't expect you to climb back up this room until much later in the game, so the trigger could be almost anywhere. The question was simple, how do you hit that trigger and get back up? A few users had figured out some tricky methods of getting through the barrier without the super missiles, but it didn't seem likely to save much time in an any percent run unless the spider ball could also be skipped, because you still had to backtrack. 
but it at least confirmed that the room resets apart from the item acquisition. So if there was just some way to get back up the room without Spider-Ball, it meant you could turn around and get wild. Ha! <laughs> get wild. It would save a huge amount of backtracking, including, mercifully, letting you skip these slow, 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 slow elevators at the entrance of Magmore that Calfulio had to sit through on his way back into Chozo Ruins. Um, actually, Kip goes back and, and climbs this room backwards later in the run on the way to Life Giver. So, like I said, the route is always changing, but yes, Early Wild does eventually put a nail in these elevators. Enter the infinite bomb jump, IBJ. Applied here, it's simply known as Early Wild. This trick was discovered by user Kyonjin, and Kip was the first to use it in a run. The trigger for resetting Flagra's arena wasn't all the way down at the bottom of Sun Tower, as Solar Flare thought, but was actually a bit below the ledge he fell off of. By immediately turning and morphing into the corner, holding the control stick at an up left angle, enough friction is generated between the morph ball and the wall to slow Samus enough to where an infinite bomb jump is possible. With some tricky timing and a precise unmorph, the player can claw their way back up after passing through the trigger and reset the room, getting the artifact of wild early and saving a huge amount of time by cutting out super missiles. Furthermore, it was one more puzzle that needed to be solved en route to skipping the spider ball in the any percent run, but that'll come later. This trick has remained in the any percent route ever since. Perhaps it goes without saying, but this trick is much, much harder than it looks, and it doesn't even look particularly easy. Kip saves, segmenting the run, then embarks on a rather long segment through Magmore, Fendrana, Magmore again, and then back into Chozo Ruins to get the Life Giver artifact. In a normal playthrough, the player is expected to have Boost Ball, Wave Beam, Spider Ball, and Gravity Suit before getting the artifact. However, using the L Jump we talked about earlier, Kip circumvents the need for Spider Ball with a slightly long jump across this gap. Though you may have guessed, even this is harder than it looks. Finally, to get up on this underwater ledge just before the artifact, the player is expected to have Gravity Suit, which increases movement speed underwater. Kip bypasses this by using what's now called a slope jump, using an inclined surface to add height to the player's jump. Underwater, it seems to add even more height to the jump, and Kip easily slips up there. But don't get any ideas, it's still harder than it looks. Finally, to round out the rather long segment, Kip backtracks through Chozo Ruins to get the Ice Beam early and saves, ending the segment. Kip then heads into Magmore Caverns to get Plasma Beam, taking this route here which passes through... Remember this room. Remember this room. Remember this room. Talent Overworld and puts you in the middle of Magmore Caverns as you can see here on the map. From here, there are several odd remnants of the time. The thermal visor is skipped, even as Kit passes right through the room it's obtained in. As we talked about earlier in reference to the thermal visor, even though Kit passes right through this room, it was now considered faster to avoid stopping to scan the terminals and to forego the visor. This little foray into Fendrana to get Power Bomb and the artifacts of Spirit and Elder will be consistent in most routes going forward, so all future runs will pass through the thermal visor room at some point. The option to get the visor or not get it will always be on the table. Later, the puzzle and ore processing is solved, though many runners would simply climb it with tricky jumps off of small standable spots on the platforms, and this was known at the time. Without belaboring the route too much, there was also added time in this long diversion from Talon through Phazon, Fendrana, and Magmore to sweep the final artifacts after acquiring all items. Figuring out ways to pick up these artifacts along the way and the rest of the game will be a major facet of route optimization going forward. We also see some slow platforming which contributed a bit to time, but it's fun to watch just as a reminder that there was, at one point, normal looking gameplay in the any percent world record. Additionally, there was a big chunk of time with the two major bosses at the end. While these bosses will always take up a decent chunk of time in runs, the community was about to discover several strategies to save time, especially in Ridley. It's worth mentioning here how the final two bosses are structured. Meta Ridley is the wicked bird, or wicked demon dragon, maybe maybe not a bird, that killed Samus' parents, and has since been resurrected as a deplorable mechanical aviary by the space pirates. There's an air phase where Meta Ridley flies around the artifact temple, pestering Samus, and occasionally exposing itself to fire. When enough damage is dealt, Meta Ridley's wings burn up and it lands starting the ground phase. Samus kills that bird, Dead. Metroid Prime consists of two phases, Exo, Danger Crab, and Essence. You had nightmares about this as a kid. In the first stage, Exo, there are four descending levels where Prime's exoskeleton, or 
carapace, changes colors corresponding to the beams that will damage it. Once this phase is defeated, Samus descends to fight the essence form, which is only visible to certain visors, and is only vulnerable if Samus steps into pool of Phazon to fire at it with the Phazon beam, an ability actually gained from the Omega Pirate and only usable during this boss fight. But it does have an entry in your logbook on the pause menu, a fact I didn't know about until starting this research. Kip takes care of both bosses without much trouble. Even with some slight hiccups, it was good enough for a new world record of 1 hour and 23 minutes. Kip's first two notches on the leaderboard would last for a respectable 187 combined days, or about half of the game's first year. However, the record would be taken away by a particularly important character in speedrunning history. The catch is, we don't know anything about this run. But before we get to that, let's catch up with the timeline. 2003 would prove to be an eventful year in the history of Metroid Prime speedrunning. We start here with the first recorded speedrun in video game history, then travel on down the road of time just a little ways to the first run of the Sage of Metroid Prime speedrunning, Kip. A few months after that, Kip again notches another world record and demonstrates new tech which would become a staple of Metroid Prime speedrunning. All these new discoveries were showcased on the newly launched Metroid 2002 just a few months later. We then get a lull of several months before we find our next run by an important individual in speedrunning history. We just don't know anything about this run. The only reason we know about this next world record is a forum post on Metroid 2002 mentioning that this was the run which our next runner who is a different next runner beat. As far as I can tell, no other information about it exists. The runner's name is Radix, and his most popular Metroid Prime run was a 100% completion done a month earlier. I'll include some footage of it just so I'm not talking over nothing. In the run notes for the 100%, he talked about wanting to get the any percent record, but after Kip and Calfulio started chipping away at it, he decided to focus on 100% instead. As far as Metroid Prime speedruns go, he's best known for this 100% you're seeing now, but it does also seem like he's managed to get the any percent record at some point. There's nothing more to say about his time of 119 as we don't know anything about it. We have no idea of the routing, strategies, or anything else. Based on the time, a good guess is that he simply cleaned up Kip's movement and used a similar route. He also might have picked from the abundance of tiny improvements and tricks that were being found practically every day to shave off a few minutes, but it's all speculation. Even if he hadn't held this record though, he'd still be worth talking about in this video. Who is he? Besides drawing attention to Metroid Prime speedrunning with his wildly popular 137 100% run, Radix would play a large role in the history of speedrunning more broadly. Remember that little website we mentioned earlier, made for sharing Quake speedruns and strategies? The one that laid the conceptual groundwork for the Metroid Prime speedrunning community in Metroid 2002? Well, Radix was the one who started Speed Demos Archive. By the way, in what I like to think of as a send-up to SDA, Metroid 2002 shares the charming quality of leaving basically all major design elements from the late 90s or early 2000s in place, even to the present day, which I think is kind of awesome. From 1998 on, it quickly became a hub for Quake speedrunners to gather, discuss, and share times and videos of their playthroughs. After many years of running this website for Quake, Radix became interested in Metroid Prime. He bought the game and became familiar with it, and towards the end of 2003, he posted his 119 any percent, and its much more beautiful sibling, the 137 100%, which, if you hadn't guessed, collects every expansion and item in the game. The run actually became so popular that it caused some problems for Nate at Metroid 2002. And for those of us who didn't grow up in the early 2000s, Slashdot was like an earlier Reddit. Just a little translation there for you. Nate wrote a history of his Metroid 2002 website in 2005, two years after the site's founding. Later in the same post, he talks about the combined bandwidth load of the 100%, as well as a popular 100% Super Metroid run by Red Scarlet. It was a new move for Nate, who had aspirations of including all Metroid games on Metroid 2002 but its popularity and the subsequent frequent demand to download it was putting strain on its server. Which, by the way, can we just appreciate how good we have it now? YouTube's max upload size is 256 gigs, 500 times the download size of Radix's run, and we can just access huge files now like it's nothing. And how do we use this? We use it mostly to make videos about video games that are longer than the games themselves. On an unrelated note, you're like a fifth of the way through this video. In conversation with Radix, Nate decided to host all of his captured video content on the Internet Archives, a nonprofit digital library started in 1996 dedicated to making digitized material accessible. By 2004, it had grown large enough to offer the bandwidth that hosting and serving entire runs of video games needed. 
Nate was wary of hosting his content away from his own servers, but eventually started running all of his speedruns through SDA and Internet Archives. Just a bit later, in 2005, a website would pop up that would make the need to download the video a moot point, but the internet didn't do so well with streaming video prior to this. And streaming is still banned with usage anyway. Once again, these are all things we don't really need to worry about anymore. With his bandwidth headache solved, Nate focused most of his energy on capturing VHS tapes people sent him, uploading them, and creating pages with the captured video explaining how to do tricks, as well as recording a good chunk of content himself. He also continued to moderate the growing Metroid 2002 forums, which launched shortly after the site itself. At this point, Nate was the primary contributor of Metroid content to SDA, and Metroid 2002 served as the community hub and knowledge base for sequence breakers and speedrunners. Radix would not claim any more Metroid Prime World Records, but he continued his active involvement in managing SDA for many years, occasionally posted on the Metroid 2002 forums, and more frequently on the SDA forums. By 2004, the streams of Metroid Prime were beginning to join with the newly forming river of speedrunning. Almost one year to the day after the game's release, there was already a flood of new interest in the game, new members in the community, and new passion for pushing the game even lower, and we're just getting started. As speedrunning began to grow, SDA became the hub for the broader community. Its first non-Quake game was Metroid Prime in 2004, but after that the list of other games grew and grew, and with it the discussion of speedrunning on the forums. The discussion and speculation which formed early among the Metroid Prime community began to form for other games, all centered around SDA. There's an interesting interview with Radix that SDA published in 2009. Citing a new full-time job which made playing games at anything more than a casual level difficult, Radix was wrapping up his time of managing SDA and passing the torch to the next generation. The interview is interesting because in 2009 it can be thought of as an inflection point between the early days of speedrunning and the beginnings of what it has since become. He mentions how the timer at the end of Super Metroid got him interested in speedrunning. He mentions his surprise at the number of games growing from just Quake to Quake and Metroid in 2004, and then to almost 517 games in 2009. He mentions having met up with speedrunners in Finland in 2000, and then again in 2009. At one point, he also mentions the strange feeling of seeing so many other people come into the site and not knowing everyone, but also being excited by this new community. Though he didn't seem to be directly involved with its organization past 2009, the Speed Demos Archive community continued to hold little get-togethers to speedrun to play games fast. Or uh, maybe a catchier way of saying that, games done quick. The rest is history, but that's a story for another day. So, this is a mystery that wasn't really sorted out until doing the research for this video. Credit goes to Tom Lube for discovering the discrepancy and bringing clarification to a point of ambiguity that had actually stood on the leaderboards for about 15 years. The next runner we'll meet is Zoidy, and I'm going to spoil the next runner's suspense a bit by saying we'll later meet a runner called MP Zoid. There's also a third person named Zoid, and let's just take a quick speed dating look at who's who. So Zoidy played on the PAL version of the game and only held the record once, and that's who we're about to talk about. Besmir Shecky, aka MP Zoid, and many other names, was a controversial community member and changed screen names a bunch of times which is why, for many years, people believe Zoidy, who we're about to discuss, and MP Zoid were one and the same. He also held a ton of records in various categories of the game and is, for better or worse, an important figure in the history of the game. Confusingly, one of MP Zoid's first Metroid 2002 accounts was Miles, which is a different account from Miles SMB, the former name of a multiple world record holder we'll discuss later, though every record was set under the name Miles. Just so you know though, if you ever see a forum post with just Miles and the Tails avatar, it's really MP Zoid. Again, we'll talk more about this later. Zoid is Zoid Kirsch, a senior dev at Retro during Prime's production, and is actually in the credits of Metroid Prime as David Zoid Kirsch, though I've been working on this project so long that he has actually recently legally changed his name to what was once just a nickname. We'll see some quotes from him later about the design and the creation of the game. Back to this run. We're in for a bit of a treat, actually. This is the only record on the leaderboard which was set on a PAL version of the game. Originally sold in Europe, the PAL version has several differences, many of which were detrimental to speedrunning. There are also some purely aesthetic differences, like this kind of awesome, kind of off-putting narrator intro in an otherwise desolate and unvoiced game. The cosmos in the vast universe. 
However, many of the differences between the two versions were of greater consequence to speedrunners. First, and most importantly, the ability to dash while scanning was removed, cutting down the number of dash points significantly, and also making space jump first a bit more convoluted. Because SJF is such an important trick, Zoidy uses a rather elegant workaround by walking up to lock onto a zoomer in another room and then maintaining the lock on across the entire first room all the way back to the ship and then dashing to the space jump ledge. It's not like the scan dash was removed in the PAL version to nerf speedrunners, but all the same. Take that, developers. We'll talk about this more later, but around this time, dashing became integral to moving through the game. Because you could no longer dash off of scan points, there are basically fewer than half of the number of points from which to start a dash in the PAL version of the game. This effectively nullifies the ability for a PAL runner to ever approach the same speed as an NTSC run, especially as movement became more optimized. Furthermore, there are other little impediments to sequence breaking scattered around the game world by the developers to help the stability of the game. These include things like a Bendesium pile, which must be power bombed in front of the plasma beam door, and unpassable door locks on phase on mine doors, which won't open until event triggers are completed, in this case, getting the power bomb from where you're supposed to get it. Zoidy demonstrates some great new skips and tricks which were being found, making it a well-earned record despite being on the slower version of the game. Zoidy also posted the first any percent world record route which would skip the spider ball, though there would still be a few more runs that opt to include it, for reasons we'll see later. Zoidy's run clocks in at 1.17, a respectable time, especially considering the limitations of the PAL version of the game. Also considering that this run beat Radix and Kip's times, it's clear that Zoidy was playing at a high level and put together a very respectable run, regardless of the game version. In the end, Zoidy gives a great summary of the ethos of Metroid Prime speedrunning. Don't hate the game, hate the player. For a long time, it was believed that this is a rather ironic statement, as Zoidy was incorrectly conflated with MP Zoid and thus the target of many people's hate. However small the number of people that incorrectly lump these two runners together may be, I hope that this video has exculpated and restored Zoidy to a position of respect as the only runner to ever hold the overall any percent record on the PAL version. It is a lonely single entry, but Zoidy deserves a place of respect on the leaderboards unconnected from the bombast associated with the runner that so nearly shares the same screen name. Let's touch base with our timeline. Not really sure where that phrase, touch base, comes from. I guess it's like kids games, like tag. Our first stop is a beloved thing that we all enjoy every year, I'm sure, a belated Thanksgiving present. It's Radix's Mystery 119. As we amble through the slump of the year between Thanksgiving and New Year's, we finally come to New Year's 2004. Shortly after that, in February, we have Zoidy's Lonely Pal record. As we move forward from there, we will eventually see our next twin set of world records. But first, I have another segment that I spent way too long working on. Before we get into our next masterclass of speedrunning, let's talk about movement in video games. Here we'll discuss both the why and what of movement in Metroid Prime. By understanding some historical context, we can get pretty near to a comprehensive answer as to why Metroid Prime feels difficult to control to the modern sensibilities. It's my theory that this is one of the main reasons this game is never popular as a speedrunning game. So understanding in detail why the game controls like it does will be an important step in unlocking the enigma of this game. We'll also go into some detail about the nitty gritty mechanics of movement in Metroid Prime because we're slowly shifting from routing based improvements in time to movement based improvements in time and understanding how that movement happens will be a huge help later on. But first, some theory and history. I think it's easy to take for granted how utterly important it is to get movement and level design right. 3D games like Super Mario 64 still feel great to play today because the movement feels fluid, loose, and fun. Or, uh, I think it controls well. Apparently this is a contentious opinion and people dunk on this camera a lot, but I think it holds up well compared to the other games of the era. Or at least... It's my video, so. Even modern 2D games like Super Meat Boy or N have endless replay value because of the complexity and nuance of the movement, including acceleration, changing direction, and conservation of momentum. Now, movement in two dimensions is all well and good, but what about movement in three dimensions? And perhaps even more complicated than three dimensions, how do we contend with a first person 3D game where the camera is the character's eyes? You may have never thought about controlling characters in 3D space before, or if you have, you may not have consciously focused on it as much as we're about to focus on it. But I think it's worth thinking about because it will shed some light on why Metroid Prime controls the way it does, and you might learn something along the way. 
So let's break down some categories and definitions. At the risk of sounding pedantic, let's just get the first two broad categories out of the way first. We have first person games and third person games. For the purposes of this discussion, we're also going to break down the dichotomy of the character and the camera. The character is the thing in the world which you, the player, have control over and can influence the course of events in the game. The camera is the vantage point from which you see the events of the game happening. In first person games, the camera is the player's eyes. First person games always happen in 3D space because if we were a first person character in a flat world, we would just see a line. So even rudimentary first person games are always happening in 3D. In third person games though, there is a lot more freedom of what the camera can do. Let's think about it in terms of three buckets. 2D games can happen from either a top-down perspective, where you're looking at two axes of depth and breadth. Think here of Pokemon or the original Legends of Zelda games. Or you can have a 2D game from a side-scrolling perspective. Think here of Mario Bros. or the original 2D Metroid. You're looking here at height and breadth. Either way though, you're only playing on two dimensions, even when they get cute with perspective making it look like you're ascending and descending stairs. 2.5D. This is an interesting category which has an important historical example in Doom which we'll talk about in a second, but this is a broad category which also now encompasses a huge variety of games which makes this choice for stylistic reasons. As we'll discuss in Doom, the game takes place in 3D space, but you only have meaningful gameplay interactions on two axes. However, in modern isometric games and other games which play with depth in interesting ways, you're seeing a 3D world, but your perspective or the movement of your character is fixed in such a way that the space of the game hovers somewhere between having depth and being flat. It's a beautiful style and tangential to this discussion, but worth mentioning. Stylistically, we have games like Metroid Dread, which are a 3D world with 2D interactions, and functionally we have games like Metroid Other M, which restricts Samus's movement in certain directions but takes place entirely in 3D space. Actually, there's a lot going on with this game perspective-wise. It's kind of crazy. I mean, it was a, a bit of a mixed bag, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. This category can also be divided into first and third person games and even somewhere in between, again, like in Metroid Other M. Finally, 3D. This is what we expect of most big budget games nowadays. This category, of course, easily transitions between first and third person, and even sometimes within the same game. Think here of Skyrim or other Bethesda games where you can easily switch back and forth between the perspectives mid-game. But part of the reason we feel at home with either vantage point is because game developers have had 30 years of experience ironing out all the problems with the various control methods and creating a seamless and enjoyable control experience. One helpful illustration I think of here is the difference between Far Cry and Just Cause. Superficially, they seem like very similar games. Open world exploration shooters, lush environments, vehicles, not truly a platformer. Yet Far Cry is first person and Just Cause is third person. In the original Just Cause games, we see a typical sort of over-the-shoulder shooter approach. But as the games grew up a bit, we slowly saw the developers take advantage of the freedom that having the camera be separate from the player allowed. Look at Rico jumping around and flipping between vehicles with a grappling hook, flying in a jetpack, and other hijinks. It would be utterly disorienting, even sickening to try to play this in first person. Yet, from third person, Rico could flip as much as he wants and the camera remains steady. Because the camera can move independently of the character, you can look around while Rico travels in the same direction with the parachute. And while you can also do this move in first person games, you can more easily see this effect from third person. You can reorient the camera and transition from walking to strafing in order to look and face somewhere else while traveling in the same direction. It's easy to do this in real life too. Simply walk in one direction and look to your side. If you really wanted to, you could even turn your whole body left, right, or run backwards and still be traveling in the same direction all the while. You can see here the difference in how this looks between first and third person. This is how we intuitively experience the world, with an experience of independence between what we're looking at and the direction we're moving. So it should be the goal of a game designer to translate this experience, this freedom, into a game. Nowhere is this more obvious than in games with third person cameras. Now, first person games have their own advantages too. It's far more immersive. Well, that's, that's a pretty big advantage, isn't it? I suppose it also makes a bit more sense for a true first person shooter, as the character's eyes and the aim down sights mechanic make way more sense for aiming than the over the shoulder reticle aiming. But for all intents and purposes, I think immersion is the main advantage of a first person 3D game. And considering that being transported to other worlds and engaging in unique stories from a new perspective is one of the main reasons people like playing video games, I think that's a pretty big advantage. So let's talk about the lineage of 3D controls which eventually led to Metroid Prime. We're going to look at a branching family tree here, and it all starts with Doom. 
Doom, like we mentioned, was a 2.5D game released in 1993. It took place in 3D space, and there were gameplay elements above and below the player, but the player was always locked to looking around them and had no ability to aim or look up and down. Since this was a computer game, it was controlled by a keyboard and later a mouse, but the first control scheme for Doom was based around walking forward and backward with the arrow keys and then turning left and right. This is what we'll refer to as boat controls. And just note here that we're playing on the original DOS version of the game. Even the OG versions of the game on Steam now have slightly updated versions which allow for the mouse control that we're used to. But if you go all the way back, you'll see boat controls were pretty much your only option. I kind of get it. It might be the first thing that you come up with if you start from scratch and had no knowledge of game design whatsoever. You obviously want to be able to walk forward and backward, and when you're walking in the real world you tend to arc to the left or the right rather than looking straight ahead and strafing to the left or right to move around obstacles. That's why the developers of Doom relegated the strafe commands, and they did exist, to the rather obscure input of using a modifier key first and then pressing left or right. It's not intuitive, but cut them some slack. It was 30 years ago computers looked like this. It was still closer to the release of Metroid Prime than Prime is to the present day though, so oh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting old. You can understand why some of the design philosophy descended into Prime. Next on our family tree, we have Quake. Quake was released in 1996 and was also a computer game, so control was centered on the mouse and keyboard. However, this game was a full 3D game. Players could aim up and down and jump. How are they going to do this though? Well, I'll be honest here, the default controls of Quake are an absolutely cluster fun look into the past. In the default control scheme, you have the same turning and forward back controls of Doom with the strafe modifier, but also in the default control scheme, looking up and down are given to the A and Z keys. I can't fathom why. Competitive Quake players later on in the 90s though came up with a much better idea. It's hard to pin down a who, when, or why, but the what was clear. One hand on the mouse, one hand on the keyboard. In fact, let's also move our left hand over to the WASD keys, because, you know, ergonomics. It's utterly ingrained in our heads now for computer games, but Quake and Doom players of the mid to late 90s were the ones testing and ironing out the kinks. The basic theory was that it made the most sense for looking to be one function, done with the mouse, and movement in any direction was to be done with the keyboard. Let's think of it in another more abstract way. Your computer monitor consists of two dimensions, width and height. The plane your character moves around on in the game also has two dimensions, depth and breadth. So your mouse controls where the character looks in the flat plane of your monitor, which is, in the game, the space around your character, and the WASD keys control the movement on the flat plane of the surface of the game world. Now, this makes a lot more sense to me than the hodgepodge of looking and walking that the left and right keys being turned means. You're confusing the two axes by forcing movement to also be a looking function. It's a pretty complex problem, sure, but the fact that we don't really think about this now is just a testament to the fact that movement and control in 3D games is so smooth and works so well now. For whatever it's worth, I think that every game takes some getting used to, movement-wise. When you master the movement of a game and feel free within the parameters of the game to be creative, I think that's a mark of a well-made game. Even with the boat controls, it's a category that I'd certainly put Metroid Prime in. Which uh, reminds me, isn't this supposed to be a video about Metroid Prime? What does all this discussion about computer games have to do with console games, or Metroid Prime for that matter? Well, before we talk about the lineage to Metroid Prime, let's also think for a moment about one of the main differences between consoles and computers. Yeah, it's a controller. That's the main difference, I think. Later editions of the PS1 controller and all major console controllers afterwards from Microsoft and Sony featured dual stick controls. There was, however, some disagreement on where exactly to put this extra control stick. And these made perfect sense with what we already discussed about looking and walking happening on two independent flat planes. Nintendo, though, had some other ideas. In fact, they had a lot of other ideas. First they were like, oh, all you really need is one control stick, here, have it right here in the middle and use your other two hands to control the two other directional pads. And then they were like, oh yeah, you can have it, but it's just really small. And then they were like, ah, wait, how about you just point at the screen and, and instead, isn't that really innovative? Then they did this. And the Switch is pretty normal by all accounts. Maybe that's why it made buckets of money for Nintendo. Anyway, let's step back to the late 90s. 
The best historical antecedent I can think of for Metroid Prime on consoles is Goldeneye. In more ways than one, actually. Remember how we talked about how Quake, Goldeneye, and Doom are all precursors to Metroid Prime? Because the in-game timer at the end of the levels? Well, I think Metroid Prime also descended from the same control scheme as Goldeneye. Let's take a look at how Goldeneye was controlled. Goldeneye was released on the N64 on the 25th of August, 1997. By default, the control scheme was vote, but at the very least, they had these cheeky little names for other control methods you could select. Even though N64 had camera buttons rather than a true two-stick system, you can at least see the nod towards being a dual-stick shooter. You at least got the option to do something else, even though on the other consoles Goldeneye was released for, there were dual-stick control schemes for dual-stick shooters. In fact, the developers of the game, Rare, maybe felt so bad for their N64 players for not having dual-stick controls that you could plug in a second N64 controller and use it for one player to have dual-stick controls. Since the game is so popular, it's also spawned modded monstrosities like this. Oh, that's, that's nice. By the way, I don't think it would have been impossible to do, but taking a look at the graphics of Goldeneye, I'm glad the powers that be skipped a generation of Nintendo consoles and waited to bring a 3D game to the Metroid franchise until the hardware was just a bit better. People didn't love Goldeneye for the graphics, but boy are they crunchy. Wait they did, and we finally arrive at Metroid Prime on the GameCube in 2002. What in the world is going on with its controls? Metroid Prime features the same boat controls as you might have guessed. Metroid Prime is a difficult game to speedrun for many reasons, but for many modern first-time players accustomed to console FPS controls, it can sometimes be a difficult game to just play. Although the GameCube did, in fact, finally get dual-stick controls, albeit one stick being a little underdeveloped, in Metroid Prime you don't even get the option to do dual-stick controls like you did in Goldeneye. Nope. All the C-stick does is select beams. Looking up and down is controlled by the R button and kind of the L button too. To look up, you have to completely stop moving, press R, and press down on the control stick. Samus stops, places her hand on the arm cannon, and the player uses the control stick to look in any direction. To move while looking up and down, you use the L button, and I think of this as an abbreviation for lock. Samus roughly maintains the altitude and azimuth you are already looking, and then you can move in any direction. Except now your control stick functions as a strafe input, forward, back, left, and right, rather than turning Samus. But actually, it's not a totally locked azimuth and a true strafe command, since you're not really moving left to right, but rather in an arc around the aiming reticle. When there's nothing to lock onto, it's set by default to a long distance from Samus, which makes it feel like a WASD control, but it isn't. The best proof of this is by starting a scan and then switching to the combat visor, which brings the reticle close into Samus where the scan point was, and then moves her in a tight arc around the aiming point. And now you can start to get a sense of why people say this game is hard to play, especially for those who have decades of experience playing games that taught us a different way to move in 3D space. I can't really criticize the game's developers for this choice, as it was done for all the right reasons. Zoid, who we just met, said in an interview about the game's design that when given full control over the camera, that is, able to look freely in all directions at all times, players ended up looking either at the ceiling or the floor in order to better navigate the platforms and not enjoying the rich environments. The motorboat controls of Metroid Prime makes sense within history and within the context of the game, even though they do feel quite strange today. The game's levels were completely designed around these limitations, or at least conscious of the design choices made for Samus's movement. There were further aids to helping players navigate this new 3D world, such as the camera panning down slightly when Samus jumps normally so that the player could sight their landing. Because, after all, what is Metroid without jumping between platforms? There are plenty of rooms in the game which feel like direct translations of the 2D climbing levels of previous Metroid games translated into 3D. And one of the main things the developers decided early on is that Metroid, at its heart, was not an aiming and shooting game, but a puzzle exploration game. Thus, the lock-on system was born. The long lead into all of this is just to remind you that Retro was faced with a gargantuan opportunity, but also a huge challenge, translating a beloved 2D game into 3D. The lock-on system and the camera controls, which basically prompt the player to think around them first and then discover things above and below them, all came out of a design process which focused on taking what was essentially Metroid and making it work and work well in first-person 3D. In fact, there's another game released around the same time for the GameCube that used the two 360 degree control sticks, Time Splitters. I played a bit of this game when working on this section, and I've got to say candidly that I don't think Metroid Prime would be a better game if it shared the same control scheme. This is an opinion I'm going to hold to dogmatically, and I will not revise, question, or waver from in any way, even if Metroid Prime itself were to somehow become 
a dual stick shooter. And this is the moment at which I lampshade the fact that I'm making a four shot. Looking, dashing, and walking in Metroid Prime somehow feel freer and more complete as an idea rather than being another early dual stick shooters as Time Splitters was. In fact, Time Splitters also does this odd thing where aiming had a dead zone, wherein the reticle snaps back to the middle of the screen if you don't push outside an invisible box, whereas most modern dual stick shooters have a one-to-one -one correlation between the movement of the stick and the view of the character. Perhaps I'm just more familiar and comfortable with Metroid Prime, but somehow moving, locking on, dashing, and exploring with the walk-look combo control feels freer and easier to use than the auspiciously better dual stick controls found in Time Splitters. It's not that better movement controls for the game were ignored, it's just that Retro very self-consciously made a control scheme which would maintain the aspects of gameplay that made Metroid beloved. Exploration, interacting with mysterious worlds, solving puzzles, and exploring your way through a desolate landscape. There was a historical precedent for the controls, sure, but the lock-on system and boat movement was an intentional design choice to shift the focus toward exploring rather than pointing and shooting. For those of you familiar with the history of Nintendo's consoles in the Metroid Prime series, you may be laughing to yourself thinking about what came next. After Metroid Prime 2, which basically followed in the mold of Metroid Prime, Nintendo released an even newer interpretation of how best to control the looking and moving of a character in 3D space, and Metroid Prime would have to go through an entirely new interpretation of control. But that's a bit of a digression. Back on the topic of Metroid Prime, let's take a look at the scan dash we saw earlier to get Space Jump first and talk about how speedrunners have abused this mechanic to gain incredible amounts of speed. The developers very intentionally placed dashing at the center of the combat mechanic. The Parasite Queen is one of the first tutorial bosses which teaches the player how to approach enemies and bosses first in terms of how to use strafing to best engage, dodge attacks, and navigate their defenses. Well, okay, at least when you're playing the game as the developers intended. Interestingly enough, for the main bosses of the game, you can see how they get harder based on how radial the arena is. Flagra, the next main boss, is also based around that radial pattern, and the fight largely consists of dashing to achieve different objectives. As the bosses get harder, you have to navigate the space of the arena while contending with a boss that moves outside of the center and comes near to you. By the time you get to the final boss, you're basically locked in a very narrow corridor with limited ability to avoid the attacks. So what is dashing? Well, let's follow the game's tutorial. When you face the Parasite Queen, the game tells you to lock onto the enemy, flick the control stick, and press B while remaining locked on. Samus quickly moves left or right. Easy enough. What's happening and how do we abuse it? To create the quick dash that is so often used, the game locks your movement in a radius around the thing you're locked onto. Normally, Samus quickly accelerates and then loses her speed as she arcs relative to the target. However, if the player releases the lock onto the target and the jump input, Samus flies off in the direction she was already traveling. The sideways speed value is uncapped to allow for the quick dash and the speed is maintained. By adding very specific combinations of R and L during various phases of the jump, the speed can be preserved even from jump to jump, allowing for very quick movement with bunny hopping. There are pitfalls, however, like if R is pressed during the jump, the player loses control of Samus until she lands. While some runners could probably teach a whole lecture on this topic, it's sufficient to say, once again, that this is much harder than it looks. Give me a golf ball. Throughout the runs going forward from this point, a huge variety of movement inputs will be required to traverse certain rooms. Almost every jump requires inputs, which are a fraction of a second or less, and many will take place when either taking off from or landing on a very small range of standable collision. Furthermore, a perfect dash really comes down to a single frame of input, meaning that a runner will only get faster the more comfortable and experienced they are with dashing, and it does take a long time to get used to. And that's why, ultimately, almost every trick going forward is harder than it looks. Runners have to take off from and land on a very small area, unsighted, since Samus is always looking forward and level by default. And finally, the inputs required to do these dashes fail if they are less precise than one fifth of a second. My personal opinion is that for as long as it takes to explain the movement of this game, the time will be well spent. When you watch a run of Super Mario 64, it's extremely evident that the runner is doing some rather crazy inputs or navigating precise collision in order to gain a certain outcome. However, as runs get more advanced in Metroid Prime, you more often than not will just see a haze of walls flying by as a runner finds a lock on point and then sends Samus careening across the room. The camera and movement controls were designed to make Metroid in 3D entertaining, pleasantly challenging, and an immersive experience for the player. Some of the guardrails and the methods designed by the developers for controlling Samus in this manner made speedrunning the game both difficult and confusing to watch if you aren't familiar with what you're seeing. 
Changes in the movement going forward will be subtle, but indispensable to getting a good time. Let's look at crossing Talon Canyon in six different ways. The quickest modern way of doing the room will cross it in five seconds. Boosting is half a second slower. Bunny hopping is a full second slower than that, and morph ball rolling another half second slower. L jumping is one second slower than that, and finally, normal walking is the slowest, taking twice as long as the dashing. Now, multiply those movement advantages out across the 300 or so rooms traversed in any percent run, and you'll quickly see why the perfection of movement and new ways found of traversing a single room can have a huge impact. The order of collecting items is important, and it will change a few more times, but as we go forward, the time spent improving movement will also play a huge role in lowering the time. I think there's a huge payoff in learning about the history of why this movement is the way it is, and once you learn a bit about why Samus is moving in a certain way, you can be adequately amazed when jumps like this are hit on the first try. Especially considering that this is what it looks like if you try to do what you think you're seeing. Let's remember that if you go and try the thing which looks so easy, or at least doesn't communicate how hard it is, it will result in falling into a pit of lava well short of the goal you're trying to reach and ruining your time. Hello, things are looking a bit gray around here. This video, as I'm sure you're very well aware at this point, has taken me a long time to make, and hopefully this is actually the last section that I'm going to have to record here in December of 2023. Now, this is confusing because you're gonna see a lot younger footage, or I guess a lot older footage, footage of a younger me later in the project. Part of the fun of this project is that hopefully the experience of watching it is almost as confusing as Metroid Prime itself. I've learned to make my peace with that over the course of three years. One thing that I haven't made my peace with and that I've really struggled with in my time working on this project is how to convey the depth and the strangeness of movement in this game. In the last section, which I completed over a year ago, I told you a lot about how runners generate speed and some of the games that preceded Metroid Prime that informed how this game controlled. We also talked a lot about why movement in video games is so important to get right in order to make the games fun. But even with all that said, I still don't think we've gotten a good handhold around what a top runner is actually contending with when they ponder how to propel Samus faster and faster across Talon 4. Put another way, I don't think we've really peeled back enough of the shell of incomprehensibility of this game to get at the delicious egg underneath. Why do runners nearly universally say that there is always more improvement to be found in Metroid Prime? I think that ultimately answering this question is kind of like asking a golfer, to use our earlier analogy, how do they keep hitting such outstanding shots over and over again? It's ultimately an unanswerable question because that knowledge doesn't reside in their mind in such a way that it could be verbally articulated. It truly lives in their muscles and their nervous system. It can never be articulated, it can only be demonstrated. However, I want to indulge just a bit longer, if you'll indulge me, on trying to articulate some of those challenges. I had an awesome interview with Fusion Varia, who we'll meet and talk much more about later. But I think this interview does an amazing job demonstrating both how hard it is to talk about movement in this game, even for the top runners, but also the insane number of intricate considerations that the best players of this game take into account when moving Samus faster and faster. Note that the subject matter in view in this interview is tool-assisted speedrun, which we'll talk much more about later. For now, it's sufficient to mention that this is basically creating pre-recorded inputs to maximize speed through the game, far beyond what a human could control in real time. We'll hear a little bit more of this interview later, but I did just want to play this part now. Thank you to Fusion Varia. I hope you enjoy. Let me ask that question. You don't have to answer the whole thing again. I think that's great and we can use yeah. that. But what, what makes Metroid Prime unique as a, as a task game compared to the other ones that you've worked on? And that's, that's all. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It's really rewarding, and I guess that's part of it. It's kind of fun to like get familiar with the game at that level, where you're aware of every single little physics quirk and how all the room collision is shaped, and you know, thinking about like how to move from point A to point B in every single space. So this game has so many different ways of moving, where morph ball is fast sometimes, being unmorphed is fast sometimes, sometimes it's faster to walk, sometimes it's faster to like jump, sometimes it's faster to take damage. Like, There's all these weird nuances, and I think one of my favorite things about the game is that the jump doesn't have any dynamic value to it on its own. So when you jump, you always go the same height. And that makes routing jumps really interesting. Because, you know, in a game like Mario 64 or something, if you want to jump and land somewhere, you just hold the A button for more or less frames, and you'll kind of land there. Hmm. In Metroid Prime, if you want to bunny hop and land at the edge of a ledge, 
the very first jump in that sequence, you have to plan out ahead hmm. and plan how you're going to land on collision if you're going to get a downward slope jump. Um, you won't jump as high, so then you can factor that into your pathing. And nothing else is quite like that to me, where you're so free, but you're restricted by certain things. Like you just, you can't get more speed out of a dash. Mm. Like it's, it's always capped at 45, basically. Back in the day, it was more like 37 or something, because we didn't know how to optimize it. But <laughs> you really can't go faster than that as, as you release a dash these days. And I don't think that's going to change. And mm. so in some games, you can just keep learning how to move faster and faster. And that's where the optimization comes from. But in this game, it's more like, what clever little thing can I do to work with the restrictions I have to you know, bend this corner in a, in a more optimal way or something like that, or be fast here, but also touch the ground here. Those are like the fun little puzzles that I get to think about when I'm working room by room. Yeah, that's, I mean, as I've thought about how TASs, like your TASs look and just how the speedrunners approach the game generally, if I've like honed in on kind of the scan points as like, these are real constraints as like, you know, okay, if, if the dash can only move in this direction because of yeah. this scan point, like that's one of the only constraint that I can sort of visualize, but it's really, really fascinating to hear like all the other things that you kind of have to balance. Yeah, if you had complete freedom to like, you know, omnidirectional like movement speed or something like that, it wouldn't actually be as interesting because it'd be way more straightforward what to do. It's like take a straight path to your objective or something like that, but it becomes this like, yeah, like how do I bend around this corner or how do I gain height while doing this or how do I do this while looking a certain direction? Because sometimes you have to do a 180, and it's like, because of the way that the speed cap works, if you do a 180, you're gonna slow down significantly. So when do you do a 180? And maybe there's a creative way to do it without slowing down too much because of the shape of the room, or the shape of the room before. Maybe you wanna turn around before you enter the room, or something like that. Looking up and down, like, <laughs> in the current task, I have the controls, the Y-axis reversed, because if you hold the B button, you can look down in the air, I was like, well, if I do that, and then I can use R and up to look up in the air, then I can look up and down without slowing down most of the time. But then I had to get used to playing the game with different controls than I'm used to, and that, <laughs> that took some adjustment. If you could freely look around, if you could freely redirect your momentum, if you could just like turn on a dime or any of those things, then there wouldn't be as much of a puzzle. It'd be really obvious what to do, but then it becomes, how do I move with these limitations? You don't have control of your character the same way you do in other games. When you're in the air, when you're not holding L, you're kind of just like throwing Samus around. She builds speed when you press forward, but you have like a set trajectory, you have a set, well, not, it's not super set, it's malleable, but you have a, a way that you're moving and the only way to change that is to like stop, basically. You have to press the L button and change direction. So when you're doing R jumps and anything that puts you into a state like that. Precise analog values don't matter so much as making sure you find a direction that gets you the result you want. Yeah. I'd say Prime's pretty different, that's... probably just because it's first person, I and mean, that's like the biggest thing. But it's first person in a way that's it branched off really early. So mm. it's before like, what is the Steam Valve engine called? Source? Source? Yeah, like most games kind of feel sourcey, mm. but Prime was before that, or at least it, you know, it's different. It's more like GoldenEye inspired, and it's got all these weird quirks with just having one analog stick and all that stuff. Where, yeah, the part, the fact that it's first person, like if it were a third person game, you actually couldn't have a physics engine like this. Like it, the ability to turn sideways and generate speed doesn't work in third person. It'd be really awkward and unintuitive, mm -hmm. and like. Developers would definitely see that and say like, oh, we don't want that. <laughs> no one can play this. But then when it's in first person, it's guarded a bit by the fact that the controls are just rough and rugged and a little clunky. No one's gonna like accidentally R jump, but <laughs> you can. Yeah. And when you do it, yeah, like the, the inputs to do it wouldn't make any sense from a third person perspective. And so third person games generally, the direction you put the analog stick is where your character moves. Metroid Prime's just not like that at all. So that makes it really interesting uh, by, compared to the other games that I do. Games like Mario Sunshine, every movement option kind of has a set speed. Mm -hmm. When you dive, you go at 48 speed. Like, there's not really much you can do about that. But in Metroid Prime, like, the jump prior carries into the jump you're doing now. Everything plays into the next thing that's happening, and it's never, you never really stop. There's never like hard defining lines of like, that section from the past is done now. <laughs> it really just always bleeds into the next and then it's, 
a lot harder of a puzzle to think about. Kip shocked everyone in the community on June 13th, 2004, getting a 105. Kip shocked everyone in the community on June 24th, 2004, by getting a 104. Two world records within 11 days, in an era of toiling away for weeks or months at a segmented run. How did this happen? The boost in popularity from Radix's 100% run at the end of 2003 had brought a huge influx of development into the Metroid Prime community. Because of this, Kip faced a frustration that was common to segmented runners, but is now basically a historical footnote. Strategies were becoming outdated by the time the run got into later segments. If a runner was spending two or three months attempting a single segment dozens of times until they got it right, then locking in their golden attempt doing the same thing for the next, there was a strong possibility of a new trick being found to shave off time from an earlier segment basically making the whole run obsolete. Kit mentions in the notes for the 105 that due to the pace of discovery, parts of the runs were having to be redone in order to keep it relevant. This would officially be the beginning of the every minute increment basically, is going to be fought over and there will be no new multi-minute time saves. The 104 time was achieved by rolling back to an archive save file on a separate card in order to adjust the route to take advantage of a new trick discovered around the same time the 105 was finished. But we'll talk about that when we get there. The first 11 segments of the 104 are the same as the 105, so we'll look at them. One of the most noticeable things for me about this run was how tight and standardized the movement was starting to get. The run you see on the right is the run that eventually beat this run's time. But I want to skip ahead a bit because you can see how sections of movement are almost identical, including all the strategies of movement we've already talked about, dashing, morph ball rolling, and so on. Though the game is fairly open, and it seems like there may be some margins for varying types of movement, we can see even early on in the history of the Any% percent record that optimizing movement had a huge impact on final time, and the Thus, most of the movement was identical in runs of similar time. In fact, over this long segment, which is synced to the same start point, Kip is actually a bit faster. But cumulatively across the entire run, the next run just barely ekes out better movement and thus achieves a better time. It's hard to notch a new world record because you need a minute of playtime worth of improvement across the entire run to get a new world record. Thanks, IGT. Of course, that also means that tiny margins in movement can be overlooked and still achieve the same time. but. All in all, I think it's an interesting dynamic, especially when you look at two runs side by side. Other than better movement though, there is a routing shift in phase on mines, which I think is worth talking about first, especially in contrast to the PAL run we just saw from Zoidy because it wasn't possible on that version. But well, here's where we run into some problems. I'll be completely honest, routing phase on mines is a strange thing. It's a slippery, slippery fish that I can't seem to get my hands around. I've been making this video for two years and I'm still struggling with how much to talk about the route, and specifically, this section is the hardest to understand. Keep in mind that some of the routing changes were made 15 years ago, and some of the rationale and methodology may just be lost at this point. Nonetheless, some of the changes proved to be faster, so they've stuck. I'm going to try my best to explain routing as I understand it, but also keep in mind how hard it is to understand and explain it, and realize that huge portions of the rest of the route are also weirdly shaped jigsaw puzzle pieces like this. When you move one thing around, suddenly it's very tricky business to try to put it back together correctly. Changing the acquisition order of one item can change the entire toolbox that a runner approaches a different room in a different section of the game with. Your options become find new tricks to pass that difficulty, find a new route, or don't do the thing that caused the problem in the first place. We'll see all of that in play here over several runs through phase on mines, but again, just realize that fully explaining the rationale of every change would make this an impossibly long and frustrating video. In fact, as an entry into this strange world, let's just start our discussion on one room, or processing. Few rooms in Metroid Prime approach the level of complexity we're about to talk about when considering the evolution of routing and the multiple ways that people approach problems in the game. The characteristics of this single room give us great insight into how odd of a game Metroid Prime is. The room is a masterclass in presenting one puzzle to casual players, and a far more interesting and complex puzzle to those that would attempt to sequence break the game. This is the history of ore processing. Okay, but seriously, what, what's going on here? Let's leave that music running though. Somehow it just seems to fit. Well, let's get some of the obvious characteristics and functions of this room and its adjacent rooms out of the way. 
The function of this room in the vanilla game is somewhat of a pivot. You're intended to come through Phazon Mines, fight your way through a bunch of pirates over here, enter elite research from the bottom entrance here, solve a puzzle, climb the room, destroy this wall to reveal a door to a spider ball shaft, which you fall down to enter ore processing again from the bottom. You need the power bomb to open this puzzle, so you drop down another set of shafts, which will need spider ball to ascend, get the power bomb from the cloaked drone and maze on the second level, and then come back to finish the puzzle and acquire the grapple beam. You then leave Phazon Mines through the shorter route in the main quarry, ostensibly access through the grapple beam, and venture forth to get plasma beam and the x-ray visor to later come back and finish up in Phazon Mines. And sorry, I should probably stop for yet another diversion. Let's look quickly at the structure of Phazon Mines because it's by far the most complicated world in the game from a routing and level design perspective. Phazon Mines is split into three levels, the surface and sub-levels one and two. The main entrance, the first normal entrance of the world from Talon Overworld is on the surface, here, and the back entrance, which connects to Magmore Caverns, is here on sub-level two. There's one elevator from the surface to sub-level one, the one accessed through ore processing, but there are two elevators from level one to level two. Okay, I, I, I need to interrupt myself here for a second. It's denoted on the game's map as an elevator, but weirdly, like weirdly, it's actually just a morph ball tunnel from one part of phase on mine sub-level one to another part on sub-level two. Because the geometry of the game's world is continuous, the abstracted representation of the in-game map actually exaggerates the separation of each level, when in reality, they're pretty amazingly woven together. Um, just looking at this kind of pulled back view of Phazon Mines, it would clearly be chaos to try to use the standard treatment of the map and not separate the layers a bit, but it definitely created some confusion as I was uh, doing these sections on Phazon Mines. Anyway. The first one you take by backtracking slightly after acquiring the power bomb in a normal run through, bypassing the harder X ray lock sections of sub level 2. The other elevator is accessible after you've acquired the X ray visor and you're on your way to fight the Omega Pirate. But let's go back to ore processing, and hopefully that'll help some things make sense. It's worth considering the following points if you're a speedrunner. First of all, it's possible to access this room without the grapple beam from the main plaza with a scan dash, as we see Kip doing here. It's also possible to climb this room without doing the puzzle and without spider ball, as we've seen in earlier runs. And finally, the grapple beam isn't necessary to finish the game, so that can be skipped entirely. The security drone on sub-level 1 needs to be fought at some point. Remember, this is in order to activate the fight for the artifact of Warrior in this room over here. But, as a tricksy speedrunner sequence breaker prankster, you can either enter from the back entrance of Phazon Mines, if you sequence broke to get the power bomb expansion early in Fendrana Drifts, and come up from the bottom from sub-level 2, which is what Kip and others earlier runs did. There are only power bomb checkpoints between the Magmore Caverns entrance and reaching the security drone on sub-level 1 to get the power bomb, so that was an attractive option. But you can also enter Phazon Mines the normal way, using the bar skip in Talon Overworld, thus bypassing the frigate, pass through the surface level, fight the drone, so on and so on, even though it looks a little more normal. This is definitely another approach. Zoidi and Kip both do it in these newer runs, but Zoidi had to go the long way around from the front entrance because this door was locked and Zoidi couldn't scan dash. Whereas Kip was able to dash off of the scan point and take this shortcut here to get into ore processing more quickly. A future time save on the table would be bypassing this long space pirate fight, climbing the shafts either with or without spider ball, hmm, and bypassing this wall of rock from the backside perhaps even making it possible to do phase on mines in one trip with plasma beam and x-ray already in hand to go to the Omega Pirate for phase on suit and phase on beam. But we'll talk about that more later. All the pieces of how to do this were likely known about at the time, but it wasn't considered, wasn't executed, and therefore was never in an any percent world record at this point. Here, Kip employs the routing known as a two-trip mines. On the first trip, Kip collects the main power bomb expansion and simply leaves from there to get the plasma beam and x-ray going through Magmore Caverns. Basically the same strategy as earlier runs, but this shortcut across the main quarry here was a new feature of the run. Kip then collects the Artifacts of World, X-Ray Visor, and Chozo, whereas Zoidi diverted into Fendrana for the Artifact of Sun at this point. Uh, once again, I think this will make more sense if we look at the map. Or maybe it won't. But anyway, let's just look at the map. The first trip through Phazon Mines comes in like this, goes out the back, and then leaves into Magmore Caverns for the Plasma Beam. Coming out of Magmore Caverns here, Kip then has to do this cool climb of the abandoned frigate room in order to get to this elevator to go back into Chozo Ruins for the Artifact of World, then leave immediately to go back to Talon Overworld for the X-Ray Visor and Artifact of Chozo, which leaves Kip at the front entrance of Phazon Mines to then re-enter, 
collect the artifact of warrior, the Phazon suit, the artifact of newborn, and then leave for the last time, again out the backside, turning at this point to clean up Fendrana Drifts. If that was all a bit confusing, don't worry. In fact, it was supposed to be a little confusing. This game is confusing. Sometimes it makes me want to tear my hair out, and it baffles me that anyone has ever been able to make sense of this. It may be possible to determine whether or not this was the fastest possible route that was known about at the time, but this is the world record that we have. I've said this so many times, but it would be a long and tedious video to try to explain every decision that was made or not made and what all the rationale may have been. Hopefully, this relatively brief dissection of one part of the game is enough to convince you that it's a bit of a fool's errand to try to understand any given run perfectly, especially in the ancient history of runs before Twitch, when the routes became relatively settled and well understood. These are just the world records that we have. Perhaps a routing improvement could have saved time back then, but the community being small meant that at a certain point, this is just the best thing they figured out. And remember, in 2004, only two years after the game had come out, they were just working with a stopwatch and good intuition. Ten years on after the game's release, the number of tools to dissect the game would vastly increase. And when we get into the modern day, well, it'll be a whole different game. Later on in this route, there was also a good bit of time to be trimmed down in the Ridley and Metroid Prime fights. While a 3 minute boss fight versus a 4 minute boss fight might not seem like a huge difference to the average player, keep in mind that any trick that could consistently save 20 or 30 seconds in a boss fight, which is otherwise unskippable, is a huge advantage. At this point, the major bosses that still needed to be fought and were thought to be impossible to skip were the incinerator drone for the morph ball bombs, or Zoid, as the community affectionately refers to the bot, in reference to Zoid Kirsch. The cutscene monster for Variya Suit and the Artifact of Wild. Omega Pirate for Phazon Suit and Phazon Beam. Meta Ridley to get into the Impact Crater. Metroid Prime's Exoskeleton to get to the Essence, and Essence to beat the game. But one of these bosses will be gone before we're done. Who will it be? Find out next week. All of these bosses had been slowly improved upon throughout the runs and would continue to develop after this one, but three major strategies that are worth mentioning show up for the first time in this run. First of all, in Flagra, Kip uses what's become known as the Genius Strategy to destroy the last three bomb slots. The first one has to be activated like normal by flipping the single mirror up to disable Flagra's tentacles and activate the bomb slots. However, once one cycle of this has been completed, Kip bypasses the need to flip the remaining mirrors and simply jumps across the water, made possible by the space jump as many early game tricks are, and morphs, bombing the slot from the outside of the tunnel and saving some major time. Kip saves a huge amount of time with Thardis by not fighting it. Instead, Kip uses this very impressive dash later in the run to bypass Thardis' arena backwards. As we said earlier, Zoidy was the first to skip it in the any percent route, and we will see it again later, but Kip has access to the scan dash, and thus is able to do this very cool movement through Thardis' arena, opening more routing options. Again, just look at the map and realize that the alternative would be going through the Space Pirate Research Facility. Which, by the way, remember that this is a segmented run. In fact, if you watch this sequence a little bit sped up, showing the overlap between two segments, you can see that Kip actually diverted into Magmore Caverns to make a quick save in the save station right off of the elevator in order to create a reset point for when and if this trick fails. Kip goes right back up out of Magmore Caverns to attempt this dash. Because remember, in a segmented run, you can try a segment as many times as you want. When you put a trick this hard at the beginning of a segment, it's easy to try it multiple times, and even if you fail, you haven't lost much progress. But we'll see this in single segment runs later by Claris, which is just crazy. Like 40 minutes into a run, Claris would do this and the run would just be over if the trick failed, which was regularly, but Claris kept grinding its nuts. Anyway, the next major boss time save was found in the Meta Ridley fight. Meta Ridley has two phases, the air phase and the ground phase. The first phase is defeated by dealing about three quarters of Ridley's total health as damage, at which point Ridley's wings burn up and the bird is grounded, and the remaining damage is done. By the way, I'm not really sure if Ridley is properly referred to as a bird. Maybe, maybe a dragon spaced uh, i did i already use this joke due to an oversight by the developers ridley's air phase is still susceptible to boost damage because the boost ball is only incidentally a combat weapon it was set up to be a one-hit kill for the enemies that are vulnerable to it to accomplish this the developers gave the boost ball 50,000 points of damage per frame of contact for a point of comparison since the game has no visible quantifiable damage indicators ridley's air phase has about 2,000 health 
So as long as the boost hits Ridley for at least one frame on the ground, all its air phase health will be depleted. Once the ground phase starts, Kip quickly dispatches Ridley using rapid fire missiles achieved by alternating power beam shots and missiles, forcing the arm cannon back into the ready state, allowing a new missile to be fired, as we've already seen briefly with the Parasite Queen. Finally, in the Metroid Prime Essence form, we see the trick Kip needed to roll back the run to segment 12 in order to get the thermal visor to achieve. By stepping into and out of the pools, Kip gets off several shots of Phazon, the only weapon which will damage Essence without depleting the pool, a new trick called pool canceling. This allows Kip to skip an entire phase on pool cycle. Even with the extra time added on to get Thermal Visor, which isn't much, it saved about 40 seconds of in-game time. When Kip's run was posted to the Metroid 2002 forums, the community was elated, and the reputation of the run as being nearly perfect was cemented quickly. There was even idle speculation that the game didn't have much farther to go, and that the one hour barrier might never be broken. Hanging over the thread on Metroid 2002 about Kips 104 was something that was on everyone's mind and would take attention away from Metroid Prime 1 for a little bit. Metroid Prime 2. Metroid Prime 2 exists. Okay, so our next record was set, but all right, well, let's let's say a little more than that. We won't discuss it here too much, because it certainly merits, and perhaps may someday get its own speedrunning history video, but for now, we'll mention that Metroid Prime 2 Echoes was released in North America on November 15th, 2004. Some of the interest in speedrunning Prime ebbed for a bit, naturally, as the main players and community members from the Metroid Prime community tried out the new game. Echoes would go on to garner as much critical acclaim as the first, Retro retaining much of their staff from Prime, built upon everything that was successful, interesting, or challenging about the first Prime game. It also added in creative new elements, which solidified Echoes as its own distinct game and not simply a churned out sequel. As such, it would over time develop its own speedrunning community, strategies, and category distinctions that make it an interesting speedrunning game in its own right. But it is outside the scope of one already very long video about Metroid Prime. Metroid 2002, hence the name, was originally founded with the intent of focusing on the two Metroid games released in 2002, Metroid Prime and Metroid Fusion for the Game Boy Advance. But it went on to include many of the subsequent Metroid games, as well as their predecessors. It added Echoes to the forums, and from there, the community grew much in the same way that it grew for Metroid Prime. While many of the original Prime runners spent some time with Echoes, most of them came back and continued working on lowering the time and percentage of Prime. It took some time, but the record was indeed lowered again. It took a lot of time, actually. The mid to late 2000s are in the clearing recesses of my memory as I move from the murkiness of childhood into the pain and obfuscation of middle school years. In the Metroid Prime world, we have just seen Kip set a new world record at 104. Months later, we see the second election of renowned painter George Walker Bush in the United States. Just a few days later in Bush's not so lame duck era, Metroid Prime 2 was released, one of the games of all time. No, but seriously, Retro really nailed making a sequel to the game. The sequel to the sequel, we'll talk about that. We ring in the New Year's to hits like Holla Batgirl, We Belong Together, and Since You've Been Gone, and my goodness, what a vibe. While many things happened in 2005, one significant and tragic milestone in the US was the devastating Hurricane Katrina which made landfall in Louisiana on August 29th, 2005. What better way to heal a hurting nation than a helping hand from our friends to the north? Native son of Canada, Daniel Powder, gave us the number one Billboard hit in 2006, Bad Day. In the Metroid Prime world, some guy would make some forum post in 2006 which will prove significant. Of course, we'll talk about that later. And wrapping this interlude up, 2007, the year. But lowering Kip's time took over 1,000 days. It's a rather funny footnote, at least to me, that Kip's run came out about four and a half months before Echoes was released, and our next run was also released about four and a half months before Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Maybe the new games gave the runners a bit of giddy up? I don't know. Anyway, after 1,019 days on top of the leaderboard of the any percent run times, Kip's name came down from that particular pedestal for the last time. It was replaced by a new name, MP Zoid, who completed a run on April 9th, 2007, 
that was nearly perfect with what was known of at the time. We are now introducing a new runner, who we mentioned briefly in the Zoidy section. MP Zoid's real name is Besmir Sheki. There is one lonely little post definitively establishing this runner as separate from the other Zoid, Zoidy, and the developer Zoid that was basically overlooked for many years because, again, we thought MP Zoid was Zoidy. MP Zoid is a talented runner who also burned many bridges in the community. Without dredging up too many specifics, here's the first post from a 2013 alt account on the Metroid 2002 forums, which should give you some indication of where MPZoid stood at one point, even as he wanted to reform. Am I still welcome to this community? I'm sorry for anything I said slash did to anyone. I'd like to apologize. I've been a total idiot. I've learned that anger and frustration gets you nowhere but making new enemies, and I hate being hated. It didn't take long as a year or so later, MPZoid had stirred the pot enough once more to attract the ire of the community. If nothing else, and there was much else, MPZoid was at least argumentative, zealous for the reputation of his own skill and his own records, and very combative towards anything that would challenge his spot as one of the best speedrunners of Metroid Prime. And yet, MPZoid really was quite good. He was one of the first runners to hold records in multiple categories, spanning 100% runs and any percent runs, as well as mixes of segmented and single segment. A record he set in 2007 for the 100% segmented category stood for almost five years, the longest standing record in any of Metroid Prime's speedrunning categories. In his run notes, MPZoid describes this as one of his best runs ever and an intensive effort. He was justifiably proud of his work. There had been a lot of work put in to improve on a nearly perfect run from Kip. Part of the reason Kip's run had stood for so long was that it was timed by hand to about 1.04.59. This necessitated cleaning up all of Kip's mistakes and finding several new ways of traversing rooms, speeding up loads, and trimming down on bosses to excise an entire minute of gameplay from the run in order to notch a new world record. Wait, wait, uh, what, 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 does, what does speeding up loads mean? I'm glad you asked, gamer. Metroid Prime is based around rooms, and the rooms have to be loaded for normal gameplay and unloaded when Samus leaves them. Metroid Prime's level design is so good that you don't typically notice this, at least it's not in the forefront of your mind. You've probably realized without needing to be told that the doors are the transitions between one room and another. Furthermore, as already mentioned, these little squiggle rooms are impediments to the player to give the game a bit more time to unload one big room and load another one. Put another way, imagine rooms are boxes on a table, or the boxes, um, we'll, we'll talk about it soon enough. Boxes on a table. Imagine that a big room is the size of eight boxes and your table, the game's memory, can only hold 12 boxes at a time. You always need to have at least one box on the table because Samus always has to be in some kind of room. So to put another big eight box room on the table, you need to put some smaller boxes there, say two, while you shift the big group of boxes off and move on the next big group. However, if you're moving from a small room to a small room, say each three boxes, you can easily hold both on the table at the same time. Likewise, if you're moving from a big room, six boxes to a small room, that idea of moving boxes on and off of the table is instructive for how the game's memory works. It takes time to shift the stack into and out of memory, the game holding something. While Metroid Prime is pretty good at hiding the seams between levels and masking the time it takes to load and unload, it isn't perfect. Even more so if you're making it your business to move as quickly as possible through a room. One of the tricks that the game uses to hide the seams in rooms are called load triggers. Basically, they're invisible regions that, if Samus enters them, the game assumes that you're traveling to a certain room and begins to load it. The trick is that sometimes it becomes a net improvement of time to take a longer path to the door if it hits the load trigger faster. In other words, you arrive at the door later, but between the two runs, the later option takes up less time because the door opens sooner relative to the beginning of the room since the load trigger was hit faster. And that is all we are going to talk about load triggers. Uh, don't, don't hold it in your head. Don't think about it again. It's not going to come up again. And that's all you need to know about it. Another thing which knocked off a good chunk of time by itself was a new method for trimming off time in Ridley called Flyby Skip, which took off about 17 seconds by itself. If Ridley is damaged on the first frame of transition from its first air phase to its second, Ridley will land right away and be susceptible to boost damage. It's a frame-perfect trick, 1 60th of a second window of success, 
but it claws back all this time that Ridley is otherwise unable to be damaged in, which Kip just passed bomb jumping off of these pillars, which again, I gotta say is pretty cool. This was a huge advantage, but it wasn't enough by itself. Empizoid's play in many rooms was simply faster. Again, this is where we start to see tiny changes, which may only gain a second or two by themselves, add up over the course of the run. 60 seconds is a lot, but it's not that many tricks to find or two to three second mistakes to fix before you've covered the full minute and lowered the world record time. That said, there's also some splits in which Kip gains back a bit of time relative to the pace of MP Zoid. Kip had a much shorter powerbomb maze and had great luck in the Metroid Prime exoskeleton fight. If the best movement from both runs were put together, since they used identical routes, it's likely that a 102 would have been eked out. Still, that's approaching tool-assisted levels of perfection and movement, given the route and techniques they were using. Even in segmented runs, a runner's patience for perfecting the movement only goes so far. MPZoid's final time, if you haven't already guessed, was a one-minute improvement over Kip's 104, clocking in at 103. MPZoid says in the run notes, Finally, I was very happy that I got the 103 and beat the legendary 104. It's as if the game rewarded me for my effort I put into this run. I am very pleased with this 103. Having lined up both of these runs side by side, it's a pleasure to watch over 10 years later. Both runners held themselves to a very high standard, and there are very, very few mistakes in execution in either run. It's a testament to the camaraderie the community felt amongst themselves, and the dedication of a few folks to make perfect runs, even with much toil and many repeated segments. What Comes Next was about to stress the goodwill among the community near to its limits, threatening to change everything about how Metroid Prime was played. Before we get to that, we have a long, quiet period in Metroid Prime speedrunning. I'm going to let this quiet period of three years play out in the corner while I share with you some excerpts from an interview I did with Oats and Goats, who formerly held the Any% world record in Super Metroid, and also frequently streams that game as well as other games in the Metroid series, including Metroid Prime. Um, I'm Oats and Goats, and I stream on Twitch. I primar primarily do speedruns, Metroid franchise, primarily Super Metroid. What was the kind of genesis of wanting to speedrun? I wanted to explore some some old classics that I had played when I was a kid. And Super Metroid was one of my favorite games. So I fell in love with Super Metroid again. I remembered a lot of the tricks from when I was younger. I thought I was pretty good at the game. So around mid-2012 is when I started timing myself. I didn't re really know that speedruns existed, but I started seeing how good of a time I could get on the end screen and I got sub hour on the end screen. I was like, wow, I must be pretty good. I looked it up. I found a whole world of uh, speedrunners, like a, a whole world that I didn't even know existed. And I found um, Garrison. Garrison had a 40, I think it was a 46, uh, 30 at the time. I didn't realize that it was real time versus game time. So I was like, oh wow, I must be really close. Like I was thinking like 46 or 47 I had to beat. So I was playing more, playing more, playing more. And then I learned it was real time. And then I started, from there, I started just learning strats, um, watching the streams. And there was a little bit of like pride. I was watching Garrison's streams and I said, you know what? A little bit of experience, I think I can beat that. So then I, that, that's kind of how it started, a little bit of ego, pride, whatever. And that's, that's pretty much just how I got started. Uh, how did the experience change for you when you started streaming it yourself? It's hard to remember when I first started streaming. That was, you know, quite a while ago. Um, but I do remember, you know, streaming to an audience of one, sometimes zero. I would primarily just focus on my runs. I played with this uh, USB Logitech controller at the, a lot of people are familiar with them, like the big bulky ones. I played with that on an LCD monitor. There was even more input delay on an emulator. It was terrible, but I actually ended up getting a pretty good time. It was sub, I believe I got sub 50 minutes. So I had a 49 minute, which was really decent for the time with all of that awful equipment. I even had a box fan taped my, to my computer because if it wasn't taped to the computer running full speed, it would crash even just for running the emulator, you know? So that's how I started speed running. And then um, I saved a little bit of money. I got a console, um, started learning about um, capture card stuff. And then um, that's kind of how I got going on with that. Super Metroid was kind of like a soft spot game from your childhood, yeah? What was it like coming back to it and, and sort of approaching it in a more formal way? 
it was definitely a different enjoyment because I always tell people, if you really love a game, expect to kind of lose some of that nostalgia, that magic that you had, that you could remember when you were a kid when you played it. But I still love the game. I also hate the game at the same time, you know? Um, basically, you're gonna end up hating the game if you start speedrunning it. So how it changed was basically from going from a magical game to where I didn't know all of the secrets. You know, a lot of old games, they weren't programmed the best. They had a lot of, a, a, basically a lot of hidden knowledge to be found with like cheats or glitches or whatever. And then once you learn all that with those older games, it kind of loses that magic. So the experience turned from a, a nostalgic, magical experience to now I know everything about the game, but I am obsessed with speedrunning it. You know, that was my new love, a transition from that to like an obsession, essentially. Thinking about that recently, actually, with Metroid Prime is like, I remember one of my most distinct memories, I think, of playing it as a kid was like that sense that the world could go on forever. I think a testament to good game design is when you just have that feeling that there's so much care and intentionality and they're like, there must be something else around that door I can't open. Yeah, then when you learn about it, you, you know, and you've learned how to go out of bounds, you see it's just one big empty void and then you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So to talk to me a bit about what was the evolution of intuitively playing and then practicing with more specificity. This is definitely an experience that everyone goes through when they're trying to learn anything, whether it be piano or any instrument or a speed game. You, you don't really know how to approach learning. Um, luckily, I played instruments uh, when I was younger, so I kind of already developed those skills to, to learn. You, you don't get it right for quite a while. I still don't get it right. I'm still changing how I practice and approach the game. Basically, my approach was just do runs of the game. Do runs, I'm going to develop better technical skills. I'm gonna become more familiar with the game, how it works, how it feels. And that's kind of shifted. When I was going for record, I would strictly just grind for the best room times. That was my approach. And then I would try to put it all together into one single run on stream the hope that to, to get the world record. Looking back, I think that was a pretty bad approach. So now my approach is now shifted to incorporate larger sections of the game to where my mind can kind of glue it all together. And then when I go into the run, I only have to glue six parts together as opposed to a bunch of little rooms. My approach has definitely shifted over the years. And that goes along with, how do I learn? Um, you need to learn to learn. And I think that everyone's approach is gonna be different, but it certainly comes with experience with how you approach it and how you um, basically develop better skills. What would you say your, what achievement in SM or any speedrunning for that matter, what are you most proud of? When I was grinding for the world record, the, uh, I got 4156. I remember I had a, a front page slot. The front page was pretty hard to come by. And when you, when you had a front page slot, it was like really important. And I had a, I believe an, hour time slot in that hour time slot i i got the world record i had that run that i've been grinding for months and months and months and i just so happened to get it on that time slot um so that was definitely one of the the highest moments for me another pretty high moment was the impossible run that i did uh, the impossible rom hack at uh, gdq and that was an awesome experience that was in 2020 and um, it was a finale and yeah People really enjoyed it, and it was it was a lot of good fun. It's a hard ROM hack. Yeah, talk to me a bit about it's it's easy to see thousand people on a stream versus what does it feel like to have a thousand people in a room? It's way more energetic. It's it's an entirely different experience because everyone's just kind of supporting you, and you can just feel the room as opposed to feel the names on a screen. I guess it's it's a fantastic experience. You're very nervous as well, which is which is. Fun. It's 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 fun to be nervous. It's good to be nervous every now and again. It's a great experience because it's people that all love essentially the same thing, getting to experience that in different ways. And so after the impossible run, I went back uh, went back home, started doing my normal stream stuff, and then I came across another ROM hack that was uh, called Kaizo Kaizo Possible. It was created with the intention of completely pass only. Thousands of frame perfect inputs essentially that you need to be able to do, which no one will be able to do in real time. It's ridiculous. So um, someone named Leoren, um, he created a version that would adjust some of those really impossible rooms to be just possible enough to, to complete. I started working on that. I 
completed it. I, th I can't remember. It, it probably took me a couple weeks to beat it one time. I died, I think, 1,400 times or something like that. It was ridiculous. And I said, I really want to try to beat this deathless. Um, no deaths. So from 1,400 to zero. And over the course of three, four, five months, I can't exactly remember, but somewhere in that time frame, I ended up doing um, a deathless run. I, you know, it was a great achievement. It, it the, the game essentially is one hit and you die. And if you make even the slightest little mistake, you're going to die and you need to restart your, your two hour run. Um, so it was a lot of fun. What do you think personality wise causes you to be like, oh, 1400, let's, let's get that down to zero. Because I know I can um, and all that pride, call that ego, call that whatever. I, I like to try to push myself. And then if I set those goals, then I know I kind of have to meet those goals. You know, if you, if you, if you set a goal on stream and since I knew I could do it and I set that goal, I know I'm gonna be kind of pushed by the chat, by myself to reach that goal, which I know I can complete. So even though I knew it would be very difficult, that's kind of how I approached it. Uh, if, if the chat were a person, what, what, what is the personality of the chat? Annoying little nephew that wants to play the games on your phone constantly and flicks you, you know, constantly saying they're not touching you. You know, I'm not touching you. I'm not, that's probably the, you know, I personify them. And it is almost like the literal personification of like playing a video game with your family or, you know, your little brother or something. It's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, um, I mean, they definitely have it up too. I, I love my community. They're great, but yeah, it's it's a lot of back and forth. It's fun. What, what does the community feel like for you from your end? Even though there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of jokes at the expense of myself, it's always very supportive. I, I'm always pretty um, open with how I'm feeling. And a lot of people are very uh, supportive if you know I'm having an off day or people are willing to push the jokes aside. So it's always nice to turn on stream if I'm not feeling the greatest and know that people will be chill, relaxed, and still enjoy the stream and be able to um, have a good time, which is good for them, but also, also good for myself, you know, to kind of just get away from um, any stress or monotony. It's always a great experience. Turn on the stream and know that that's there. Would you say it would be possible to do it apart from a stream or a community or? Some people can do that, but there's no way I could do offline runs or there's no way I could I could push like Deathless Kaizo if I wasn't backed by a community. I've tried to do offline runs five years ago. I did, I think one, and I said, I'm never gonna do this again. I, if I hit that goal, I want to experience it with the community that's been there 99% of the times that I have been attempting. So I would hate to also take that away. Yeah, so talk to me a bit about your relationship with Metroid Prime. Prime is definitely one of my favorite Metroid games. It's pretty close to Super Metroid, might even be tied, but um, played Prime right when it came out. I love the game. I had that same nostalgia for it. And when I started streaming, it was a few years into my stream before I revisited it. Fell in love with it. And then once I was done with that stream, I probably started looking up the, the speedruns of it uh, more in depth. I had known of the speedruns, but I hadn't really uh, studied them or looked at them. And then um, I learned that, wow, this game is actually very intricate. Um, there's a lot to it. This might be something that I could really enjoy grinding. What was it like when you first played the game suddenly shifting from something that you were familiar with and loved in 2D into 3D. Looking back on it, I, I always say that I think the way they did Prime was the perfect transition from 2D to 3D. I think they did yeah, just the perfect job you could do with the hardware that was available to them at the time. You went through a similar arc of, of kind of like, let's just play this again, let's see how it feels. Then you started sort of seeking out what other people were doing. Did you have that same sense of like, oh, well, if this person can do it, then I can do it? Or was like there, I don't know, like a shock or, you know, seeing what other people were doing at the time? Um, no, I hadn't had that same experience because with Super Metroid, I had a decent amount of experience when I was younger. Um, and I felt like I was pretty good at the game. I knew a lot of the tricks. I knew a lot of the skips. And when I went into Metroid Prime, I hadn't known really anything. 
Um, I was learning an entirely new world, so I didn't look at the world record run and go, oh, I can beat that. I looked at it and went, wow, this is insane. You know, I have no idea how they're doing this, but I really want to learn all the tricks and learn what they're doing. Setting out to learn the Metroid Prime run, what were the things that you first tackled? I mean, I guess probably starting with skips and then maybe working your way into the movement or, or how did you approach that? Basically, I learned all of the necessary skips. It, some necessary things are like scan dashing that you have to learn like right off of the ship. And then I remember there's one trick in phase on mines that um, normally you need the spider ball to go up. There's a skip to where you can do an, like an instant on morph, um, yada, yada, yada. It's, it's really technical, really hard. That is one thing I said, all right, I started my run. I'm going to learn this on the spot. And I think it took me five hours somewhere around there just to get this one trick in this one room. That's probably because I was stubborn as well. And I just really wanted to learn it. After about five hours, I finally got it down. And then after that, I think because I just took so long, I think the next time was, I can't remember if it took me five hours, but I, I know it was over three. And then the next attempt was less than an hour. The next attempt was less than 20 minutes. The next attempt was less than five minutes. I think that was good that I was stubborn because I had to learn it all right there. It was a painful process. Once I got that trick down, everything else kind of started coming in, in you know, it kind of all started falling in place. There's a bunch of uh, movement tricks and techniques that I hadn't known about. And then the community was very helpful as well. Like, hey, uh, do this here, do this here. Oh, this is faster. Um, this is how you do this. And those kind of just kind of got uh, sprinkled into the run, I guess, as I learned the, the couple big skips. It's ironic that a single trick would take you longer to learn than most people spend on just a casual playthrough of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was awful. So one of the reasons I think that the game doesn't kind of have the same window appeal, I guess, of a lot of even 2D games or third person uh, 3D games is like, it's just hard to know what's going on when you just watch a playthrough. You're like looking at walls flying by and somewhat limited to like understand what the runner is really doing. Did you find that that hampered your learning at all? Like not kind of having that pulled back perspective or? For sure, because with uh, Super Metroid or any 2D game at that, you can see the player. You can see exactly what they're doing and kind of, you, you can observe everything happening right in front of your face towards Metroid Prime. You can just see your cannon. And like you said, the speedrunners are just zooming across the rooms. You have no idea how they did it. You have no context clues. The learning process was much more difficult for that reason. I, I definitely had a harder time um, picking up on it quickly than I would any other 2D game. Obviously, the visual learning is the most important part, right, with speedrunning. And a lot of that is kind of stripped away. I mean, you mentioned earlier about you had to relearn how to learn in that game. How far did you feel like you wanted to push yourself in that? And sort of how did you start to, to try to reach those goals in, in Metroid Prime specifically? I kind of just wanted to keep improving. Um, I know there was a little bit of camaraderie in the community to where like I was trying to get sub 110 or um, sub hour in-game time has always been a kind of a goal in the back of my mind. Um, I decided to strictly do inbound runs where the community has out of bounds um, in the same category. Um, there is no separation on the leaderboards. So I also made it a point of pride, I guess, to try to reach some of those goals um, strictly inbounds. What made you want to restrict yourself to inbounds? Um, I did a little bit of out of bounds and it's just very finicky. For me, it kind of just killed the flow and I wasn't having that much fun and it's not something that I really wanted to just practice. There's there's a lot of small little things you'll get caught up on, or if you don't do something just right, or if you don't exactly know how to do an out of bounds room. You know, there's a lot of weird stuff going on out of bounds. You can essentially soft lock and have to restart. For me, that's not how I wanted to approach speedrunning. I don't know, hearing you describe it like that, it's it's uh, it kind of takes what's already difficult about Metroid Prime as far as like 
not having a lot of context for what you're seeing or how to practice and just makes it even worse. Oh it's yeah, not where it, the developers it amplifies intended. that because you know, on top of having no context clues because you only see the can and you have no idea the techniques happening, you also need to deal with tiny invisible things that will essentially destroy your run. So it makes it even worse the the learning process and yeah, it's just not something I wanted to deal with. Compare the challenge of doing that versus the challenge of Kaizo, for instance. It basically just lack of knowledge. It's it's tough to really understand what's going on to where Kaizo was. The knowledge is pretty much all there. It's just you need to completely execute and uh, not mess up a single input in 90% of the room. So, I mean, Prime's community has never been massive by speedrunning standards, but it's been pretty steady for 20 years that the game has been out. People have always discussed it, always sort of played it to that higher level of like, let's uh, cut out items, let's go faster. Why would you say that, that that the game has staying power like that, A, and then B, why is it not like? <clears throat> well, I think we need to look at the Metroid franchise versus any other franchise. Metroid has always been kind of the underperformer. Not as many people play Metroid as they play Mario or Zelda or Pokemon. So I think for that reason alone, and the fact that it's 3D, not a 2D platformer, the speedrun has kind of those uh, things we were talking about, uh, don't really know what's going on. It might be kind of intimidating to approach. I think all those things might kind of lead to a smaller, tight-knit community. But I think mainly it's the Metroid franchise, just in general. It's hard to draw in a lot of people playing Super Metroid versus Mario 64. Mario 64 came out later, more people know the game. Mario, classic game. So I think just for those reasons alone, more people will gravitate towards any Mario Zelda versus any Metroid. With the evolution of, of Twitch and kind of having a community, generally speaking, in the Prime community, it switched from segmented runs of people sort of going from safe station to safe station, kind of perfecting each segment before they moved on versus like single segment running. So what are your thoughts broadly on that on that shift from the uh, the perfectionist mindset of uh, segment to segment versus like, let's go all in. And even if it takes a, a hundred or a thousand resets, like we're going to get the, the whole thing in one go. If you're live streaming, obviously what people are going to be or gravitated towards is going to be single segments. They're going to want to see the entire game they're gonna to wanna to see it done quickly. Segmented runs take away from some of people's enjoyment. They're gonna see save station to save station. They're gonna see only that segment. And a lot of people just wanna go, oh, Metroid Prime, I love that game. Speedrunning, wow, I wanna see how they beat this game in under two hours or whatever, in under, under an hour and a half. So I think that kind of created a shift to not only uh, single segment runs, but also RTA, real time. Super Metroid used to be game time as well. I think that also live streaming had a, um, an, an impact on game time to real time. If you have a timer and you see the entire game, that is going to be much more entertaining and stimulating to the viewer than uh, segmented. And then, oh, I wonder what time we got. We gotta wait till the end screen. And then you see a, a minute like a 50 minutes. Okay, well, is it 50 minutes and 59 seconds? Is it 50 minutes flat? Live streaming is obviously for the audience. And I think that's probably why the shift happened. Do you think it will ever switch in Metroid Prime? <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I always try to just stay away from that topic now because a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of just veteran runners, you know, that have been playing the game way longer than I have. Um, so I, I'm definitely out of place there, you know, I, I don't want to overstep my bounds. I mean, I, I personally would like to see a shift towards RTA. I think it's just obviously a more accurate representation of the run as a whole, but I don't really have a say and it's kind of just out of my place. Thanks again, Oats and Goats, for the awesome interview. It was great to be able to talk to you about your history with speedrunning and uh, your forays into Metroid Prime. Now. I would be remiss if I didn't show at least a little bit of this clip here. After a period of seven years from his previous world record and months and months of practice, well, this happened.
Dude! <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> this has been so challenging, dude. <laughs> this has been so mentally draining. <laughs> I'm so happy it's done. The emotions of relief and excitement and joy and, and just everything that hits someone when they accomplish a goal uh, as significant as setting a new world record, that is one of my favorite things about speedrunning. And so I just want to take every opportunity to share something like that. I want to congratulate you, Oats, for the amazing run. And we're going to move on to the next part of the Metroid Prime Any% percent World Record History. If you recall in the interview, Oates was talking about something called inbounds and out of bounds. Now you may already know what this is referring to, but if you don't, I'll explain simply that Oates chooses to omit some of the next major developments that happened in the Metroid Prime Any% percent World Record. Now these are changes that actually prove to be just a little bit contentious in the Metroid Prime speedrunning community. As I mentioned earlier, MPZoid's run was released about four months prior to the release of Metroid Prime 3 for the Wii. As mentioned in connection with Metroid Prime 2, there's a decent chance that Metroid Prime runners' interest shifted for a bit to playing the new game, if only for enjoyment and the dedication to the Metroid Prime series. Once again though, that dedicated group of people were still primarily focused on developing Metroid Prime and continuing to push for lower times as they looked for new strategies and techniques to get the time lower. There was just one problem. No one could beat MP Zoid's time. The route that Kip and MP Zoid used stood as a world record for over six years. No one was going to out execute them on that route on their way to getting a 102. It was unlikely that simply fixing mistakes would lower the time by the 40 seconds needed to hit the next minute mark. Lower times were certainly possible, but a route reimagining seemed to be the most fruitful area to explore. So, as speedrunners often do, the community went back to the drawing board. They poked and prodded and thought about it from new angles, thought outside of the box. Outside of the, the box. So every, every room in Metroid Prime exists inside of a box. That, I'm still getting ahead of myself. The year is 2006. The location is starmen.net, a fan forum for the Earthbound series. One user starts a discussion about the codes in Metroid 1 that allows you to skip to various points in the game. Users join in the discussion, including one mysterious figure. They speculate about the Metroid 1 passwords, then one user offers the thought, Metroid has been and forever will be a series of mysteries that either were intentional or were never supposed to be seen by playing eyes, aka the lost world in Metroid Prime. The users around the table are taken aback. Huh? I've never heard of this. Explain. Wait, wait, wait. Lost Worlds in Metroid Prime? Explain. The shadowy figure simply laughs. You do know who found the first secret world, right? The table is silent. All eyes on him. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little story. The Lost World of Metroid Prime is a small glitch that launched an entire insane hunt for more all over the internet, found by yours truly during a cold day in December of 2003 in a certain transport tunnel C near a certain crashed frigate. Haha. <laughs> Let's take a look at one of the most fateful rooms in Metroid Prime, 
a room which otherwise would be about as important as any of the other squiggly boys. Transport Tunnel C is one of the many buffer rooms in the game, whose only real purpose is to put a bit of space between the player and the next big room. In a normal playthrough, it's entirely likely that a player might only see this room once. After getting the ice beam and taking the elevator back to Talon Overworld, you jump down into the lake in front of the crashed frigate and realize that you need the gravity suit to proceed. And then there's not much of a reason to take this elevator again. It's kind of out of the way, you can't really get to it from Talon Overworld unless you're really cool and can do speedrun things and once the frigate is beaten and this gate which we've seen bypassed a few times again by cool skilled speedrunners is opened the other elevator serves as the quickest route between Chozo ruins and phase on mines but not long after the game came out ganmon the mysterious figure noticed this little crack a little crack that might be big enough for samus to escape from so he stuck samus's head up there and jumped and jumped and jumped and jumped and moved himself around and finally got out. He was the first person to ever enter and document what would be known as a secret world. But now, look. Say the line, Bart. This topic would probably be best served by its own video. But as soon as the first secret world was discovered and documented, there were massive efforts within the Metroid Prime community to find out as much about these out of bounds or secret worlds as the player possibly could. Just as the original testing and discussion of the game was based around sequence breaking, and in turn developed a community of people that were dedicated to lowering the completion percentage and eventually beating the game faster and faster, as we've talked about, so too was there a somewhat parallel community for finding out all about these secret worlds. It's interesting in retrospect, but there was certainly an aspect of novelty to going outside the boundaries of a 3D game, even more so in a game that's otherwise just polished, stable, and solid as Metroid Prime. Anyone that's played Gary's Mod or enabled cheats in any of the Source games has certainly at some point used Noclip to fly around a 3D level and poke around the artifice that makes it a convincing 3D space. Maybe that's just me and other video game nerds. In 2003, on a console, it wasn't something that people were used to experiencing. In fact, anecdotally, I remember being a kid and finding out about these secret worlds, and I too was able to get outside of the game's geometry in Transport Tunnel C. But in fact, my little brother, about three years younger than me, really didn't like it. He hated it. He was uh, scared <laughs> of the, the out-of-bounds world. I think just being uh, about four or five years old at the time, it just kind of freaked him out because that's not how the world is supposed to look. I've read a lot of forum posts of people saying that it's unnerving or unusual and creepy in some ways, but uh, there was just a lot of people that wanted to discover as much about these secret worlds as possible. Now, the whole backrooms genre of spooky internet content and liminal space and all that sort of stuff has really blown up over the last few years, but I think it's probably within that same vein and in the mid 2000s i think that was definitely a bit more of a novelty the fact that you can go outside the boundaries of the game and see how the level is constructed really specifically and totally breaks that magical artifice which otherwise makes the game feel like it can go on forever and ever if there were only one more door being able to get into what was essentially a restricted area of the game was certainly a novelty for the time but i can also see how it would actually be a bit unnerving on the other hand, I can also see how some people might think it was a waste of time. Among those who weren't passionately invested in discovering and documenting secret worlds, there was an attitude about them of basically being an amusing novelty. But even within a few months of their discovery, it was clear that it would eventually be a point of contention. In April of 2004, user Cridley asked on the Metroid 2002 forums if Ice Beam Before Flagra take note, would be added to the site as a documented topic under the sequence breaking category. His question didn't even remotely concern the world record or the any percent running of the game at that point. Navigating in secret worlds was so slow, poorly understood, and underdeveloped that it didn't even cross many people's minds as being useful for the any percent run. Nate summed up the issue. If this were somehow faster for a speed run, which it's not to my knowledge, it would not be allowed. Radix's rules say no severe map glitches like secret worlds. Period. Full stop. That was the position of Nate, and so he was not even going to include information about secret worlds on Metroid 2002. Radix, the 100% runner and moderator of SDA, commented later in the thread, showing some of the contention to come. The simple fact is I need generic rules across all games in existence. I do not want to have lots of exceptions for games. 
I ban all out of world and mysterious teleporting glitches, and that's it. If you don't like it, I guess you can start your own speedrun site. Okay, yeah, there you go. That's that's the rules, and no one was going to be able to develop this into the any percent run and have it count as a world record. Radix was the moderator of SDA, and SDA had a rigorous submission process where the runs were reviewed by moderators and people made sort of executive decisions on whether or not they would be accepted. So that was just the word. Yet the secret world research continued thanks to users like Flamancipator, Booster, Control Alt Destroy, Tom Lube, and the Pizza Boy. Many new secret worlds were discovered. There was even a fairly comprehensive guide written on the rules and constraints of moving within secret worlds. And don't worry, we'll be discussing them in a bit. Most of this development was happening on Metroid 2002's sister site already mentioned, Samus.co.uk, which was run by Andrew Mill. Mills was overall much more interested in researching and understanding secret worlds, as well as having a hunch that they might be useful one day for routes in the game. Like I said, we'll talk more about moving around in and using secret worlds later. But right now, it's important to understand that these didn't seem especially useful. The Transport Tunnel C secret world was out in the middle of nowhere from a game routing point of view. It was a pain to move around in a secret world, and it didn't seem possible at first to re-enter the inbound space of the game or navigate between rooms. Leaving the confines of the game basically meant you were marooned in this void of curiosity and foreboding, unable to return. The most interesting outcome besides getting completely stuck was falling into infinite nothingness. That's not especially helpful for speedrunning or sequence breaking. So even putting aside the issue of Radix and SDA disallowing secret worlds in their submissions, secret worlds just didn't seem helpful to many of the users at Metroid 2002. They believed it to be a waste of time to research and understand them. On Samus.co.uk, however, the secret worlds were all named, numbered, and thoroughly documented. Mills would give special user titles on the forums to people that found and documented secret worlds, even awarding the coveted Secret World Haxor if a user found more than seven. In contrast, however, on the Metroid 2002 forums, the secret world discussion was less than warm. A user named Banks, who made many of the earliest discoveries on the GameFAQs thread, interjected in a thread about stupid discoveries in 2003, offering up Secret Worlds as an example. Mills responded by saying, Glad to see you're finding all the Secret Worlds discoveries useless. And they argued. Mills made his case in a post which would turn out to be quite prescient and will be quoted at length. I am relieved to see that you are all paying such close attention to the secret world developments. Cause then you would have noticed that. Ages ago I have managed to physically move between rooms in the secret worlds already, via the doors. Without any glitches or without any AR2. And with an AR2 I have gone between 5 rooms with no hassle or problems. And how do we plan on making it back it out? I'm still investigating using the same principles as seen in the boost through the elite wall from the back. Half of the sequence breaking developments would have been thought impossible when people started low percent runs. Now look at it. Heck, even super Metroid has had a few development to lower the percent to 14% nine years after the game was released. Why throw so much disdain at the secret world developments, seeing as the sequence breaking stuff has all but almost dried up? There might not be lots to do in the secret worlds, but if sequence breakers had obtaken that attitude towards low percent, it'd still be stuck on around 28% or so. Instead of bashing it, maybe you could help out and try and make them work to our advantage. Or is that just a crazy idea? Banks, however, just laid in harder. You can rub it in my face all you want once your secret world nonsense actually produces something useful. Notice that this topic is called stupid MP tricks. It's not how secret worlds just might lead to the possibility of maybe doing something other than nothing. 
perhaps somewhat funny in retrospect, but at the time passions were quite high. Both sides had some merit, because on the one hand, Mills was far from right in saying that sequence breaking had dried up in 2003. The route for the Any% percent record would change several times over the next four years, and there was still a bevy of skips and techniques that would take the time lower. Furthermore, when he talks about using an AR2, he's talking about using a cheating device, which made it easier to practice movement in the little understood secret worlds, as users could use a moon jump code to place Samus wherever they needed out of bounds. You can see why a community that prizes the human execution of speedrunners would be a bit wary of somebody using cheat codes to understand the game better. I think this disagreement might be best reduced to purist versus visionary categories. The Metroid 2002 community, backed by the clear rules from SDA, believes that the only only useful way to spend time researching was looking for techniques that could be executed by humans, and they did this by executing these techniques that could be executed by humans. In other words, why waste time researching something that wouldn't be useful, that wouldn't be allowed within SDA's rules or that people didn't want to use, frankly. However, the visionary mindset of Mills and Samus.co.uk is much more closely aligned with speedrunning as we know it today. Today, there are communities of people around games, including Metroid Prime, that use task strategies, level viewers, level editors, and a variety of other tools to dissect and understand the game. And don't worry, we'll talk about all of them. This is really pure research as many of these players have no idea if the things they discover and understand about their games will be useful. Yet, when something useful is found, and if there's even a sliver of hope that it can be executed by human hands, there's usually someone willing to try. Back in our form squabbles of the mid-2000s, Metroid 2002 would try to make overtures of peace. In September of 2005, Nate would update the Metroid 2002 homepage with the following note, which I'll have read with a bit of snark, because that's how it reads to me. While Samus.co.uk is usually thought of as the resource for secret world information, I thought it wouldn't hurt to document Metroid Prime secret worlds here, Metroid 2002 style. The push was spearheaded by a moderator on the Metroid 2002 forums, DJ Granola. He was a runner who was working hard to develop Metroid Prime 2's low percent categories and was using secret worlds in the sequel. He offered a bit of explanation on the forums. The post explains that the samus.co.uk content was becoming out of date and was not being updated, and that it seemed advantageous to have all of the information about Metroid Prime centralized onto one site. Acknowledging some of the hard feelings between the sites, he ends by saying, I can only apologize to anyone who is unhappy about this section. It is genuinely intended in the best possible manner to be a comprehensive documentation project. It is neither an attempt to A. Fill Metroid 2002's forums with noobs, or B. Steal Samus.co.uk's hard work. Please remember this. Mills responded shortly by saying, No doubt people are waiting for my reaction to this. Bit of a bombshell announcement. And I have to be completely honest, I have mixed feelings and went on to explain why he was glad to see their acceptance, but still remembered the viciousness with which they were treated. Some users were glad to see the knowledge base expand, but intended to keep playing the game as normal. We'll see if that one sticks. I don't know, we'll see. With Secret Worlds being basically normalized across both forums, development, tinkering, and discussion pressed forward. Users would start experimenting with full game routing and would eventually figure out how to use Secret Worlds to their benefit while attempting to break the Any% percent world record. However, the frustrating fact of SDA's rules remained. If those rules didn't change, there would be no official world record using Secret Worlds, because the legitimacy of the record would not be recognized by the essentially governing body of speedruns. Today, the arbitration of official world records is much more democratized. Most communities typically hash out their own rule sets for games. If there are tricks discovered which made the run too short and skipped huge sections of the game, the community typically just made new categories and moved on. Think here of the various star count categories in Super Mario 64, or the fine-grained differences between the glitches allowed in various categories of Ocarina of Time runs. Furthermore, runs on speedrun.com are typically moderated by members of the game's own community. Knowledgeable users review new runs and ensure that they are compliant with the rules for the category they are submitted to and are not cheats in any way. However, up to about 2010, SDA was the only website which was governing speedruns, and Radix and the site's official rules were clear that no major skips were allowed in submitted runs for any game. Furthermore, because the moderators of the site reviewed runs from every game submitted to the site, there was a mentality that a speedrun had to have some je ne sais quoi 
some sort of unplaceable elegance or quality that was particular to speedrunning generically. This basically meant that runs and runners that the moderators didn't like could be rejected because it didn't meet SDA standards. This, in turn, bred elitism and hard feelings, to say the least. It may seem odd today, but back then, changing the rules of speedrunning was a much bigger deal than simply hashing it out with a handful of runners on any given game's particular discord. When the rules change, they change for everyone. All of this is perhaps the bare minimum of context needed to understand what comes next, as Metroid Prime and the entire speedrunning community on SDA would be turned upside down. As we just saw, in 2005, user Bartender Sparky who, again, doesn't have an avatar, just artist rendition, stock photo, whatever, commented on the addition of Secret Worlds to Metroid 2002 by saying that he had little interest in them. But as time went on, and their utility for potentially lowering Empezoid's time seemed to grow, the allure of putting together a completely revolutionary route grew. And on June 26, 2008, Sparky posted a video of the Frigate playthrough and said that he was starting a new thing and that it wasn't particularly cool yet. What it turned into, after two years of work and a small holy war within the community, was the next world record. Besides working on it for two years, and which I can't imagine working on something about a video game for two years, there was also the small matter of overcoming Metroid 2002 and SDA's ban on major skips and glitches. At this point, and going forward, MPZoid started burning bridges in the community quickly, all while speculating that he could complete a perfect run over seven years that would get his time down to 101. Bartender Sparky, or just Sparky, gradually posted new segments and slowly hashed out, basically through his own persistence and curiosity, what would become the first route to incorporate out-of-bounds movement. MPZoid was critical, frequently angry, and at the final showdown on the SDA forums in June of 2010, finally went a bit ballistic. On June 15th, 2010, Bartender Sparky brought his appeal to the highest court in speedrunning at the time, the SDA forums. He was just seven days away from completing his project, which he thought could result in a new world record. But first, he had to make sure it could even be considered for a world record. He made a calm, thorough argument while asking for secret worlds to be allowed within SDA approved runs. He appealed on the grounds that moving through secret worlds required immense skill, were a high risk, high reward choice, and that open-ended routing was in the very nature of Metroid games themselves. He had a good reason for wanting these rules to be changed, but his argument was pretty clear and was well-reasoned. There was a bit of pushback. It started with Master88, a longtime member of Metroid 2002 and SDA, with words that have reverberated in the memes for over a decade. I'm not like this. These need are a separate category. That's unfair runner like Zoid, who is, did, most awesome speed runs in SDA without Secret Worlds. He is just best. That's so unfair if he got lost his records if someone used Secret Worlds. Also, Secret Worlds are cheating. These skip a large amount of game, and you will always find new Secret Worlds and route will always change. Also, wall crawls skip much interesting tricks, and it's not look cool. See when someone jumping outside screen most of time. All, all super awesome trick will be lost, like vent shaft jump, geocore bomb slot jump, and etc. stuff. If we're talking about low percent runs, I personally like watch much more speed runs without use secret worlds because these speed runs are real. So this rule change is big bad idea. I'm not like this. Hopefully, it's never happened. Yeah, so 
While the English of the Thin wasn't totally clear, the sentiment was. It was a crusade that other members, including MP Zoid, also took up. He threw some rather sharp elbows to maintain the record that he had worked hard to earn and held on to for over three years. The attacks got... bitter. In the end, though, it was the same purist versus visionary mentality that was coming to a head. The speculation that had seemed useless to some and many had laughed at was finally knocking out the door with a new world record. Everyone who had worked to discover all they could about secret worlds and Sparky's sparks of creativity that were shaving off time towards a new world record couldn't be ignored. The purists were losing the argument. Without hashing up all of the old drama, and believe me, there is plenty of drama, SDA finally demurred. Radix apologized for his hardline stance and the rules were opened up. As the threat on SDA wound down, there were rumors of the new 102 run that Sparky was completing. There was a bit of gentle ribbing from an up-and-come Metroid Prime 2 runner. Finally, the SDA thread was locked. What bartender Sparky posted on the same day on Metroid 2002 was a 101. One bit of drama surrounding Sparky's run was the accusation that he only wanted to change the rules because he couldn't beat MP Zoid's run following the rules that had already been established. But what's clear looking at Sparky's run is that he had an extremely tight, technical, and up-to-date grasp on inbounds movement. There's a decent chance that he could have figured out a way to get a 1 or 2 without Secret Worlds, but in true Maverick fashion, he not only played at a level no one had seen before, but changed the entire rulebook of speedrunning to validate his creativity and skill. The change has stuck, and this is how most people play Metroid Prime now. This run only incorporates two out-of-bounds, or as I'll refer to them from now on, Secret World sections. One contained dozens of nearly frame-perfect inputs and was so hard that it took Sparky eight months to get a fast enough segment for it to be useful, and we'll never see it again after this run. The other secret world section is a staple of Metroid Prime speedrunning, which we'll turn to first, Ice Beam Before Flagra, or IBBF. IBBF basically accomplishes three things. Number one, not having to do this obnoxious puzzle, which takes about 20 seconds of IGT and a ton of cutscenes just to remove the lock on this door. Number two, it circumvents the wave beam door on the route to ice beam, allowing for the ice beam to be the first beam obtained in the game, which in turn, number three, allows for a host of new routing opportunities. However, in the words of longtime community member Kirby Master, there's probably a lot of stuff you guys didn't understand oh. about what happened during IBBF, and it would take way too long to explain every little okay. thing. Which, uh, yeah, you know, just, just give me a golf ball. The routing shift facilitated by IBBF was to pick up Plasma Beam immediately after doing the first swing through Fendrana Drifts to pick up Boost and Wave, moving the Plasma Beam back up early into the item order, similar to Calfulio, who picks it up even before setting foot in Phazon Mines. Now, IBBF definitely isn't a free time save, as it requires skill, focus, and a decent chunk of time to execute. Sparky's IBBF took about 1 minute and 40 seconds of in-game time to go from the Secret World entrance and gathering hall to the reflecting pool. However, if you deduct the 20 seconds for the puzzle, cancel out the time it would take to get Ice Beam anyway, and factor in the routing change which this trick facilitated, IBBF allows for a nice little time save. That's about as accurate as I'm going to be able to be with this absurdly complicated game. Sorry. IBBF wasn't easy though, and neither was anything else performed in this route. Besides great out-of-bounds movement, Sparky brought a new and higher level of play to the category. This route was one step closer to the current ideal of always be dashing off of something if possible. There were some great new dashes exhibited, such as the dash to Flagra's bomb slots during the Genius Strat, new dashes in Ice Ruins West, and a few other new movement tricks. All of these were little bits of time shaved off and helped bring two whole minutes off of MP Zoid's time in addition to IBBF. There were also some pretty awesome flourishes, I think. There was this bomb space jump, BSJ, to the ice beam door, which is pretty much a one try trick over a massive drop in a pool of lava and has never been seen again in an any percent record. Actually, this trick isn't, it's still pretty hard. Definitely not the hardest thing in this run. Tom actually clarified when I visited him, he got me set up in the right spot and talked me through how to do it. And I eventually did hit it just once, but it was awesome. Check it out. Uh, the camera will on more from the direction you're facing. So yeah. <gasps> there you go, there you go, I'm getting closer. Maybe if you uh, let go of Al, it might. <laughs> 
you do actually you do actually want L input because like you, especially if you're not facing the direction you want to like get moving as soon as that as soon as possible. But like, <gasps> yeah, see, ah! see, there you go. <laughs> little 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 bit of razzle dazzle with the proper L input, and you can get that. <gasps> oh <laughs> yes. Dude, that took you like a minute. Yeah, that's what that I'm was saying. Sick. That's what I'm saying. Like that, that jump is like not super difficult. Ah. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. That was amazing. Go play Metroid Prime. That was sick. <laughs> yeah. But use then, a practice mod because that would have taken like three hours if yeah, I had to reset that it every time. <laughs> There was a decision to get this missile expansion first, which, by my timing, is about flush in time, but looks very cool. Sparky also saves a ton of time by skipping the wave buster. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, Sparky is the first runner to go for the hole-in-one coming out of Life Giver, but the tech wasn't quite there yet to make it, so he misses. Still, it was a decent time save over what both Kip and MP Zoid did, unmorphing to jump over the boost ball halfpipe, the latter in an apparent tribute to the former's inferior strategy. Towards the closing stages of the run, we find the most impressive and unique trick, perhaps in any of the Any% percent records, the Faison Elite Wall Crawl. This secret world movement had never been seen before and has never been used since. It features some remarkable views of rooms in the game, such as the poison gas flooded vent shaft from the outside, or a view of the impact crater, which we can see through a window in Faison Mines. But the centerpiece of this wall crawl are 12 perfectly executed Aether jumps which we'll talk about later. Without belaboring the difficulty of this trick, let's just summarize it as 12 jumps, each with a three frame window. It's basically pressing B exactly on and only on the frames you saw the screen of this video turn completely green in the last 16 seconds. It is not an easy trick. That segment alone took Sparky eight months to get right. It may be a bit understandable then why he was insistent on petitioning for a rule change on SDA. It took about four months of deliberation, but in October of 2010, the rules had been updated and Sparky's run was officially recognized as the world record time in the any percent category of Metroid Prime. Before we talk about our next run, let's revisit that little comment about every room existing inside of a box. It's basically become a meme from AGDQ runs. Every room is inside a box. Uh, every room is surrounded by a box. Invisible box. Box. Invisible box. The box. Box. Magical invisible box. But there is, in fact, a box around every room. Inside this box, there is gravity. Outside the box, there is Aether. Let's cover just a few technicalities of what moving around out of bounds or in a secret world means. Throughout the early years of developing strategies for moving out of the normal boundaries of rooms, players were basically stuck with trying to figure out everything they could about the out of bounds areas through repetition, observation, and sharing of discoveries. It was basically like scientific inquiry, even including some published papers like this 33-page document compiled by Flamancipator about moving in secret worlds that I alluded to earlier. It contained documentation on each known secret world entry point, as well as general rules and guidelines of how to move within them. Secret worlds work because of an interesting property of Metroid Prime, which was relatively new to game development at the time. The rooms Samus navigates through are completely geometrically consistent. In other words, as Samus moves from one room to another, the game is loading the next room seamlessly adjacent to the room that you're currently in, and all these rooms always line up from one end of the world to the other. A game world this big that was loaded continuously without any trickery was a bit of a novelty at the time, and was actually a major source of pride for many of the developers, including Zoid. As a point of comparison, notice the difference when you go between areas in Ocarina of Time. The game warps you as you transition from one area to the next with a small cutscene. There was no need for rooms to exist next to each other. The game could just dump one from memory, irrespective of the other and load Link into the next one. In fact, if you loaded every single room in the game at once, they would all occupy the same space. However, in Metroid Prime, the developers made every effort to place rooms seamlessly next to each other, leaving you in the immersion of navigating an alien world for as long as possible. The only hiccups in this are long tunnel rooms, which, as we discussed earlier, give the game more time to unload and load big rooms and the world transition elevators. Still, Metroid Prime represents a massive leap forward from the previous generation of open world games like Legend of Zelda with obvious cuts and gameplay at every room transition. Neither game is technically perfect in its execution, Ocarina has its own uh, particular abuses of its room loading mechanics and everything else, but that's outside the scope of this video, obviously. 
and Metroid Prime has secret worlds. Every secret world has its own little oddities, potential pitfalls, setups for getting into it, and methods of getting out of it. But secret worlds generally follow a few basic rules. If you're inside the box, and not standing on geometry or collision, that is the walls and inbound space of the game, you're going to fall to the bottom of the box, and you can jump freely as long as Samus isn't stuck to a wall. The edges of geometry, that is the outermost edge of a plane of the interior space of the game level, are generally fair game for walking and jumping. But if you try to stand on the exterior portion of the face of the plane, you're likely to get stuck. If you're outside the box, Samus can walk but can't jump and very slowly floats upwards. If you're not standing on collision, Samus will fall. To move to another room, you have to hit a load trigger typically seen in gameplay as either standing on a door or shooting it. This causes the game to load the next room you're trying to enter. Basically, you have to interact with the door like you would in normal gameplay, getting close to it and shooting it, but from the outside. There's a lot of nuance and technicalities here that doesn't totally bear discussing though. Just think, there's a process of moving from one room to another. Finally, one of the easiest and most consistently used methods of getting out of a secret world and back into the game's world is to place yourself within the space of the next room and then shoot the door that you'd enter it from, thereby loading the level around you. I'll mention some other interesting methods of re-entering the game space as we see them, but this is generally the method we'll see used most often. When runners try to explain moving out of bounds, like when they're explaining the game at GDQ, magical invisible box, the reason that they often default back to it's way harder than it looks and every room is inside a box is that those are really the two phrases that best approximate moving out of bounds. Taking the time to practice and get an intuitive feel for how to navigate these portions of gameplay takes an immense amount of time and practice, and most players, when they are finally able to get into a secret world, end up spending most of their time either stuck to a wall, stuck in aether, or falling to infinity. So long story short, it really is harder than it looks. Still, as we go forward and continue looking at new records, it's worth noting the general risk versus reward of Secret Worlds. We're about to look at a new runner who made a high degree of polish when moving through Secret Worlds the minimum level of skill for setting a new any% percent world record. Yet at the same time, it would also be the last run that's segmented. Sparky's phase on mine Secret World Traversal would be unthinkable in a single segment run today, as it contains so many frame-perfect tricks with a high chance of failure. Flubbing the execution of movement in a secret world quickly destroys any benefit of using that route, sometimes even ending the run completely in a soft lock, a position from which Samus cannot be recovered. So we get back to that question of routing. When Calfolio double bomb jumped off the back of the ship, it was just because that was how it had to be done with what was known at the time to finish the game quickly, despite how challenging the trick was. When a secret world can be avoided to achieve an equivalent time, a runner will usually choose to do the inbounds route. However, secret worlds as a general concept have tremendous potential for skipping puzzles and rooms which would otherwise be impossible inbounds. For that reason, secret worlds that are generally possible with practice end up being fair game for the any% percent route. At the end of the day, the fastest route is whatever people are willing to practice and execute. Our next runner chose a route with fewer secret worlds and a faster time, and iterated the world record lower than anyone thought possible, polishing movement and raising the bar for everyone that came after. Before we meet the next runner though, let's recap where we are in time. I'll be honest, this little stretch of history is a bit of a whirlwind. We start with this run that was earth shattering only in the very limited realm of Metroid Prime speedrunning. Sparky's 101 in July of 2010. Just one week later, a little game was released. You may have heard of it. It's got procedurally generated blocks. You smack them around a bit and pick them up, and then you can build all of London. Kind of crazy how a little drop of water of a game can grow into an ocean of cultural impact. Metroid Prime has been kind of like a weird lake somewhere in the mountains that like six people have seen, but they all talk about how beautiful it is, and but it's really hard to get there, so not many people have seen it. Anyway, Metroid Other M came out in late August, and this is actually one of the games of all time. We close the book on 2010 shortly thereafter. In 2011, we turn our attention to three significant events before meeting our next runner. We have the death of Osama bin Laden in May of 2011, which serves as a bookend to the cultural landscape of the US throughout the aughts. A month later, we have the portentous launch of a little service you may use on a regular basis, foreshadowing the shift of video gaming to become a more communal and connected online activity. Finally, another significant death just a few months later Later, Steve Jobs passed away at the young age of 56 in October of 2011. As we wrap up this sober tornado of change and new beginnings, let's meet our next runner.
Our next runner broke into the Metroid Prime scene with a record that stood for over a year and practically apologized for it. The runner is Claris, though all records shown and discussed in this video, along with several appearances at GDQ were made under the name Miles or Miles SMB on the Metroid 2002 forums. Remember our tangled chart of Miles and Zoids in this story? Anyway, Claris was a well-known runner in the Metroid Prime 2 community, which was also flourishing on Metroid 2002 by this time. Metroid Prime 2 had slightly different mechanics of moving in secret worlds, which allowed for better practice with either jumping and out-of-bounds movement. Claris benefited from this practice and used those skills to quickly raise the bar and the possibilities of Metroid Prime secret world routing. Once secret worlds were allowable in world record runs of Metroid Prime, it was perhaps inevitable that many who developed and spent time executing secret world movement in Metroid Prime 2 would move back to Metroid Prime. Claris made this comment about the quest for lower and lower world record times in the main Metroid Prime speedrunning thread on the Metroid 2002 forums. We'll talk more in a bit about single segment runs versus segmented runs, but let's discuss Claris's first shot across the bow into the leaderboard of Metroid Prime speedrunning. The next world record would be at least a one hour flat. That was obvious because of the way numbers work. For many years, the hour threshold wasn't even worth considering due to how remote the possibility was. For years after that, it was gawked at, but still considered impossible. As secret world routing was accepted and new possibilities opened up, it seemed like it might be able to be done, but who would walk up to the edge of the barrier? It was Claris. Claris did it. Claris put together a one hour flat time in about 12 days, posting it to YouTube and saying that the run wasn't that great, and making plenty of qualifying remarks on the forums about how it was just a test route for much, much lower times. Claris's one hour flat run was notable for a few reasons. First of all, even round numbers are a big deal in speedrunning, and the community realized after seeing Claris's one hour run that the barrier could be crossed and time could go lower. It could happen any day. Secondly, this run is notable for being the last multi-segmented route that would commonly be referred to as the any% percent record. It's a tricky and strange little distinction that we will discuss at length in the next section. While we're on the topic though, let's briefly discuss the single segment any% percent record. The single segment any% percent record had started at 123, set in 2004 by Smiling Jack, and was lowered by the same runner a few more times. Then, two runs by MP Zoid cemented his dominance in that category. MP Zoid's 106 stood as the world record for 1,562 days, just over four years. It was the second longest standing world record in any category of Metroid Prime speedrunning. The longest held record is also held by MP Zoid, whose 124 100% segmented run stood for 1,759 days, just shy of five years. As an aside, Empizoid's 124 100% was beaten by Claris in 2012. Empizoid would never hold a Metroid Prime record again, which makes Claris something of an Empizoid Slayer. This run used basically the same route as Sparky's 101. However, Claris elected to fight Thardis and get the Spider Ball to avoid having to do the insane out of bounds routing to get through Phazon Mines in one trip. It would be the last time that we see the Spider Ball in the Any% percent record. The only minor difference in routing was a reversal of the order of items for the first leg of the second Fendrana trip. It's such a small difference. Claris went Power Bomb Spirit Elder Thermal, whereas Sparky went Elder Thermal Power Bomb Spirit. Not a big difference there. Claris is the first of our last three runners, and also the first to hold records in every major category of Metroid Prime, and is currently still active on Twitch, though running other games. Claris's extreme skill raised the bar to run Metroid Prime even higher, but this run wasn't totally representative of that skill quite yet. Some glaring mistakes in execution include sloppy movement in Chozo Ruins, a drop to the bottom of Furnace during Ice Beam before Flagra, some general sloppiness in item collections such as these pretty charming and hilarious misses while getting the power bomb, and other movement which was just the safer of two options. For example, Sparky had this very cool bomb space jump up to the plasma beam door, whereas Claris opted in this run for the more conservative path around the outside of the room. Still, Claris incorporated many of the dashes and new room movement which we have mostly been glazing over. As a reminder, adding a complicated dash such as this one into one room of Magmore Caverns might only shave off two to three seconds by itself, but in addition to big skips, newer and lower times in Metroid Prime are also made possible by coming to rooms with new ideas and locking in the benefits of doing certain rooms faster. So even in a sloppy run with mistakes, when you factor in the benefits 
benefits of ice beam before foie gras and other room improvements, you can still achieve a lower time. And we'll talk more about that later. One final, <laughs> one final notable new component of this run was the first appearance of elite research backwards. As a recap of how others have approached this, runners prior to Sparky had to go around and do the long space pirate fight to enter the room from the front. Sparky did the arduous and virtuoso wall crawl through Phazon Mines, and Claris just went through ore processing and climbed these spiderball tracks with spiderball entering the room backwards. In later runs, there will be a new method of getting to this room backwards through ore processing, which still allows spiderball to be skipped. And hold your breath, it's a good one. I mean, don't literally, that's a long time to hold you. Just be excited. It's really cool and hard. We'll talk about it later. Claris, arriving at this room through ore processing, has obviously not solved the puzzle which removed the rock wall. This would be a problem if the developers had any inclination that such a scenario might be possible. However, this rock wall functions as many other walls do when approaching it from a secret world. It's kind of permeable, sort of. Claris morphs and boosts into the wall repeatedly, and because collision, because the engine, I don't, yeah, I mean, it's just how the game works, Claris is able to get through. Many understand this better than I do. I, I just don't. That's Claris's one hour run, sloppy execution and all. This run was always a proof of concept though, and indeed the time could go much lower. What changed in Metroid Prime speedrunning that helped that final jump into the two digit times? Claris's one hour time would stand for a year, but before it would go any lower, the mentality of what was considered the definitive any percent record would shift entirely. Twitch launched in June of 2011, just six months before Claris's one hour time was posted on YouTube. Twitch would grow quickly in popularity, and the popularity of speedrunning would shortly follow behind it. It would ripple and then change entirely the mentality of speedrunning Metroid Prime. The Prime community had always flourished off of being able to see each other's gameplay. Whereas just six years prior they would have to send tapes to Nate to get digitized, they were now able to see each other play live as capture devices and internet connections improved, allowing for live viewing of one another's play. There were several early adopters on the Metroid 2002 forums, Claris among them. I'm not going to say that the Metroid Prime community was the first to do video game streaming, but if you scroll down to the bottom of the Metro 2002 forums, you'll see a section of the forum called speedrunning streaming slash chat, which shouldn't seem too out of place until you realize that it was launched in 2010, a year before Twitch was launched and well before anyone else was really thinking of speedrunning in terms of streaming. There aren't many threads of people that were hosting streams, but each thread represents basically a streaming page with a thread that was dedicated to the stream as the players watched it live. It was basically a prototype of Twitch chat, although this incarnation was hacked together with Taiga Live Chat, a new feature that was rolled out on the Metroid 2002 forum platform, a platform which has not been updated since 2010 at this point, although Metroid 2002 forums continue to work flawlessly. Excellent. We love good coding here. One thing which drove the amazing online infrastructure of the Metroid Prime community is the number of people involved in tech jobs or having some kind of web development experience. As was already mentioned, Nate joined the discussion already in progress on GameFAQs and saw the need to centralize all the information on Metroid Prime and build Metroid 2002 in about two months. Nintendo was self-consciously targeting a slightly more mature audience with Metroid Prime, so it should come as no surprise that more mature gamers in the early 2000s ended up finding it and building online communities around it from scratch with the programming and web development skills they already possessed. With the advent of Twitch and the Games Done Quick charity event which held its inaugural event in January of 2010, speedrunning was quickly becoming an activity which crossed over the boundaries of one game's fandom. As we mentioned, Claris was already a record holder in Metroid Prime 2, but would also go on to hold the first place spot in five other games, including another notoriously difficult speedrun game, Super Monkey Ball 2. I don't think it's a coincidence that the advent of easy to use streaming platforms came at about the same time the Prime community started focusing on developing the single segment route and lowering the times there. There were still plenty of folks that completed single segment runs in Prime's early history, but back in the day they were seen as kind of an odd endurance activity. However, segmented runs continue into the present day as well. New runners often see it as the only feasible way of getting a decent completion time on the record board. Seasoned runners continue to use it like Claris did as a test case of best times and new strategies, or to just get practice on particularly tricky segments. So to summarize a bit, there were plenty of single segment runs before Claris's next string of runs, and there would also continue to be segmented runs after Claris's one hour time. However, we're going to shift our attention from segmented runs to single segment runs. 
because that's basically what the community did at this point. The mentality of each approach was completely different, and the common understanding of what a speedrun was was shifting from the former to the latter. For many years, the only time people cared about was the time on the last screen of the game, because that was the main way that people timed long games. But the entire mentality of speedrunning was shifting, almost to the point of the outside world thinking that the true representative speedruns were done in one sitting, beginning to end. Let's imagine a scene. It may be helpful for understanding the difference between the two methods of speedrunning and why single segment runs are the norm in the broader speedrunning community, whereas multi-segment runs were the norm for many years in the Metroid Prime community. Let's imagine two friends talking. Says friend number one, and let's call, I, I don't know, I hate coming up with names. Says friend number one, let's call him Zachary. I can beat Metroid Prime in under an hour. Says friend number two, and let's call him Edgar. No way, I don't believe you. If you've ever watched a speedrunner grind out attempts of their game of choice, you would understand what happens next for a single segment run. They go back to Edgar's house and Zach plays the game of his life, and after about an hour and 20 minutes of real time, drops the controller, I don't know, panting, and says, ha, yes, I did it. Edgar is incredulous until Zach insists that they watch the entirety of the credits, at which point he shows Edgar that the in-game timer reads 59. They get into an argument about the relative merits of IGT and whether or not Zach actually beat the game in under an hour, but we've already covered IGT. The point is this. This is speedrunning as almost everyone now understands it. You watch GDQ, and this is what you see. You go to a Twitch stream with a speedrunner competing for a record, and this is what you're going to see. For people who know what speedrunning is, this is probably what they're thinking of. Let's imagine a second scenario instead where Zach was actually talking about finishing a segmented run in under an hour. He would have brought over rations consisting of food and water, a rudimentary sleeping arrangement, and other survival equipment. Edgar would have been confused at first, and then confusion would have given way to anger, and anger to despondency as the hours ticked on and on, and Zach repeatedly insisted on resetting every time he made even the smallest error. The stopwatch continues on past the number of digits it can display, but Zach is still playing. He's muttering about drop scan dashes and cursing the bomb jump over the great tree hall gate, and of course, losing his mind over long mazes, because it's just ruining his run and he can't deal with that and he just needs to get a perfect up. This doesn't make for a very enjoyable experience for Edgar, and it wouldn't be the most appealing thing to watch on a Twitch stream necessarily. Could you imagine GDQ if the runners reset every time they failed a trick? There's an enjoyment for the viewer in the suspense of watching a runner get on a record-beating time and wondering if they have the luck, skill, endurance, and focus to take that run over the finish line. Zach's segmented run continues for months. Eventually, he's finally completed it. Zach looks up from the screen, confused as to where his friend went. He calls Edgar, who has just stopped going into that room. And Edgar reassures his friend that he did such a good job and asks him to please go see some daylight. Zach rummages through the various VHS tapes used to record the segments, saying he needs to send them to some guy named Nate and post them on the forums. They walk away from the glowing blue TV showing a 59 under the total time field on the mission final screen. In Edgar's mind, the question of whether Zack actually beat the game in under an hour has mostly given way to concern for his friend since Zack hasn't been outside for months. At the risk of over-exaggerating, for many years the Metroid Prime community was primarily interested in the latter method of completing a run, maybe without all the, uh, without all the dramatics, of course. These people had lives, I'm sure they, you know, did it in their free time. Anyway, the run was crafted over several months or maybe even multiple years. Again, since the in-game timer was the target metric, saving and repeating segments was no issue. It was the community's way of seeing what was possible, using the best strategies and eliminating all errors from a run. And they primarily shared it amongst themselves rather than broadcasting to the world. So again, it wasn't really an issue of what the broader speedrunning community thought, it's what worked for them. However, as speedrunning became more popular and an ethos of the activity developed apart from Metroid Prime or any one specific game, that mentality focused on how quickly the game could be played in a single sitting. You don't have to look any farther than games on quick to see the appeal and spectacle of watching the skill, endurance, and focus intrinsic in completing a game in one sitting. So, between the shift in the broader community of speedrunning, the advent and popularization of Twitch, 
and the fact that saving does add on time a little bit to a Metroid Prime run, most of the focus in developing any percent shifted to single segment running. This brought some new qualities to most records going forward. The first was an ever-increasing emphasis on every single movement advantage that could be harnessed to save time. The second is that, as we've seen, milestone world records typically started by shaving off one minute of time, but they also tended to have a relatively high number of mistakes. How does that add up? As a speedrun in any given game gets increasingly optimized, there are basically three limiting factors on how low a time can go, which are worth mentioning now. Let's think about this in an abstract way. Let's look at our golf course again. The first limiting factor is route. As we've covered pretty extensively, the route taken through Metroid Prime has changed dramatically, even from the very first run. Finding the most efficient route to get all of the items and artifacts necessary is always going to change, but as long as a route can save time, it's on the table. This should make sense when looking at the golf course. Are there any ways to draw a shorter line through all the objectives, hitting a ball from every tee box and landing on every green at once? You bet, there's a ton of those things. Let's, let's fiddle with it a little bit. The second limiting factor is RNG short for random number generator. It's basically shorthand in speedrunning for any element which can't be reasonably controlled for. The major RNG elements affecting time gained and lost in Metroid Prime are the duration of the incinerator drone fight, how cooperative the three Chozo ghosts are for Artifact of Wild, the length of the power bomb maze in Phase on Mines, and the Metroid Prime fight. All of these will give some variability to how low a time a runner could get. Of course, when runs were segmented, you could simply reset that segment until you got the best possible outcome. But in a single segment run, you hope for the best and generally only reset in the worst case scenarios or after failing tricks several times in a row. As the number of RNG elements pile up, or if the RNG elements are particularly severe, getting a run going with good RNG is often referred to as a golden run. There are some games with well-known checkpoints, such as Sploosh Kaboom and Wind Waker 100%, which are basically automatic resets after a certain number of failures. There's nothing a runner can do other than hope that they pass it quickly. Fortunately, Metroid Prime's RNG is not that severe, but it's certainly a factor in getting a good time. The third and final barrier to the lowest possible time is just the skill cap of the game and the willingness of any individual to approach the level of skill necessary to beat a time. If the level of skill needed to reach the lowest time possible is extremely high, it's just more likely that fewer and fewer people are going to try it. And even having reached that point, there is a massive time investment to get a run that strings everything together. The skill of a golfer is almost infinitely improvable and comes down to imperceptibly small differences in how the club is swung, leading to vastly different outcomes. As I've mentioned before, it's said that golf is played on a six inch course between the golfer's ears. And once again, this is a good metaphor for the speed gained by scan dashing and moving Samus throughout the world. There's always room to make it just a little bit faster and a runner is never truly perfect in their movement. But we'll talk about task runs later. All of the discussion, testing, documenting, and practicing that had taken place on the forums was pushing barrier number one lower and lower, and it had been happening since the game's release. Now all it took to lower the time due to barriers two and three were to put a ton of runs in. It's my opinion that streaming allowed this to happen, mentally and socially, and Claris was the first person to take single segment down pretty far. Okay, uh, time out for just one little sidebar. When I was making the last section of the video, there was an issue with what I was doing. I ran across an issue with After Effects and Premiere, where if you're, if you're familiar with both of those software at all, you may know about linked compositions. Basically, the uh, process of taking an After Effects project and putting part of that into Premiere. And I was running into an issue where every time I tried to play any of the After Effects footage in Premiere, Premiere would crash. A lot of the stuff that you've seen as far as like the map animations, the golf course animations, um, even the, the Capitol Trail timeline animations, um, every time I was playing one of those sections, the entire program of Premiere was crashing. Uh, so as you can imagine, this was disruptive to the editing process. In fact, you know, after multiple computer restarts, program restarts, clearing the cache, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, nothing was working, and I had to completely install Premiere and After Effects from scratch. Unfortunately, it started working again. Otherwise, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. Uh, the project may have ground to a halt. It, it, it gave me an opportunity to sort of think about where the project has been and where I want it to go and how quickly I want it to get there. 
Uh, this project has been going on for two years now. I started it in February of 2021, and it is now December of 2022. I had hoped to get this project done by the 20 year anniversary of Metroid Prime. That's why you see the timeline ends on uh, November 18th, 2022. Of course, that came and went. I started this project during COVID lockdown, the second COVID lockdown when I was working from home, and I was really just looking for something to kind of keep my editing skills sharp, um, keep my interest up, just something to sink my teeth into. And I really thought that I could be done with it by like summer of 2021. Um, then I hoped I could be done with it by summer of 2022. I just really want to get this done and I don't want to rush it. I don't want to kind of diminish the things that I've already worked on, but I also want to try something new. So we're going to switch to kind of this face cam format. But I thought that maybe switching it in this way might kind of speed things along a little bit. I've been figuring out how to put the plane together of this project as I've put it along. You may have seen that I've kind of switched formats, picked some things up, put some things down. I've hoped this thing has been cohesive, but I've also just kind of been uh, willing to admit that it's gonna be a hot mess. Um, I hope that you're finding it enjoyable. Uh, we still got a little ways to go in the Metroid Prime Any% percent world history. The Metroid Prime world record. The Metroid Prime Any% percent world record history. There we go. Without further ado, uh, we're going to continue and we still got a little ways to go. So remember that post about single segment being taken down pretty far? Well, Claris did take single segment down and down and down and down. The one hour barrier was the first obstacle and it shifted the time from one hour flat to 59 minutes. Because Claris was now doing single segment runs, there were far more opportunities for a run to be lost with any minor hiccup of execution. It took a year of on and off attempts to crack, but Claris was determined. And the community were wonderful cheerleaders as Claris attempts ran into the tens and then the hundreds and maybe even the thousands of attempts, fighting the frustration of losing runs to drop dashes or miss tricks here and there. Top runners and longtime community members would get on Skype calls with one another during the streaming and chat, lifting one another's spirits and watching Claris's attempts. In fact, there's a beloved memory from the community that when Claris finally cracked the one hour barrier, and this was just a whole group of people looking to pass the time, and a rookie, a longtime community member, was trying to keep the mood light, and was reading from the health and safety manual of the GameCube for about a third of the run. Uh, unfortunately, the recording has been lost to the ages, but apparently it lasted from before Flagra, the cutscene monster, to just after Fendrana won, uh, between bouts of laughter of everyone just thinking how ridiculous it is. Uh, boy, that'd be great footage to have, but um, we don't have it. Uh, I was looking down there as if I might have it, but I don't. Yes. What was sent to me by our next runner? It is the Lost Media, the 59-minute health and safety manual Skype call. Oh my gosh, it exists. And it was sent to me by our next runner, which is hilarious because for those of you who actually know who our next runner is, he doesn't talk to people very much. So like the fact we've talked twice in this whole project and the fact that he sent me the VOD footage from Claris was amazing. I'm really stoked. Thank you for sending it. I'm so glad it can be included in this project. Here's a few of my favorite parts. So when I do get uh, 59, what should I name the YouTube video? Like. Yeah, enemies are a hazard to health and safety. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I wonder if my Prime 2 has a health and safety booklet with it. I'd read it on stream, but that probably sounds funnier than it would actually be. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? You should take a 10 to 15 minute break every hour to reduce the likelihood of a seizure. <laughs> Nintendo GameCube health and safety precautions booklet. Nice. Uh... <laughs> All right, let's take a look. Important safety information. Read the following warnings before you or your child play video games. Warning, seizures. Some people, about 1 in 4,000, may have seizures or blackouts triggered by light flashes or patterns, such as while watching TV or playing video games, even if they have never had a seizure before. I experienced yeah. some convulsions when I was playing Prime 3. Is that normal? Uh, yeah, yes. that's perfectly normal for Prime 3. You should keep reading it. 3. Do not say if you are tired or need sleep. Hear that, Miles? Take a 10 to 15 minute break every hour. Hear that too, Miles? To avoid electric shock when you use the system, do not use the Nintendo GameCube during a lightning storm. There may be a risk of electric shock. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> do these cutscenes carry us a break? Because they're long enough. Uh, Clean the disc from center toward the edges. Do not use the circular motion. 
current work? I was told to use the circular motion when I was. Uh, doing, like, don't, I, I don't use circular motion. Yeah, neither do I. Circular motions is for cleaning like floors and windows on CDs. Yeah, you don't do circular motions for desks. Uh, yeah, if you want to get like a close to it, I guess. Yeah. You know, if this ends up sub one, I'm going to say it was because of the health and safety manual. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, honestly, I would go for at least 57. <laughs> oh my god, there it is. 59. <laughs> 50 frickin' 9. Take a screenshot, buddy. Post that on the forums. That is insane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it actually frickin' happened. Zero, zero, 50. <laughs> <sighs> I have to full screen. That is, that is crazy. Frickin' 59. That is, that, that is beautiful. <sighs> Claris was just getting warmed up though. Over the course of about eight months while streaming on Twitch, the record was brought down several more times, landing at a 56 on June 2nd, 2013. How was this possible, and what did the runs look like? Well, first and most obviously, saving was skipped. So, for the last time, hopefully, I'll remind you that saving only takes up about as much time as walking into and out of the safe station. There are two places that I can think of, them being the safe station here in Chozo Ruins and the ship, which basically overlap the fastest route. But for every other safe station, you add in the time of opening the door, diverting from your path, walking into the safe station, walking out, etc. So based on the estimates of some runners, uh, the common segmentation for the any percent route would add basically 11 to 18 segments, and depending on how fast you can move in and out, you might be looking at a minute or maybe two minutes of added time just from saving. That's IGT, of course. The only major difference in route from the one hour run to Claris's other four runs, marching the time down to 56 minutes, was moving the artifacts of world to the end of the run. Now, since you pass through the reflecting pool and by Hall of Elders, both on the way into and out of Phazon Mines, it's not a huge shift, but it was time to be more optimal to do it on the way back, so the routing stuck. And Claris just kept playing. That's how the time got lower. Remember factors number two and three, the uh, RNG and the willingness of the runner to keep going? The repetition of practice and repeated runs dialed in certain tricks. There were fewer flubs, tricks got set up and executed more fluidly, and Claris just got better and better. There were hundreds and hundreds of attempts made over the course of the year, and Claris' stream became a popular destination for Twitch viewers as the vast number of attempts increased ever higher. Routing-wise, one huge new trick worked on by Claris and T3, which I've alluded to several times, was a method of climbing Research Access and Elevator Access A in Phazon Mines. The extended wall crawl that Sparky undertook and the fight with Thardis for the spider ball were both undertaken to assist in moving through these rooms in Phazon Mines. Coming up from the bottom of Phazon Mines after defeating the Omega Pirate, it was far preferred to take this route here and skip a long fight with the Wave Pirates and the extra time of going all the way around through the main lobby, as we've discussed, ad nausea. But lacking a spider ball to traverse these two little transit rooms, which remember are one way without the spider ball, or so the developers would want you to believe, an alternative solution had to be found. And find it, Claris and T3 did. Despite the fact that a solution to this problem had evaded runners for almost 10 years and is quite difficult, Claris nails all attempts in the recorded runs we have here. The trick requires an abuse of the instant unmorph mechanic. When the camera is blocked from seeing the morph ball, the player can instantly gain control of Samus upon unmorphing. It's often used to come out of morph ball tunnels and save a tiny fraction of time, which would normally be showing the animation of unmorphing Samus. However, if done here at the top of a bomb jump, there's a very narrow frame window in which the player can jump from midair and thus move up the shaft. With this trick in hand, Claris streamed attempts repeatedly until finally stringing together a run at the target time of 56 minutes. Claris posted the run to Metroid 2002, and the core of the community was congratulatory and excited to see such a long sought after goal finally reached. Since SDA was a more rigorous submission process with more editorial oversight than the community-based oversight now used on speedruns.com, submitting and getting accepted to SDA back then was a much bigger deal. The run was submitted and accepted at SDA, and the Prime community 
basically moved on from ever submitting to SDA again, as this was the last run submitted and verified by SDA and is fact still the world record listed on SDA for Metroid Prime any percent many years later. Claris would go on to notch records in a few other categories and in the other Metroid Prime games. Having achieved the goal time of 56 minutes, Claris didn't contest the any percent world record again, but there was still time to be squeezed out of the current any percent route, and the runner to capitalize on all the time left on the table was T3. Let's recap this era of time and Metroid Prime speedrunning. Here I'm going to mention just a few significant points of cultural change in the early 2010s, but also just give you a sense of how crazy dominant Claris was over these years. We start at Claris's one hour time, set a day before the ninth anniversary of the birth of Metroid Prime, and two months before the 2012th anniversary of the birth of Jesus Christ. Later that year, we have the second election of Barack Obama to the presidency, a fact that upset literally no one in these very united states. Claris set another world record four days later. Oh, we week after that, Wii U, Wii U, Wii U, call an ambulance because Claris sets another world record the next day. I can't believe I wrote that. Just about a month after that, the calendar sets a new record. It's 2013. Not to be outdone by time, Claris again kicks it in the teeth with back-to-back -back world records set in March and June. That fall, another epic defining video game is released on September 7th of 2013. Grand Theft Auto V. Actually, it's a crazy story. I bought an Xbox 360 just so I could play this game, and I used a computer monitor that I had set up on my uh, drawer, like my, my dresser drawer that I pulled out, uh, sat in my college dorm, and just played that, you know, sitting on my bed. I, that's way beside the point of this video. It's, it's just a, 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 you know, fun little memory. Anyway, it's 2014, and it's time to talk about T3. T3 joined Metroid 2002 in 2009 in the waning era of the OG Metroid Prime runners. And by the time he set his sights on the any percent record, he had already made some splashes in speedrunning the game. In 2012, a couple of months after Claris posted a segmented one hour time, T3 dislodged Zoidy's incredibly long standing records for the fastest single segment run and posted a 105 inbounds single segment run. He would lower his own world record a few times over several months before Claris came in and swept away the segmented and single segment categories with the newly allowed out of bounds runs. Once Claris finally got down to the goal time of 56 minutes, it was clear that this was a huge improvement over the previous runs. But it seems that movement in Metroid Prime is infinitely improvable, which is part of why this history is so fascinating. And there were still a few obvious mistakes in Claris's runs, including a few sections that were slower than previous attempts, even though the final net time was lower. For example, in this segment from the faster run, the 56 on the right, Claris actually loses about 10 seconds relative to the slower runs on the left. In other words, there was definitely still time on the table, even using the same route. T3 decided that he was gonna be the one to sweep it up. After the record stood for about a year, Claris's 56 was lowered to a 55 by one T3. The best way I can describe T3's play style is zesty. There's a sort of self-assurance, maybe verging on cockiness, that is displayed in spelling out the time with the power beam on the door to Ridley. Of course, there were likely hundreds of failed attempts that didn't quite get the time that T3 spelled out, but it just goes to show you that his mentality was that he was gonna put the target time on the wall on probably every single run. One of the major routing changes was deciding to forego Ice Spreader. The Ice Spreader had been collected up to this point because it allowed the player to save a little bit of time during the latter stages of Metroid Prime's Exo fight. However, T3 optimized other phases of Metroid Prime with careful charge beam shots and actually saves a bit of time overall with the Exo phase even without the Ice Spreader. There were some new strats which saved a few seconds here and there on different rooms which basically just boiled down to new thinking among runners on what to lock onto while scanning and how to traverse certain rooms. However, there was also just an overall emphasis on bunny hopping and moving Samus sideways to abuse the fact that the sideways speed was uncapped. It was faster coming out of dashes and it was even faster moving without a dash. Whether it was a second or two in a specific room or even just a handful of frames across a huge number of rooms, the time adds up quickly and was one of the factors that allowed T3 to 
mop up that extra bit of time. Despite, despite, despite employing some new strats and cleaning up segments where Claris had made mistakes, it wasn't like T3's play was perfect. In the 54, he misses the rodeo jump, getting to the plasma beam door, and has to claw back a bit of a recovery. He had an awful fight with the Shigoth in his 55, which cost him about 20 seconds. He got his revenge in 54, getting a nice clean and quick kill, and then would have his ultimate revenge in his 53, but that's, that's for a bit later. Tuck it away up there. T3 actually sent me some videos of his CRT while he got the records, and they're pretty cool, so I'm going to include them. That's really all there is to say about these two little intermezzo runs from T3. Without covering the minutia of every little scan dash, it's impossible to really fully exhaust how T3 made these two runs faster, but in fact, he did. Evolving technology, new software, and new methods of looking at the game were allowing runners to approach the game from an even more analytical standpoint and plumb the intricacies and depth of the game to try to extract every little bit of movement advantage they could. Next, we're going to look at some of the changes that brought Metroid Prime's time even lower. We have just a few items to catch up on on our timeline. In the midsummer of 2014, we get T3's 55 minute time. We pass the rest of 2014 with no new runs or major events until whammo, time drops a new year. This time it's called 2015. Wow. T3 capitalizes on this new advancement by dropping a new Metroid Prime world record on March 1st of this hot new year. On the exact same day, we get something even more shocking, which we'll talk about now. TAS, T-A-S, Tool Assisted Speedrun. In the Metroid Prime community, discussion around creating a TAS for Metroid Prime began in a thread started by Tom Lube in 2011. Instrumental in the development of TASing in Metroid Prime was Fusion Varia, who used the username Hazel on the Metroid 2002 forums. Fusion Varia is a preeminent TASer within the Metroid Prime community, as well as several other games, and almost single-handedly developed many new strategies we'll see going forward, including some insane new tricks in both TAS runs as well as real-time runs. TASing is simply a recorded set of inputs that are played back on an emulated copy of the game. By creating save states and advancing the game on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, and carefully tweaking the inputs until the desired outcome is achieved, a runner, or more specifically a tasser, is able to create a showcase of the craziest possible tricks known of at the time. A tass of an entire game, which bypasses all mistakes and typically performs the fastest possible strategies known of at the time, is typically seen as the lowest possible time of a game given the current knowledge even though it frequently employs strategies which would be impossible by typical human execution. Metroid Prime runs at 60 frames per second. It's possible to assign an input to every single frame, which means that a tasser can execute 60 inputs a second with perfect accuracy, which allows for tricks which could never be done by a human in real time. Besides working on an exhibition task of the entire game, Fusion Varia also spent a fair bit of time on creating the fastest possible frigate escape, working on new and faster routes through certain rooms, and hunting for glitches which may or may not be useful, but would require inputs beyond the scope of real-time human execution. It's human execution for people not named T3. In a funny aside, there was a glitch exhibition that Fusion Varia had figured out after dashing through biotech research in the frigate during the frigate escape so fast that Samus moved through a hole in the level that didn't have time to load the next room in its place. And Samus careened out of this hole and ended up in a secret world. And it was assumed to be impossible for, for humans and for runners, but it was a fun trick nonetheless. There was a discussion pertaining to load times and T3 eventually replicated the trick on console, beating the load time and getting Samus out of bounds in the frigate. Now, this idea of a human being able to repeat a trick that was previously thought to be TAS only will come back several times in the future, so keep it in mind. Oftentimes, tool-assisted speedruns were used as kind of like a test tube in which the faster strategies were speculated, tested, and then implemented into a run just to see if it could be done within the game. Even if certain tricks that were demonstrated in TAS required incredibly precise inputs or unintuitive setups, they at least offered a demonstration of what was possible within the game itself rather than runners having to figure out whether or not a trick may or may not be doable. Andrew Mills, the secret world hunter who we met way back in the discussion about secret worlds, had basically won the argument by 
this point. The tools runners were using to work out the fastest possible times and strategies were now far beyond the complexity of just a mere action replay. However, these tools were ultimately going to assist the human execution of faster times in Metroid Prime. Fusion Varia would eventually put out a task in 2016, which got the time down to a stunning 37 minutes. Throughout this discussion, we've been watching some of the most insane tricks and sections of gameplay from that run. Okay, I'm, I'm splicing this in later. I told myself I wasn't going to spend a lot of time like looking at this run in detail, but this new out of bounds section, wall crawling up to Flagra to start the fight without the cutscene, catching Flagra while it's sleeping, that's, it's too good not to just talk about specifically. It's sick. Anyway, back to back to the other stuff. You may be familiar with Metroid Prime footage enough at this point to know that these strategies are absolutely insane. As alluded to previously, we've already seen a bit of this interview from Fusion Varia, but I wanted to put in a bit more later in this video because I think there is some awesome insight into the mentality that a runner has when they're creating a new task of the game. I mean, I first played the game because my brother picked it up used at EB Games and I wasn't too interested in it, but then I don't know, I guess a month or a couple months passed and he didn't like it, so I thought I'd give it a try. And the first thing that just kind of struck me was, I guess, the design of like enemies and stuff was really cool. And then it was in 2010 maybe that I learned about low percent. And that was what really kicked it off. Like, I just thought it was so cool to beat the game with as few items as possible, all the ridiculous routing and strategy and like these precise tricks and creativity, it just captured me more than any other way to play a video game. Tell me like what, what some of the initial steps from just playing the game casually to um, all the ways that you have broken and destroyed this game. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of, I don't know, there's a big history there and I don't yeah. think about it too much, but uh, yeah, I mean, it started with learning how to dash. Well, I was learning how to L jump, really. I didn't, I didn't have the zero hyphen zero zero copy of the game, so I was learning like bomb jumps and L jumps and trying to figure out R jumps, but they were really took a long time, a couple of years before I really had a grasp of how those worked. Um, but yeah, just various sequence breaks. Like I thought it was so fun to explore the game uh, and just do things out of order, see what was possible. Doing like, just like R jumping to the power bomb in uh, Fendrano's Edge or something like that, where I didn't know how to R jump yet and that kind of taught me how to do it. I kind of had this feeling when I started tasking in the first place with Sonic Adventure 2 where I would watch other people's tasks and I'm like a, a you know a native speedrunner of the game, and the people making the tasks weren't, and I would think like, well, I can do better than that. So <laughs> I made this task with my friend Nathan in, I guess it must have been like middle school or early high school, of the frigate, and it was really fun, but it's like an insane amount of work, and we didn't have very good tools back then. So there wasn't like, I mean, honestly, I would tell like, oh, this jump was good because I screenshotted it and posted it in MS Paint, and then I screenshotted another one and posted it and I landed further. I don't know where the confidence came from to do the full game tasks, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's overwhelming how much work goes into that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, tell me about like, when you approach a full game task, how do you break that down into steps? Well, the first thing is the route. So you have to think about what it is that you want to do, and that you could spend you know months thinking about um, and eventually you kind of just have to go with something even though you never can solidify like this is the best route or something although it, the one I found ended up being pretty good like it's still the route people use in speedruns today more or less and it was new at the time um, but yeah it was just like well it'd be cool to get the power bomb early so I tried really hard to figure out a way to do that and eventually solve the magma pool one and I had a post on M2K2 saying that if anyone ever solves this, I'll make a task of the game, and then I solved it. So it's like, okay. Oh great, I guess I have to do that now. Yeah. Twisted um, your own arm. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at first it started off with like, I'm just gonna task frigate, and like, you know, I improved a lot, and kind of got addicted to seeing the real-time playback of the task. It's like, oh, this game's really fast now, which has happened again since, because when I look at current tasks, I'm like, wow, the game was really slow in 2016, but. <laughs> what is, uh, what's the hardest thing to do from like a, a human execution standpoint, and what's the hardest thing to figure out from a task standpoint? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think I've ever thought about that before. From a human perspective, I think anything that involves flicking, like there's a mechanic in the game where if you're on the ground and there's a ledge in front of you, that's a certain 
height or less. If you hold certain angles on the analog stick, you can get the morph ball to like spin up the ledge. It can only be done with a certain range of angles, but those angles have to correspond with a specific direction, which means that the camera has to be facing a certain way for that angle to give that direction. But the hardest thing to task, I think anything that involves manipulating an enemy hmm. is really annoying hmm. because there's, there's so much variance. Like it's really hard to prove a negative. So if you have an idea, hmm. like maybe I can use this enemy to do this thing. And then you're like, well, it's not working. And it's like, could work. It could work if you put another 30 hours into it. Like, maybe if you try this position and, you know, you have to get the enemy to go to that position. You can't just, like, hack it there. Maybe you could for testing, but I'm, I, I usually don't because <laughs> I'm a masochist or something. I don't know. But <laughs> anything, I guess, where there's a lot of variables, a lot of moving parts, and you want the best outcome. I think people, myself at least, have this uh, kind of naive assumption about TAS is that they're like this perfect, like this is the, the lowest possible time. Yeah. And it's like in a simple game, like simple, like Super, Metro, or Super Mario, um, like yes, yeah, okay, it might be possible to find the lowest, like to the millisecond time. Yeah. But like with Metroid Prime, there's so many variables and stuff to balance it. It still does take a lot of creativity and like yeah. brute force sometimes to sort of figure these things <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, sometimes it gets pretty Brute forcey, yeah, <laughs> grindy, well, but I, yeah, I loved what you said about like um, it's hard to prove a negative. Yeah, but... you think like, what if this would work, and yeah. how do you know that it doesn't? Yeah, I mean, how often when you when you approach a new room, do you have that sense of like I th I'm fairly certain this will work, or do you have to kind of like test a bunch of different stuff? I usually test a lot, and then um, I test to take breaks. So that's one of the best ways I find to solve problems is to drill it all into my head and then like go to bed and wake up the next day and be like, what do you, okay, what do you think now? And it's like, that one seemed like it had some promise. And sometimes it is just like a feeling of like, I know that this won't work and maybe I'll drop it. And maybe it does work, but I like trust that the times that I felt that before and I ignored it, it, it never panned out. So <laughs> I have some intuition of just being like, okay, I think it's time to drop this and you know move on because the second best option here that does work is pretty solid. How do you play a video game just casually, or do you? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I actually didn't for a very long time. Like, I, I had no interest, and I didn't even really have the ability, I think, at some point. I, I really changed my brain to, you know, I would play Twilight Princess with a friend or something, and I see a ledge, and my brain's like, can you get on it? Uh, that's like, I would spend, you know, 15 minutes doing that. It's like, well, there's a story, and, <laughs> you know, we're trying to play the game together, and I'm just like, I, I want to see if I could get on the ledge. Um, yeah, I mean, that was always the fun thing to me in games, and when I was a kid, I didn't really play games that much. I played, my first console was a GameCube, so like, I'm not old school. Um, I played like Mario Kart Double Dash or something, and um, Metroid Prime was one of the earlier games that I played. And yeah, I never really got into story games until, honestly, like a year ago. Mm. I played Ocarina of Time and Earthbound this year, and I thought they were both like fantastic games. I, I never really like, I played Ocarina of Time as a kid a bit, but I never just like read the dialogue, like admired the art design and you know, every room is really pretty. The environments in Metroid Prime always blew me away. Like, yeah. The way that it looks when you first land on the ship on Talon, and, or like, I love Magmore. I think there's something about the way that they design the lava that's really spectacular. I can't put it into words, but when I see lava in other games, it's like, that looks kind of flat. <laughs> but there's something like really glowy and interesting about this, this strange like pixely wavy thing. Like there's a lot of black pixels in it. It's like, you wouldn't think black would go on lava, but I don't know, it looks really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's a cool game. <laughs> <laughs> there's something it's, about Metroid Prime. <laughs> yeah, no, there really is. Like, it's the game I always come back to, I think. Like yeah. other games are interesting and fun, but um, yeah, there's something like just moving from point A to point B in Metroid Prime is like 10 times more interesting than any other game. Hmm. Um, you might find like really cool glitches or sequence breaks or like some crazy exploit like in SpongeBob to generate infinite currency or something like that or to like, you know, get 10,000 units of speed and <laughs> cross the map in six frames or something. but. Like Metroid Prime, hopefully will never have something like that. I kind of, I kind of hope that it stays in its own little like constrained enough state. I've, I've always been worried that the game would get 
too broken, mm. and then it would lose some of the charm of creativity. Like yeah, tell me a little bit about the, kind of the relationship between your work and then things that were discovered in Any Percent, or the the implementation of like human play. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I'm always blown away by how much non-task players can do. Because in my brain, sometimes I see something and I think like that's really cool, but that's just not going to work. Like um, early newborn, for a good example, like that out of bounds. There's a setup for it, but like, it's really precise. If you're off by a tiny bit, it just doesn't work. And I was like, if you're on a moving platform, you can kind of, like you stop it with ice beam, but it's not gonna stop in the same spot every time. And like, the fact that people can figure that one out and do it consistently, that was like, oh, okay, I didn't expect that to happen. I think there's always been this relationship, this is the way I see it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but like when tasters figure something out and humans are like, okay, well, we, we need to figure out how to make this consistent yeah. for real-time play. Yeah, and that is kind of a puzzle in and of itself. Like sometimes you find a way to do something and then you think like, okay, that's like a bit, that is a bit too many variables. So like, how do we remove some of these variables and still achieve the same result? And you know, maybe it's like, you find a spot on the wall that you can stand on to start the process. And then non-task players have a better chance at doing it as opposed to like standing in the middle of a room. Um, you just try and limit variables and make things a little more accessible and then, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Go from there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, Fusion Variety, for meeting up for that interview and thanks for all you've done to push this game forward. It was awesome to meet you. Now, where were we? But there was another post in early 2015 that we turn our attention to now. It involved some new out of bounds movement trending towards a certain beam upgrade and a certain artifact. To understand what happened next, we again have to go back a bit further. As with many strategies, big and small, that we have already discussed, this was a piece of known tech for many, many years before it became useful in the any percent category. It was an amazing glitch which people found tons of uses for right away, but for many years it was never truly fast. And that's because, simply, you have to stand still for about a minute. But are you standing still? Or are you moving infinitely fast? All the way back in December of 2005, Master Zed discovered a trick which was at first called Flickerball, but the name eventually settled down into quant infinite speed. The name proved to be prescient. Although it would take years of studying the game to sufficiently understand how exactly the trick worked, Master Zed guessed that Samus was getting stuck in collision and rotating at greater and greater speed until so-called infinite speed was reached. As was discovered later, by first going out of bounds and tricking the game into thinking that Samus was in another room, the player can actually get the morph ball stuck into the collision of a wall. When rotating at a certain angle, although Samus's positional velocity, the place where she is in the level, remains the same, her rotational velocity continues to grow exponentially. After about 50 seconds of apparently standing still in a corner, the memory address for Samus's rotational velocity reaches the limit of a signed 32-bit floating point integer, which is in the neighborhood of about 18 quadrillion. It stays at that number for a single frame, goes negative for another frame, and then finally underflows into a state called not a number, N-A-N, non. Non of non. At this point, Samus's collision in Morph Ball goes completely haywire, and when boosting, she essentially touches every item and surface in a loaded room at once. This trick comes with some weird limitations, though. The player has to remain in Morph Ball until the game manually sets your location, typically due to a cutscene or other transition, because the game forces your position and speed back to its correct values at this point. Otherwise, you get this nightmare screen effect called Light Show by the community. This is due to the horrible mangling of information fed to Camera Bobber, the code which makes Samus's view gently sway back and forth when you stay idle for too long. So the math the camera uses to place itself in the world is horribly wrong as well, and the visual output of the game is digitally distorted barf, making it nearly impossible to move. The sequence breaking possibilities seemed infinite as the title of the glitch suggested. However, for the any percent category, the combination of having to spend a minute of IGT spinning up the morph ball to the right speed and the routing difficulty of needing to put the player near a cutscene trigger or save station seemed to limit the options of where and how to integrate this into the run. For many years, it was unclear how it might be helpful to the any percent category. However, it was only unclear to runners not named T.
On July 23rd, 2015, T3 posted a stunning new run with Metroid Prime's freshest new trick, Wave Sun. Fusion Variety figured out how to make this viable for the Any% percent run. Although the technique had been known about for a while, people weren't really sure if it could actually shave off time during the Any% percent route. Although acquiring the Artifact of Sun on the first pass through this area seems like an obvious way to shave off time at the end of the run, and you'll remember here the long backtrack through Fendrana and the very tough Thardis dash, it wasn't actually faster to get it early, or so people thought. If you just did the infinite speed trick in this room to pick up the Artifact of Sun by itself, you would still be in an IS state and you would still have to go through the Shigoth fight in order to get the wave beam. The proper way of separating out wave and sun is to actually fight Shigoth like normal, then acquire IS, then collect sun with a boost, then you make your merry way back to the elevator as an infinitely rapid rotating ball of bird magic. However, you're not saving much time as you still have to fight Shigoth and you have this slow exit out of Fendrana to continue on the run. So why not get both at once? Fusion Varia found and T3 executed a very clever workaround. By navigating up to the Chozo Ice Temple out of bounds and going just a bit further, the next room, the block maze, is loaded. This means basically that the game loads the next room and gets all of the collision ready for Samus to enter the room without loading the memory heavy textures in order to get the room ready for the player to enter. However, T3 doesn't move far enough into the block maze to dump the ice temple room all the way. This means in effect that three rooms and all of their objects are loaded all at once. T3 navigates back inbounds by boosting through the wall into the bomb slot and opens the gate so that T3 can leave later and begins generating speed. Slowly but surely, he approaches infinite speed. After a minute of creating immense rotational velocity, not a number is achieved and T3 boosts, collecting the artifact of sun on one frame and the wave beam on the frame immediately following, as Samus's infinite speed muddled collision brings her into contact with almost every surface and item in all three rooms in one instant. That's pretty much, that's pretty much how it works more or less. With Wave Beam and Artifact of Sun collected in one frame, T3 leaves Fendrana and collects Strength on the way, since that's what would normally be collected after collecting Sun in Fendrana. After that, the run progresses with a fairly similar route to what we've already seen, continuing through Magmore and into Fendrana to get the remaining artifacts and picking up Power Bomb in Fendrana Depth. This run was stunning to everyone in the community at the time, both for the deployment of an entirely new category of exploit, but also for the high level of execution. After all, there was some pretty tight movement to go along with this stunning new strategy. However, this run was not without its errors, of course, and we'll talk about those briefly. Small hiccups like what we see here are what leave time on the table for subsequent runners to clean up. T3 missed the bomb jump over the gate to get into phase on mines without having to go through the crash frigate. He misses a few attempts to get the climb up to the shaft in phase on mines. He also misses this dash at the start of phase on mines, but has a nice little backup dash to pick up and continue on his way. Of course, for all the flubs, there are plenty of spicy little flourishes that T3 always interjects to make this run fun to watch. I particularly like this demonstration of the Morph Ball light trail when moving in multiple directions on the frigate. There's also some bomb jumps on the elevator, which are fun to watch. And of course, despite the mistakes, T3 writes his estimated target on the wall before Metroid Prime in classic T3 fashion. So T3 got a pretty unassailable world record and posted it on Metroid 2002. The form denizens were universally impressed, and there was even an old sage who cracked open the way for development and implementation of Secret Worlds who made his final post on the Metroid 2002 forums to tell T3 congratulations and comment on the palpable nostalgia. If nostalgia is a warm blanket that we reach for when things start to get weird and overwhelming, I'm sure many of us who have memories of the next few years might have reached for such a salve. T3's 53 in July of 2015 marks our point of departure, then on we go to 2016, or as I like to call it, things get weird. First, in June of 2016, we have Brexit, which a majority of British people wanted, but also somehow a majority of British people did not want. But I'm from America, so what do I know? To me, it practically sounds like a Pokemon, which brings us to our next little diversion, the release of Pokemon Go. I remember seeing herds of people shambling around my city looking at their phones. It was weird. What was also at least weird was the election of a reality TV show host and famous grifter Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States. Now, I'm from America, so unfortunately, 
I do know about this. Let's keep it moving. 2017 happens. A few months later, Nintendo releases this wildly popular new video game console. And then a little while later, it's a year called 2018. Let's talk about Metroid Prime again. There was another post in T3's release thread, which was instructive on speedrunning Metroid Prime, which we'll take a look at here. One user mentions that there's no obvious time saves other than the visible mistakes, but T3 corrects the poster with a rather long and thorough explanation that there was still plenty of time to be saved in almost every room. Besides the obvious mistakes, and yes, there were some obvious mistakes, there was more and more being learned about the game, which might shave off a second or two at a time. Let's think of it another way. Let's imagine a run of a hypothetical game in which there are 30 rooms with each room taking about five seconds. The fastest possible time in this hypothetical case is 150 seconds, two and a half minutes. Disregarding boss fights and items and anything messy like that, we're talking like a spherical cow in a perfect vacuum kind of run. Now, say there's a technique found which makes it so that you could get through half the rooms in four seconds. If you executed it perfectly in all 15 of the rooms where it's applicable, you've just brought the best time down to a 2.15, a 10% reduction. Even if you failed it about half the time and had to do the longer strat in six of the 15 rooms where you could have saved time, you're still improving the time by nine seconds, a 6% improvement. Now, let's just take a look at these squiggly rooms, for instance. The movement difference may be slight, verging on unnoticeable to the untrained eye, yet T3 pockets a second and a half over Calfolio's movement through this same room. Now, multiply that out over the 20 or 30 different rooms like this one, and you'll quickly see how the time benefits can add up. This explains why when there's a new major strategy or a new route that comes out, the new records tend to end on the top end of the minute milestone, and then there's maybe one or two more minutes that can come down after that. It's not that runners were just barely able to squeak out a new best time with perfect playthrough. When a massive new trick is discovered, it may save two or three minutes on its own, and its benefits are added into the current level of play on the current route, but that doesn't mean that a runner is going to be perfect on their first world record attempt. They might capitalize on one of those two or three minutes, and then with further refined attempts and mistakes being cleaned up, they might shave back those extra two or three minutes. Until then, enough mistakes can be tolerated, which allow for a time in the target range and a new world record even with some mistakes. But these tricks for saving really minute amounts of time across many rooms were about to get more numerous, and the level of execution was about to get even higher, thanks again to the dedication and passion for the game present within the Metroid 2002 community. Aruki released an early version of the Prime World Editor in 2016, and its development continues to this day. Amazingly, this is a tool built entirely from scratch, just from the passion of the community. It uses a decompiled ISO file that the game typically runs off of and again is reverse engineered just from this, which is astounding. Prime World Editor allows players for the first time to load the game's assets, maps, sprites, and logic in a 3D interface and check every aspect of the world that Samus was passing through as the developers would have seen it when they were designing the game itself. Another remarkable achievement was URDE, or I was actually told that this tool uh, is, is now called Metaforce. Um, it may have been called Erd when I started making this video, but as, as we all know at this point, it's taken a while. So um, I'm just gonna record a few clips of me saying Erd, or excuse me, Metaforce, and I'm just gonna awkwardly stitch those in on top of any time I would have said Erd in the script uh, in the voiceover, which I already recorded. So here we go, uh, Metaforce, Metaforce, Metaphors, 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 metaphors. All right, that should give me enough to work with. Thank you. Metaphors, I'll just say metaphors, metaphors. It's out of my depth to talk about in any significant level of technical detail, but it's fascinating. For many years, runners would practice or create tasses on the GameCube emulator Dolphin, which was helpful in that it allowed save state so that a runner could reset and try a trick over and over again, or again, create frame by frame tasses. 
However, Dolphin is an emulator, which means that it creates a virtual GameCube on your computer, processes the ISO file, which is the thing that's actually on the disk itself, and then outputs to a virtual TV on your computer screen. This restricts the game to what a GameCube can handle processing-wise, and sometimes causes minute amounts of lag or stutters or other strange little hiccups, as a computer does redundant or unoptimized calculations restricted to the processing power of a virtual GameCube. However, Metaforce was an environment built alongside Prime World Editor, which allowed Metroid Prime to be run natively on virtually any computer system, Mac, PC, or Linux. By unpackaging an ISO and creating a program which can run and interpret the game on modern computers and skip the emulation process, a much smoother performance is possible. There was Metaforce, Prime World Editor, and in 2017, there was a practice mod created by user Prudage, which gave the player huge versatility and control over lo loading certain rooms, power-ups, player states, inventories, and positions within the game itself. While it seems like it may be simpler than these other tools created from scratch, the practice mod was actually the most complicated of them all. It uses a built-in JavaScript or C++ engine, depending on the version, and runs a hypervisor, a complete restructuring of the game's code that runs on top of the game itself, and if you wanted to, could actually be written onto a mini DV disc and played on a real GameCube. At this point, runners had a huge number of fascinating new tools to pick the game apart even more. This allowed for more analytical insight into exactly how the game was put together. And the practice mod also gave runners a new tool for drilling in the muscle memory and practice for executing extremely tricky strategies. But there were benefits even beyond that. Two huge advantages of seeing how the levels were put together in Prime World Editor were load triggers and standable geometry. Load triggers were known about for about as long as Secret Worlds, however, runners were really only able to see their effects and not the boundaries of the load triggers themselves, since you could see when the next room was loaded when crossing over a certain threshold in a Secret World. However, once Prime World Editor let runners actually see the nuts and bolts of the game levels, new strategies could be developed which allowed runners to minimize load times between rooms with perfect confidence. Analyzing the standable geometry of a level allowed for a more robust view of all the places where a tiny foothold might be gained. It allowed for new investigations into movement possibilities, which was helpful in the any percent route and supremely helpful in the low percent category. Finally, another tool which I think is worth mentioning at this point, although it doesn't directly affect the any percent records, is the randomizer. Claris was the first person to release a randomizer for Metroid Prime, which came out a little bit before these other tools that I've been mentioning. Randomizers are a somewhat common mod among popular speedrun games, and basically what it does is modify the game so that every time you start a new file, all of the expansions and power-ups are randomly scattered throughout the world and change places with one another. It's probably more fair to say that all of the development that had already gone into the any percent and low percent category informed how the randomizer was played. However, I think there's probably some reciprocal benefit that the randomizer eventually benefited the any percent runners. The randomizer was fun to play and it was a new way of engaging with the game. Many top Metroid Prime runners spent time playing and streaming randomizer runs. All of that time spent was another way for new runners to familiarize themselves with Metroid Prime's strange movement, learn all of the rooms like the back of their hands, and finally get used to applying strange tricks in new situations in order to solve unfamiliar problems. It was just another way to build muscle memory and get reps in with the game, which can only benefit the skill of a new runner. It helped with creative problem solving and creative exploration of the game, which would come into play quite shortly in the any percent run as we still have new strategies and new movement tricks to discover. Our final runner joined the Metroid 2002 forums around the same time that all of these tools were coming out. Fueled by new tools for practicing and analyzing the game, as well as a deep love for everything pertaining to Metroid Prime, Justin DM charted at new territory in the any percent category as well as every other category. He just swept through Justin Storm coming in. Let's, let's get into it. Justin DM made a huge splash in the Metroid Prime speedrunning community. Fast. He made a splash fast. He quickly made a splash. Justin surprised everyone quickly, fast, fastly. He did it quickly. 
Two months after joining the forums, he posted an image with a frigate escape time of 429.43. Many users were skeptical, incredulous, doubting. They didn't believe him. Well, actually, pretty much everyone didn't believe him. It was one of the last... <laughs> It was one of the last handful of posts that MP Zoid would make on the forums before it being banned for the last time a few months later. At this point, runners calling for better proof than photos for something as simple as a frigate escape time was pretty much unheard of. But from everyone else's perspective, Justin just dropped out of the sky and was posting quite literally unbelievable times. Justin would go on to hold world records in every category of Metroid Prime, the only runner besides Claris and T3 to hold that honor. He got his first record in segmented 21% in 2015, the year after joining the forums. The year after that, he was able to lower the record time of the segmented any percent run. The year after that, he tied T3's world record time of 53 minutes, and the record remained tied for about a year. Justin lowered the lowest recorded any percent time to a 52 in a segmented route about a year after T3's 53, testing out a new route that we'll talk about shortly. As we already discussed though, the culture surrounding what was considered the world record run by the broader public had completely shifted at this point into the category of single segment runs. If you go to speedruns.com, you won't even see any of the runs by Kip or Bartender Sparky on the history graph. These old runs we discussed earlier were all segmented runs, and although they were a lower IGT than the same lowest single segment runs we see on the graph here, they don't appear on the graph because the categories can't really be mixed in speedrun.com, and again, the time that they're recording here is single segment. The community considers the runs by Kip and Co that we've already talked about as the earliest lineage of the Any% percent record, but as we've already discussed, the reckoning of the Any% percent record has shifted over time from segmented to single segment. Both lines of runs are considered legitimate records, of course. I've just chosen to talk about them in a strange way. Again, it's, uh, it's my video, so that's how I'm gonna talk about it. Justin is a methodical, creative, and extremely talented player. He is also fast. It says it right there in his Metroid 2002 bio. Interest, fast. With the proof of concept time of 52 minutes in the segmented run, it would only be a matter of time and practice until he strung together a new single segment world record and the matter of time concluded on April 25th, 2018 with a new world record of 52 minutes. There's a decent chance that given enough time and practice, Justin or T3 could have knocked one minute off of that 53 minute world record with better execution and the elimination of mistakes. However, Justin went back to the drawing board entirely and pulled some new tricks out of his hat. One of the first really stunning things about this run is an entirely new out of bounds section on the Space Pirate Frigate of all places. Remember the warm up slash tutorial level that we really haven't talked about in connection with the any percent record so far? Justin incorporated a new mind blowing wall crawl which shaved about a minute and ratcheted up the skill level across the entire run drastically. This out of bounds movement is far more difficult than the other two out of bounds sections that were used at, at the time, Wave Sun and IBBF. Though, because this is towards the beginning of the run, it's less painful to reset if an error was made. Could you imagine how frustrating it would be to have a difficult wall crawl section at the very end of the game? Justin found this secret world entrance while he was just, just kind of passing the time exploring every nook and cranny of the game and he was actually trying to get infinite speed during the escape sequence because he wanted to, I guess. Just trying to find new things in the game. Like again, it's just kind of pure research. There wasn't a particular thing that he was trying to get IS for as far as I know. He just was seeing if it was possible. He was pressing against various walls, morphing and turning to see if he could find the correct conditions to get IS and acquire it in some random corner during the escape sequence. And it actually turns out that if you position yourself just right in this particular corner, the game tries to unstick Samus and moves her up, pushing her out of bounds. More than a decade after the game's release and after hundreds of thousands of hours of people rummaging through every corner of the game, people, and in this case Justin, were still finding new exploits and new tricks within the game itself. Now, two things are worth mentioning here. 
first, because the developers self-consciously wanted to make levels in which you had to kind of loop back over sections that you'd already done uh, and interact with levels in multiple ways, they put this into practice early in the Frigate Escape. Remember that levels don't cheat, that there's no sleight of hand with loading or unloading different versions of rooms and different areas of the game? This means that when you double back through Bio Research A, it's the same one that you passed through earlier, just with a new layer of, of ruin and destruction loaded. And this blocks the previous route that you took through this level and opens a new one. This route out of bounds had already been discovered by Fusion Varia, but the method of getting out of bounds was not possible in normal real-time play. However, again, Justin just figured a new way out of bounds. His curiosity put him out of bounds, and with access to the secret world, it was possible to leave the frigate due to how the levels of the game were constructed. Justin winds his way back into the earlier portions of the frigate and bypasses this long series of tubes, the encounter with Meta Ridley, the long elevator ride up, in the item loss. I'm sorry, did you say that he skipped the item skipped the item loss? Yes, I did. Did Justin just somehow do what I've always wanted to do since I was eight years old playing the game? Land on Talon suit, land on Talon 4 with the Varia suit, missile launcher, morph ball, grapple beam, and morph ball bombs still active? Is this the most earth shattering, mind warping, unbelievable Metroid discovery? ever made? No, sorry. Uh, hold on there, pardon. <laughs> yes, Justin does in fact bypass the item loss and leaves the frigate with Varia suit. Because cutscenes in this game are actually rendered with the items that Samus has and not just simply pre-recorded, you actually do see Samus running out of the frigate and boarding her ship with the Varia suit and her other power up still intact. Surely this means that Justin is then able to land on the surface with these items and skip a huge amount of gameplay that would normally be required to get these items right. Unfortunately, and amazingly, the game makes absolutely sure that you lose your items by taking them away fully and completely again when you load for the first time on Talon 4. Again, I don't know why the devs would have had the foresight to do this, but they did. Because again, in that last section of the frigate, you are playing without those power-ups. You do not have those power-ups. But when you land on Talon 4, they just take them away again. It's like they set the values to zero during the escape sequence, and then they're like zero again on Talon. I don't know why they did it. It's just good game design and hats off to Retro Studios. Now, this redundant checkpoint makes absolutely positively sure that there are no possible workarounds. And actually this same check doesn't exist in the same way in Echoes, and the item loss skip would eventually be discovered for that game. However, a similar glitch from Echoes has not been found in 20 years of looking in Metroid Prime and doesn't seem likely that it ever will, so... Dang, good job, Retro. On the surface of Talon 4, Justin hits the first of a few, just a few hiccups in this run, missing the second scan dash after getting up onto the ledge behind the ship, so... You know, I guess he's not perfect. No, this is this is a really good run, but it's I just have to pick out the obvious stuff. He gets a quick recovery though and continues on his way. Continuing on through all the normal any percent stuff, we see one strange deviation when he breaks the door on this save station without actually entering the save station, which ends up being very important later on. After fighting Zoid, he goes on to fight Flagra without the ice beam, which again is normal in normal gameplay and. A little bit weird at this point, since we've been seeing about six or seven years of Ice Beam before Flagra. And then, again, continues on to do all the normal stuff you would have done after fighting Flagra. Except, after getting the Artifact of Strength, he heads back up into Chozo to get Life Giver, and then turns back towards the Ruined Shrine. And then goes into Magma Pool, which is a room that we haven't seen in any percent yet. He proceeds to wedge himself into a wall and spin for about a minute. You know at this point what he's doing, but what you may not know if you're unfamiliar with the game is that there is very close to him a power bomb expansion. The game locks it behind a wall that you have to power bomb to open, so naturally, there's no chance of getting it without a power bomb. Unless. The one hitch here though is that in this instance, unlike in Wave Sun, the item collection doesn't trigger a cutscene. So Justin has to continue this backtrack through the ruins as an infinitely quickly rotating ball of energy heading to that save station that he opened earlier. Hence, 
why he opened it earlier. Unmorphing causes the light show nightmare. So a cutscene animation of some sort has to play in order to reset the speed parameter so that the camera can resume its normal duty, which is satisfied by the save station. After passing through the save station, Justin now completes IBBF, but of course he's doing it after fighting Flagra, so this trick has been affectionately dubbed as the mouthful Ice Beam Before Flagra, After Flagra, or IBBF AF. Even though he has everything he would need to to go the normal inbounds route to get Ice Beam, it still saves time to go out of bounds to avoid the pesky bomb puzzle and skip the Chozo Ghost fight for later in the run when he comes back to get the Artifact of World. With Power Bomb in hand already, Justin can proceed straight from Reflecting Pool down into Talon Overworld to pick up the X-Ray Visor and the Artifact of Chozo here, though at this point he doubles back through Chozo Ruins, back through Talon and into Magmore to pick up the Plasma Beam, Spirit, Elder, and Thermal, at this point finishing Fendrana entirely, and then doubling back through Magmore to enter Phase on Mines backwards. The fact that this backwards entrance to Phase on Mines hadn't been used in this way for about 10 years is another great example of how one change in the route, in this, in this case the Magma Pool Infinite Speed, can change everything else and render certain things which we haven't seen for ages suddenly relevant again. This Infinite Speed trick in Magma Pool, even though it added about a minute and change due to spinning up IS and then going to the save station, allowed for a cascading series of routing improvements that saved more net time overall. So that's what the 80% route shifted to. The community collaborated on proofing and testing all of these changes, and Justin was the first runner to execute them to great effect, achieving a new world record. One final trick bears mentioning here, and it's one of my personal favorites, a wall crawl to get newborn early. It's another strategy which just by looking at the map is something that you just want to do just by looking at the way the route is kind of like wave sun it's like let's just get artifact of sun ah it's right there on the way so in this case like ah, let's just get newborn before going to fight the omega pirate and then we don't have to double back so but how they figured out how to do it is just amazing it's another strategy that was figured out by fusion Varia while tassing and picking apart the game looking for new possibilities and then Justin took the theory and practiced it and tweaked it until it could be consistently executed by a human in an any percent run. At the end of the run, this is the crazy wall crawl at the end of a run for now. In a room adjacent to the artifact of newborn, Justin enters a secret world using a glider to push him out of bounds, and then he wall crawls to the outside of the Phazon pit. So the Phazon suit is normally required to get this artifact. Lacking the Phazon suit, Justin simply, simply, navigates to the artifact, situates himself out of bounds nearby to pick it up, and executes some precise inputs to push himself back in bounds in the middle of this kind of morph ball area. And then he just jumps up and then wedges himself into the wall, boosts through, morphs, unmorphs, remorphs, and then continues on his merry way. It is so cool to watch this trick. I just, I love it. It's also a very persnickety trick towards the end of a run. And like I said, a wall crawl at the end of the run is a dangerous thing. And this is definitely the last wall crawl that we'll see in the route for now. I'm glad for the sake of all Metroid Prime runners that there will be no wall crawls ever discovered after this in the run can just continue on. I just get, I get so nervous watching folks do difficult things and my heart couldn't bear any stress. So the rest of the run basically continues as you would expect from an 80% run at this point. Justin fights the Omega Pirate for Phazon suit, doubles back for Warrior, exit front ways through Phazon Mines, dips into Chozo to pick up World, and then onto the final bosses. So Justin has plenty of visible mistakes in this run, but there have been hundreds if not thousands of attempts prior to this one, even ones on much faster pace that died and phase on mines due to the new wall crawl. So this is just pure persistence that gets him to this point. Because once again, it's much harder than it looks. Without belaboring this video too much after... Oh, it was a long video. After a lot of time spent talking about this game, this random little dash in Reflecting Pool is a great case study in load triggers. Although it may look slower or even like a mistake compared to previous runners, this is a perfect example of the innumerable tiny developments and improvements that runners were finding over the years, especially due to new tools like Prime World Editor. By dashing and prioritizing hitting the load trigger for the next room rather than just trying to beeline for the door and having to wait, just 
Justin hits the load trigger and then finishes traversing to the door in the time that the next room is loading, saving time overall, even though it looks like a mistake. And we can put this in the file of things that look like mistakes unless you have special knowledge of the game, but now you have special knowledge about the game. So, congratulations. You're in the know. Hello, long time no see. I'm back here in the Forest Studio. Justin's 52 world record would stand for only two months, and according to this spreadsheet, Justin would break it. However, the story is way better than that. I had the pleasure and privilege of interviewing Justin for this project, and I asked him about the next couple years of speedrunning in which unofficial records were traded back and forth between him and T3 in unexpected ways. Before we got to that point though, I did just want to ask Justin about his history with speedrunning, his impressions of Metroid Prime and its community, and just a few of his memories from over the years. I want to thank Justin very sincerely for taking the time to do this interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Justin, DM. I've been playing Metroid Prime since I was a sophomore in high school, just like 2015, I think at this point, so about eight years, the better part of a decade, and I played a lot of that game. And it's a pleasure to be here. I never thought I would actually be doing, you know, an interview or anything related to that. <laughs> well, you're a multiple because world record holder. Uh, <laughs> let's let's hone in on that um, 52 world record a little bit. What was that like setting that first any percent single segment record? Whenever the 52 happened, a new route was just discovered. And the run wasn't that great. That's kind of how it goes with Metroid Prime runs. Whenever a new route gets found, the world record might drop, you know, several minutes. And you have those kind of mid-tier runs that fill the gap as it optimizes, or as it gets more optimized. And that's kind of what that was. It was just, you know, testing the waters of the new route. And it just happened to, to PB slash world record. Is that still a pretty significant moment, even when you kind of know that the route is faster, you know, when you when you saw that time for the, the first time? Yeah, once you start getting the low 50s, especially back then, now the game is in the low Unbelievable. But once you started to get down to that time, you know, you'll take any improvement you can get. I, I was pretty happy with the run. I actually didn't do any percent after I got that. I think I switched off of it afterwards, but um, I didn't really celebrate the fact that it was like a new world record or it was, a, it was the first world record I held. I think I was more focused on how it wasn't as good as I can do. Like I said, it was kind of a mid-tier run, testing the waters of the new route, and I just wanted to do better. And by doing better, I mean switch to another category while I'm still at. Let's talk a little bit about kind of what got you interested in the game initially. Um, you said you started playing the game in 2015? Yeah, around 2015, um, that summer after school, I, I found one of Claris's GDQ runs and I was like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. And I watched like Ocarina of Time, you know, all the old school GDQ runs where they were doing it in a basement, not on stage or anything, just a group of people, all that love to speed run in a room. It just blew me away because Metroid Prime was one of my favorite games growing up. And watching her like jump out of bounds, Ice, ice Beam before Plaga especially, it was awesome. And just made me want to do it too. So you had played the game as a, you know, growing up? kind of as a kid yes yeah i played it growing up all the time i remember hating mines because you know it was super dark and scary you know as a kid i remember i couldn't figure out how to beat she got for wave beam so i would pause the game for like 30 minutes and come back to it hoping i'd figure something out and i was just super frustrated because my beams kept getting absorbed and now i know the like the, the fastest way to do it you know roll up and then shoot three missiles it's kind of Cool to look back and see how I used to enjoy the game casually, and now I enjoy it for a whole different reason. When you when you were first playing it, did you have any sense of the community online around it? Were you like going on Metroid 2002, or did that come later? I don't think I found Metroid 2002 until after I got the game and started running it. I just clicked through Claris's run and copied it as best as I could. Didn't really find the community until around the time I posted a friggin' escape. Yeah, let's let's talk about that frigate escape a little bit. So, I mean, that was some of your first posts on the the, the forums, correct? Yes, it was. What that uh, was a good time? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what uh, did you have a sense of how good that time was, or did that reaction kind of surprise you? The reaction towards the time surprised me. At the time, the inbounds world record was, I think, a a four thirty four. 
it was by Claris. And I think the time I posted was a 28 or a 27. It's my very first video on YouTube, actually. It didn't feel all that great to me. I just wanted to, you know, kind of be a part of the community and be like, hey, you know, I'm running this game. This is what I did. I thought it was pretty good. You talked about like copying Claris's runs. Was it just entirely like a, a visual, knowing the mechanics of the game and trying to, to replicate those things? Or were you leaning on other people's resources to try to dig into that stuff? I had no resources to learn mechanics. I just tried to copy visually as much as I could. Like for the longest time, I couldn't figure out how she kept the lock on while dashing. And it turns out that was just pressing R, you know, while you're dashing and it keeps the lock on. I was like, wow, that's crazy. But the mechanics for this game are infinitely deep, really. You can talk for hours about it and how everything's interconnected. It's mind boggling, really, Yeah. once you get down to it. What felt distinctive about the Metroid Prime community? The Metroid Prime community, it felt very legacy. It was a, like a tight knit group of people that all love the game deeply. And it's great to try and be a part of that. As for other communities, I didn't really get into other communities. I've played Super Mario Sunshine. I've done some Ocarina of Time stuff. No huge discoveries or anything, just, you know, trying out the speedrun. But I didn't really interact with those communities at all. I've stuck in the Metroid Prime community. So that's one thing that's really struck me as interesting about the Metroid Prime community is how, you know, it, it is a lot older um, than a lot of uh, other speedrunning games. That's one thing that, that has really fascinated me about this project and about this game is that question of like, what has sustained interest in this game for, for 20 years? What's your impression of how has this game been able to stay, retain so many people that have been fascinated by it and sort of invested in it? I mentioned earlier how the mechanics, the, the skill ceiling is infinitely deep, complex. I think that's what keeps people coming back. There's always something new to be found, always something you can do a little bit faster. With Hazel and Edson making their respective tasks, it really pushed the boundaries on what you thought Metroid Prime was. In addition to footage, uh, releasing the practice mod and developing that over the years as well. That plus the tasks have really just made the meta explode. Like I said, there's always something new. There's something really special about Metro Prime. It brings people back, it keeps them, keeps them locked in. It's just a great game. On the flip side of that, what do you think are some of the things that has made it not as popular of a game as say uh, SM64 or even Sunshine for that matter? SM64, you know, the Mario series has always been more popular than Metroid, but Metroid Prime is, you know, the first, first 3D Metroid. I personally think it doesn't get all the credit that it deserves. It just wasn't as popular among, you know, the average player base and it kind of stuck that way with the speedruns, you know, SM64, Ocarina of Time, they, those have huge communities and it just kind of reflects the same for the Metroid Prime community. It's not a huge game, not a huge community. So what was your first GDQ? Uh, appearance. It was any percent in 2016. So yeah, that was just a couple years into running. What was it like going there for the first time? All eyes on me. New runner, Clarice has been doing it since ever. She's the only one that's ever run it in GDQ before me. So I, there was a high bar and I felt the pressure. Of course, the game was completely different since she ran it. No new route. I think I did the double IS route. Got a 59 single segment and I was happy with it. I did a few things that you wouldn't normally do in a speed run just to make it look cool. In particular, I grabbed the Hall of the Elders energy tank during IBBF by rolling into the tunnel. I didn't have to do that. I just thought it looked cool and wanted to do it for the fans. GDQ of uh, 19. I mean, that was a pretty big crowd. Talk to me a little bit about what it was like play the game in, in front of such a big uh, audience. So that was my third time ever at GDQ. I was already sort of used to the atmosphere. Like I was ready for it. I've done it before. I was, I didn't have first time jitters or anything like that. Of course, you're always going to be nervous going up in front of that many people for anything. That particular run, I actually did not have a microphone. I had only game audio in my ear. Unfortunately, that means I didn't hear donations. Oh. So I couldn't hear donation requests and the door to Artifact Temple will always haunt me because somebody requested that I write something there and I wrote something else, oh, no. but I didn't hear it. <laughs> so I didn't have a microphone. I didn't have to worry about commentary. I was just locked into the game, doing the best I could and managed to squeeze out a 52 and then a 51, I think a day or so later in the practice room. What happened at SGDQ 18? T3 got the 51 in the practice room. And his first ever, first and only JDQ appearance breaks the record in the practice room. Were you, were you there? Crazy. I was not there. Was, I hated that I missed that event, <laughs> but I was not there. 
I got the the secondhand news online, you know, the pictures of the screen and all that. Yeah, yeah. It's still exciting. Uh, had you met him or, or known him at all at that point? Or He is one of the oldest runners in the community now, over a decade. I actually got a 51 recorded, I think, two or three days after he did. Were you already uh, working on the 51 at that point, or was that kind of like you heard the news and you sat down and like all right well let's let's uh get this on tape i i think it was closer to the latter i was like wow he he really just did that so now i gotta match it you know i gotta get the 51 too except recorded between that and then uh gdq 19 how much were you doing any percent not too much i think i did some any percent you know enough to make me want to submit it at least several months leading up to that run i did nothing but play skyrim that is the whole and honest truth. <laughs> I played Skyrim for several months. Yeah. And then practiced for like a week. I crunched, <laughs> if you will, and managed to not only get a really good time in the marathon, but another unofficial world record. It was a wild event. An unofficial record for you. You came home again and recorded another official world record, correct? Yes. The I, 50? I'm pretty sure it was 50. The 50, the yeah. The 50. Yeah. And the one at GDQ, I determined was within 10 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds of 39, or 49, based on the RTA. Of course, T3 comes through, breaking that 10-minute that barrier, the 49, and that was it for a while. It really quieted down after that. That was like the big milestone that people were looking towards for a long time. What, what were your impressions of seeing the 49 at that point? It's like, wow, he finally did it. I knew he was going to. Yeah. I was just waiting for the post, you know, and he did it. I watched it. I watched it several times. It was a great run. This period of trading runs back and forth, of seeing the game run multiple times at GDQ, it was exciting for the community. But you wouldn't guess it just by looking at the Metroid 2002 forums. In the thread discussing the new world record, T3 acknowledges that most of the posting on the board had died down and that posting runs to Metroid 2002 was pretty much a nod to the rituals of the past. Many longtime members of the Metroid 2002 forums posted of their surprise, and they talked about some of the time milestones that had now been passed that once seemed like pipe dreams. This thread didn't even get to a second page worth of replies. In fact, within four months of T3's 49 being posted on the Metroid 2002 forums, the forums would be shuttered to new posts for good. But the community was far from dead. There's something cyclical, something ironic to this story, and many facets of it seem to end up back where they started. When Metroid 2002 was first dreamed up, sketched out, and created by Nate, it was to consolidate the scattered information across the GameFAQs forums and the ephemeral nature of IRC chat servers. And it's kind of ironic though that what Metroid 2002 was created to solve, the scattered information all over forums, it basically turned into, which is just a ton of scattered information on the Metroid 2002 forums. And even more ironic, what it was even before that, just kind of people talking on an IRC server, it would be replaced by, uh, except now it's called Discord, but basically it's the same thing. It just, again, ended up exactly where we started from. In December of 2016, user Skull64 posted on the Metroid Prime forum saying simply that there was now a Discord server for Metroid Prime, which everyone seems to have forgotten who originally made the server, but again, around 2016, new Discord server for Metroid Prime. Skull said that most of the community had migrated their discussion of the game over to that platform. If you're somehow unfamiliar with Discord in 2023 or whenever you're watching this, it's not a hard concept. It's instant messaging. It's like Slack or Teams or AOL Instant Messenger or uh, Skype or um, WhatsApp or I don't know, RuneScape. It's not really like RuneScape. Users join servers based around certain topics or games, and the platform serves as a connection point between other people who stream and play games on different platforms. It's, it's a cool software. Recommend it. No affiliate link. It's just good software. The Metroid Prime Discord server is organized into different channels. Messages are persistent and can be searched, but it's basically just an ephemeral chat platform versus a forum where people post topics and replies. It's easy to quickly lose track of when something 
something was said or who said something or it's it's easy to get lost in. Skull's post on the Metroid 2002 forums got a simple reply, rip M2K2. But it still had some gasping life left in it. For one thing, many users on the new Discord were a bit frustrated that information was getting lost in the onslaught of messages. There were some users that felt like it was important to post certain information, certain new discoveries on the forums to serve as a reference for later. Top runners would continue posting their times in separate threads, though the activity gradually died down between 2016 and 2019. The last page of conversation on the Metro 2002 forums took place between November 26th and November 27th of 2019. It was on the 3 3,455th page of the social topic thread, which was originally started by Nate on October 1st of 2005. Two users, DJ Granola, already introduced, and Tomato Bob, who both registered within a year of the forum start in 2003, were chatting about the closing curtains of the forum. Nate had gotten busy with life, and no one had really heard from him or really talked to him very much. His last post on the forum was early 2016. The activity on the site was dwindling, no doubt about it, and there were no mods and little interest in reviving the forums. Finally, on November 27th, 2019, at 10.16pm, user Turtle unceremoniously made the final post on the Metroid 2002 forums, asking a rhetorical question after the conversation and the rest of the forum had run its course. The forums were dipped in amber, and all new posts or post replies have been locked ever since. You can still register for a new account and private message users, but as the last post of the forums make clear, most everyone had moved onto Discord, where you can certainly find new people to talk to if you're so inclined, even probably when you're watching this video. If you log onto the Discord server, you'll be able to chat with many of the top runners and have access to a huge number of helpful resources and learn more about the game firsthand from the people that are still exploring it and poking at it today. On the Simple Resources channel, you'll find all the guides you need to get started running the game if that's something you're interested in. One of the best ones that I can recommend is a five hour introduction of the beginner's route taught by Justin himself, walking through a route which avoids any secret world wall crawling, but goes room by room through the game, showing every dash and every trick and its setup, and this will allow you to beat the game at a pretty decent clip. There's basically an avalanche of resources to learn the game and give it a try, to try different categories, play the randomizer, to do anything you would want to do in Metroid Prime. And on the Discord server, there's the very community of people who have been playing it, some old, some new, but all of them are still playing the game. Even with this new platform, I think it's still worth taking a moment to pause and reflect on the unique community of Metroid 2002. Looking at the site today, it looks and functions almost exactly like I remember it did back in 2003 when I was 10 years old and when I accessed it for the first time looking for information about this amazing new game that I was playing. And that's not really a dig. Good design is good design in 2003 or 2023. The simple layout isn't modern by any stretch, but I can easily find what I'm looking for. It's clean and it loads quickly. Easy goals to miss in web design of any era. Nate broke a nine year hiatus in early 2019 to do several page updates with some of the latest tricks, but almost all the other games had fallen by the wayside and haven't been updated in over 10 years. The game that started it all is the one that got the last bit of attention as Nate, now busy running a business and otherwise onto a new stage of life, made a few final updates with the signature Metroid 2002 style. The forums serve as a museum to both the distant and more recent past of Metroid Prime speedrunning. I'm personally extremely grateful to Nate for preserving and continuing to host the site and the forums. At the very least, they've been invaluable in this research. The reality is though that things like the GameFAQs forums can disappear from the internet in an instant. We can't take for granted that things on the internet will always be easily accessible. While it may have long since passed from a daily part of anyone's daily attention, this website is both a record and the actual substance of a community of people. To be able to see this community and the work it did so many years later is, I believe, quite special. Unless the forums are ever reactivated for some reason, this page on the Metroid Prime section of Metroid 2002 will look the same for as long as Nate chooses to keep the forums open and online. The top stickied thread is for the finished 37 minute task, one of the final contributions to the forums by one of Metroid Prime's many magicians, Fusion Varaya. If you click on this thread and go to the last post, you'll find the final great contribution to the game recorded on Metroid 2002. This post, one of the last by 
Fusion Variety on Metroid 2002 was a task demonstration of one final idea which would turn Metroid Prime speedrunning on its head. We have just one more astounding idea in Metroid Prime speedrunning to discuss. For now. Maybe, maybe two ideas. Two ideas. Let's go from 2018 through to uh, everything that happened a couple years later. About halfway through 2018, Justin set his back-to-back -back world records of 52 and 51 with the unofficial T3 record thrown in the middle. Passing New Year's 2019 and on to the summer of 2019, Justin once again knocked the time down a bit further, securing 60 minutes flat. Casually, a few days later, T3 rolls the time another notch forward, perhaps for the last time, and achieves a 49. Towards the end of 2019, the final post is made on Metroid 2002. A bit closer to the end of 2019, a certain little virus is discovered just before the New Year's, which earns it the suffix 19, although the outbreak of COVID-19 is so 2020. Its first reported death came just nine days into the new year, registered on January 9th, 2020, though most of the rest of the world didn't close up shop until a couple months later in March. So naturally, not much happened for the rest of 2020, which is why it became 2021. And now we have a bit more to look at in Metroid Prime speedrunning. Before we look at our final run, I think it's worthwhile to take a look back at how the route has changed. I haven't belabored every single run with an exact detail of the route going item by item, but I think it may be worthwhile to take a look back at kind of like a heat map or simplified view of each run so we can get a broad strokes overview of how much the route has changed over the years. First of all, here's kind of again the chart of every item acquisition and every route that we've looked at so far. Let's look at our map and talk through the major runners and changes that the route has gone through over the years as the route has evolved. Again, and I won't go item by item here, but it let's at least consider kind of the overall path and the different runners that we've discussed so far to get a broad strokes understanding of the changes that have taken place. The developer intended route does what Metroid games do best. It takes you all over the game world multiple times. It has you backtracking and approaching rooms in new ways because of new abilities. It presents you with tantalizing mysteries to be revealed later as you become more powerful and then gives you the power to go and face a new section of challenges. It can be a bit annoying sometimes to backtrack hither and thither but there are other moments of payoff and surprise, like having to unexpectedly return to the space pirate frigate in a flooded state, or into the throat of your enemy in Phazon Mines. The game is paced beautifully, and the world design rewards exploration and backtracking the whole way through. That's not what we're here for. We've got a game to speedrun. Calfulio used many of the early innovations in routing to put together a run which was a good test specimen of early speed running in Metroid Prime. Let alone being the first recorded run of Metroid Prime, it's also the first full game recorded speed run of any video game. It's also one of the unrepeated routes in the any percent category, so this run sits in a place of high honor as a pioneer and a benchmark in the Metroid Prime any percent history. Kip's first run moved around the item acquisition order a bit closer to what it would be for the first few years of speedrunning. By nailing down long-standing tricks such as Space Jump First and Early Wild, the route became a little more standardized and would serve as a jumping off point for future innovations. Zoidy created a run with the PAL version which has never been replicated by anyone. This solitary runner with a solitary route proved that, especially in the early days, tenacity and execution and creativity and thought could overcome inherent disadvantages of a slower version of the game, and a new world record could be notched by someone who just loved playing Metroid Prime. Kip and MP Zoid raised the bar of quality and created a route which has endured as one of the standards for inbounds routing. By reassessing phase on mines and adding thermal visor back into the run order, the Metroid Prime Any% percent route entered a stable period of high optimization, which would need to be broken up by a maverick and a rule change. Bartender Sparky innovated a new route and a new ideology of speedrunning Metroid Prime. By thoroughly showing his work, speedrunning the game at a high level of skill, and showcasing the possibilities of a new type of movement, Sparky nearly single-handedly moved Metroid Prime speedrunning into an exciting second decade of possibility. By harnessing movement which had formerly divided the community and demonstrating its worth, he gave future runners a new realm of possibility to explore in lowering the time. 
Claris, the first of the three giants of modern Metroid Prime speedrunning, standardized the secret oral routing and gave a template to all modern runners of Metroid Prime for route room optimization and finesse in single segment runs. By streaming on Twitch and doing multiple runs at GDQ, Claris brought new attention and a new community to Metroid Prime speedrunning. T3 developed and implemented new strategies and harnessed the power of infinite speed to open up new routing possibilities. By constantly refining his play and enduring the toil of countless runs, he captured the single segment record from other runners an astounding four times. Justin expanded on the possibilities of secret worlds and used skill and creativity to bring new routes and strategies into the any percent record. By creating a thorough and instructive guide, he also served as a mentor for new runners looking to pick up Metroid Prime for the first time and remains a helpful and instructive guide to the community. Now that I've done all the work to lay out all of the routes on the same map, I think I just want to take one more little moment to look at all of the routes on top of each other. Now, I know that this is a bit chaotic, but the point that I've been trying to make is that, again, this game is a bit chaotic. It's utterly fascinating to me to see how different runners have chosen to approach the game and how the possibilities of even what you can do has changed over time. I think it's just frankly astounding to look back on almost 20 years of Metroid Prime speedrunning represented as these chaotic little dots scurrying all over the map. With the help of an amazing new discovery from Fusion Varia, Justin would kick the door in in Metroid Prime speedrunning one more time. I'm going to hold you in suspense just a bit longer on the content of Fusion Varia's discovery. It's the craziest thing that we're going to talk about in this run, but it's not the only crazy thing. This run was posted on January 15th of 2021, and it was one of the many things that made me finally decide that this was the time to make this video. And again, that was like two years ago, but it just took me as long as it took me, and here we are. It was amazing to me that a game that was almost 20 years old at the time was still consistently being developed in new ways. After I started the research for this video, there was a gem of an interview that happened to take place that I eventually stumbled across. The Old Games Plus podcast is hosted by a handful of game developers, and it's a fascinating listen for anyone interested in the art and design of video games. The hosts play old games and then do a thorough, often multi-part discussion of their impressions of the games themselves. They played and discussed Metroid Prime in 2020, but on February 8th, 2021, they released an interview with Zoid Kirsch, who now works at Blizzard alongside one of the hosts of the show. We met Zoid way back towards the beginning of this odyssey. If you need a refresher, Zoid was a senior engineer at Retro during the development of Metroid Prime and Metroid Prime Echoes, and has been a longtime friend of the Prime speedrunning community. Towards the end of the interview, one of the hosts asked him about speedrunning. Prime 2 and just how they break the game. And it's really interesting seeing their, their goals are so vastly different than your goals of making the game. <laughs> you know, like they're they're like, oh, if I can do this jump here, I can save two seconds off this thing. And you're like, but you know, if you get that power up over there, it'll make this next boss easier. But that's right. That you know, their goal is speed is everything. So there's this weird focus on how uh, the game evolves, which is kind of interesting. I'm I'm flabbergasted that the game doesn't crash as much as considering how often they break it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> With the 48 Justin posted in January of 2021, the game has gotten just about as broken as it has ever been in a run controlled by a human being. There's a shocking new piece of tech in the Any% percent route, the fusion suit. It's functionally pointless, included in the game as a bonus for linking the game with Metroid Fusion via the Game Boy Advance adapter, this charming piece of plastic. It had been occasionally used by Justin in the past and had been used as a donation incentive at Game Sounding Quick. It's also, it's, I'll say it, it's ugly. Justin uses it in all of his runs though for a laugh, so 
just thought I'd mention that. It may also be a send up to Nate, who always recorded his videos for Metroid 2002 with the fusion suit on, but in any case, it's a bit of a meme at this point in the community. The first bit of this run is normal as we've come to define normal. There's the frigate wall crawl, the utterly familiar space jump first. We see Justin careening Samus across the lush levels crafted by Zoid and his teammates. Justin gets missiles, an energy tank, and morph ball, all standard stuff. But coming back into the main plaza, there's a little tricky bit of platforming, another missile expansion, and then Justin does something completely new in the Any% percent route. The Magma Pool IS was the first appearance of that room in the Any% percent route, but this new routing shows a yet unseen area of the game in Any% percent, a small branch of Chozo ruins with several expansions that is otherwise inaccessible until the grapple beam is obtained in normal gameplay. The normal route never actually forces you down this branch to complete the game, it's just one area of the game that you can come back to if you're diligent and backtracking and exploring all areas of the game as you get new upgrades. Justin navigates through this area out of bounds and backwards, and then he starts opening the map again and again and again and again. And you can, you, I understand if this isn't the most interesting thing in the world to watch. Even when you realize what he's doing, it's more of an intellectual appreciation than a real visceral enjoyment. But if you've made it this far into the video, I'm sure you're used to that by now. Justin has entered the area where Magma Pool will be loaded, but it hasn't loaded yet, importantly. The consistency of the game's geometry and the room structure means that if Justin positions himself exactly in the right place in empty nothingness and loads the room afterwards, he can effectively place Samus anywhere in the room he wants. Bringing up the map screen, which fortunately doesn't count towards IGT, is Justin's way of confirming that he's aligning himself correctly in the hypothetical room that surrounds him. It allows for frame buffered inputs and it pushes back the loading of this room just long enough until Justin can get into the right position. He finally aligns himself in the right place in open air and morphs, again buffering the map screen in order to ensure that everything is perfectly lined up. And he falls through an invisible power bomb expansion and gets power bombs before he's even obtained the morph ball bombs, a trick known as power bombs before bombs, PBB. And you can guess, much harder than it looks. A lot harder than it looks. This is hands down a difficult thing that we'll see in this run. It's also not the last new thing we'll see, so watch on. Justin continues on in his run. Getting power bombs this early in the game, once again, completely upends the routing. During the fight against the incinerator drone, Justin uses his single power bomb to break open the block normally opened by morph ball bombs and gets the missile expansion contained within while Zoid blows flames around the room for a random amount of time. It's another free missile expansion and will allow Justin to skip another expansion later on. IBBF is once again BF. So this is something like IBBF AF BF because the whole reason it was moved to after Flagra was to ensure that the run had the power bombs from Magma Pool using IS so that you could go straight from Ice Beam to the elevator to get into Talon Overworld to get X-Ray Visor and then the Artifact of Chozo. But uh, Justin does it differently. Anyway, if you didn't follow all that, that's fine, but it also illustrates once again how solving a route through this game is a complex and interconnected web of problems, difficult tricks, and conflicting priorities which will change on its head completely if one factor changes. For as much as the runners do to this game, I'll say what Zoid might have been avoiding to say out of modesty. This game is really well built to not crash under all the strange cases of item statuses and room layers and all that stuff. For example, for some reason which may only be retro are good at what they do, they built code into the game which handles instances of not a number. If this weren't in place, the game would just instantly crash during infinite speed and all of those tricks would be off the table. However, a well-made game doesn't mean that there aren't still some funny glitches like this utterly bizarre texture and model glitch that happens here when Justin collects the x-ray visor with the fusion suit version of the pre varia power suit. It just goes nuts. The game didn't expect to ever be put in a situation like this, and this monstrosity is the rendering equivalent of the shrug emoji. Justin skips the missile expansion here, having picked up a couple extra already. Now, this missile expansion is normally free because the rooms on either end take a bit of time to load, but he also doesn't have the boost ball, so he needs to take the route over the top with the little bomb jumps here. Justin continues on. It's back into Chozo to get Varia from Flagra, early wild, and then down into Magmore, where Justin 
does drop some dashes here the YouTube description still a lot to come off is instructive the route basically rearranges itself to accommodate having gotten power bombs so early after the first trip to Fendrana in the previous route Justin would have gone back up in the talent overworld then to Chozo to get life giver and power bombs from magma pool yada 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 in this run he can simply continue straight through to get plasma and do his second trip to Fendrana right away after finishing in Fendrana Justin enters phase on mine backwards and does the typical tricks of the new route he fights the drone to activate the phase on elite fight for warrior he snags newborn early he does spiderless shafts grabs warrior and leaves out the front entrance of phase on mines justin heads into chozo ruins to get world and then backtracks through chozo ruins to get life giver He's on great pace. He fights Ridley, enters the impact crater, navigates up to the chamber right before Metroid Prime, and then something odd happens. For a minute and a half, Justin fidgets with this Metroid, coaxing it into the wrong room and attempts to trigger its attack animation over and over again. Without knowing exactly what's going on, it looks like Justin, who is usually surgically precise and fast in everything he does, it just looks like he's messing around for no reason after a run of really impeccable execution on some amazing tricks. There's no more items out of bounds to get. It's not like that spider ball track is any major impediment. All runners have just boosted through this red phase on and continue on to fight EXO. So what is Justin doing? It reminds me of a little trick performed and recorded almost 18 years before this one. Both of them set the players back about a minute and a half. Both of the tricks were considered crazy because of how difficult and inconsistent they were. However, both of them had tremendous payoff. Calfulio saved an entire trip back from Fendrana Drifts, and once Justin finally gets through this wall, it's clear what his aim is. He's gonna skip the exo phase of Metroid Prime. This trick is known simply as exo skip, and you guessed it. The most random part of this trick being finished, Justin still has to navigate a tricky and difficult out of bounds wall crawl. First, he navigates back up to the level of the antechamber of the prime fight. Then, crawling alongside the outside of this strange, jagged impact crater geometry, Justin passes over the top of Metroid Prime, weaving carefully around triggers and geometry which might kill a run at this very late hour. He navigates down past each successive layer of the Metroid Prime fight. Because the game expects Metroid Prime in each of these chambers, it's in there, but Justin breezes past each layer before hitting the trigger to load the Essence fight. And for all intents and purposes, that's that. Justin fights Essence and earns his 48, the new lowest world record completion of Metroid Prime. Or was it? I'd like to set the record straight on one important point, or a couple points as it were. When I was screening this video early to some knowledgeable test audiences, it was brought to my attention that credit is due to one important runner that otherwise didn't get any attention in this video. Years ago, which, yikes, when I was writing this script, the primary resources I relied on were Metroid 2002 posts and conversations with Tom. I overlooked two random little Discord messages which trace the origins of two game-breaking tricks which we've already seen implemented into the Any% percent run by Justin. The two tricks that we're gonna take a look at again are Power Bombs Before Bombs and Exoskip. The user that more or less discovered them for the Any% percent route is Vertigo. Now, the reason that discovering is put into tricky quotation marks is because it's tricky. For a progression from a trick being task demonstrated to human executable and finally to any percent viable, can each be counted as one discovery of a trick? Or maybe a demonstration is, a, is the right word. Because it's one thing to show that a trick is theoretically possible, and then a, quite another thing to actually use its benefits in a world record run. In any case, power bombs before bombs and exo skip in the any percent world record would definitely not be there without these discoveries by Vertigo. Ah, that light is just... That light will only be here for like a couple more minutes. I'm trying to get through this. Yeah, I was looking at the sun and now, I'm, now I can't see the teleprompter. In a series of circumstances which are actually somewhat similar to Justin's entry onto the forums with his literally unbelievable frigate escape time, some of Vertigo's first posts on the Metroid Prime speedrunning Discord was a player executed entrance to a secret world outside of Prime's antechamber. I, uh, I ran out of natural light by like four days. I wrote the Vertigo section within the last month of releasing this project, and in my haste to write this, I made a few mistakes. So I am here again to re 
re-correct the record, I guess. The mistake that I made was that I confused December of 2018 with December of 2017, and I thought that this post by Fusion Varia was actually a few months ahead of Vertigo's discovery, when, in fact, Fusion Varia didn't sketch out that route prior to Vertigo discovering the Secret World entrance. Vertigo discovered the Secret World entrance, and then nine months later, Fusion Varia figured out how to do the exoskip from the Secret World entrance that Vertigo discovered. Because of how convoluted this game and its history is though, and this is part of what confused me, Fusion Varia had actually theorized Exoskip long, long before Vertigo discovered the Secret World entrance, but no one, let alone Fusion Varia, could figure out how to actually reasonably enter the Secret World right before Prime's antechamber. Actually, in another ridiculous fold of butter into this trick of uncertain providence puff pastry, Fusion Varia was tipped off to investigating the possibility by two even older videos made by two people outside of the community showing Samus in a state known as Where's the Room? One channel is still uploading videos to this day of random video games. It looks like this is the only one of Prime, actually. And the other one only posted this single video. Once again, this pure research mentality of people finding strange things that happen in Metroid Prime and sharing them with others, even if they don't know them, has a ripple effect of inspiration and discovery even more than a decade later. Fusion Varai was never able to track down the setup for getting into this where's the room state, and the trick remained on the drafting table. However, once Vertigo found the entrance to the secret world, Fusion Varai was able to come back in December of that same year, nine months later, and sketch out the exoskip that runners now use. There's actually a really cool and more recent, faster exoskip that's been found pretty recently and it will probably be the path of least resistance to future world records for top runners. I can't really wink, but you know, wink. Back to Vertigo. In a demonstration of how poorly organized Discord can be, some users didn't even pick up on the implications or the significance of the discovery. Those who were paying attention called it literally impossible, and some people moved on to talking about other things in the disorganized hodgepodge discussion. Our favorite zesty runner complained about the brouhaha in the middle of it in a rare Discord contribution. Next year, in what was perhaps a COVID isolation-fueled jaunt of exploration in the game, Vertigo found a setup for a human executable power bombs before bombs using the extensive pause buffering already seen in Justin's 48. The runners on the Prime Discord, now familiar with Vertigo's skill and ingenuity, were astounded by the discovery. They were also a bit wary of the ridiculous pausing and aligning Samus in empty space, but it proved faster, so here we are. From task to human execution, Fusion Varia and Vertigo were integral in bringing these tricks into the any% percent route. Vertigo is one of the fastest up-and-coming runners of Prime, and has recently set two back-to-back -back personal bests, the third runner besides Justin and T3 to notch sub-50 times, both of which happened back-to-back -back just two days apart, and the latter of which I had the pleasure and privilege of seeing live. Congratulations, Vertigo. Now, back in the flow, as it were, of our present story, we have an uncontested world record at 48 minutes by Justin DM. It was inarguably the fastest time that anyone had seen on the end screen in a human executed run. There were no faster times, certainly not a two minute faster time. I was well into researching and writing this script when I found something which surprised me. I would have found it a lot sooner had I just gone to the aforementioned resources tab on the aforementioned wonderful Metroid Prime speedrunning Discord. So again, I'll plug that. The any percent world record set by Justin, the stunning 48 minutes with two new game cracking tricks had previously been beaten by a runner named Justin DM by two full minutes. What's surprising here is that the route used by the 46 was the same as the 52 to 49, as power bombs before bombs wasn't incorporated into the route yet. One obvious time save was just doing exoskip a lot faster. He doesn't fall down after getting out of bounds at the door, and he gets stuck fewer times while crawling across Metroid Prime's antechamber. So the route was largely the same as it had been before the 48. Why was this route faster? There were a few small deviations from the 52 to 49 route safe stations. Remember all the discussion on segmenting versus single segment routes? Well, here's where it comes home to roost. There might have been a split mind at the time if you asked a runner familiar with Metroid Prime what the fastest time was at this point. They may have said 46, but if you checked speedruns.com you would have seen 48. Furthermore, Justin even refers to the 48 which was done after the 46 as the any% world record. I'll let you decide which you think at this point is truly faster. 
Either way, it was Justin who had the record at this point. Justin was able to squeak the in-game timer a whole two minutes faster than his single segment time just by saving at the ends of various sections and going for the riskiest, most difficult strats and not tolerating the slightest error. Even when leaving the ship to get space jump, he dashes to the left, SGFL, harder than it looked, and then dashes into the chamber with space jump. It's a lot faster, but far more difficult. But again, we're only talking about a few seconds saved. Despite being at the beginning of the run, most runners don't even bother attempting it in a single segment run, as it's a high probability of failure and doesn't save a huge amount of time. But it does save time. Another example is skipping the main plaza energy tank. When grinding out single segment runs, the addition of a few seconds is well worth it to avoid the frustration of losing runs to random deaths and tiny bits of damage. However, when running segmented runs, the constant refresh of health at safe stations and the ability to retry segment after segment shift the balance towards saving the time being preferable to picking up the energy tank. So the fastest completion of Metroid Prime at this point was 46 minutes on the end game timer. However, if you had asked anyone familiar with speedrunning and unfamiliar with Metroid Prime if the fastest run of a game could include using in-game save stations and repeating segments over and over again, sometimes over the course of many weeks or months until every segment is perfect, and then taking the game's reckoning of playtime as the speed record, you'd maybe get a little laugh. Or maybe they just ask what you're talking about because those are completely unfamiliar terms. But it's always been a game that was played primarily for the community rather than the outside world. Some of the most popular speedrunning world record videos have views in the multi-million range. Some streamers consistently pull down thousands or even tens of thousand viewers when they go live. The only way you might have known about this 46 minute time would have been to be one of Justin's 660 YouTube subscribers or one of the roughly 800 Metroid Prime 1 Discord members. This lonely little YouTube playlist of the fastest playthrough ever done of Metroid Prime by a human being features one segment that barely even cracks three digits of total views. Yet, Justin and the rest of the Metroid Prime community continues to push the game lower and lower. No matter how few people are playing it, as long as there's at least two who are enjoying it together, there seems to be a will to improve the time. No secret world. Again. Okay, good morning. Uh, hi, I'm just calling this morning to ask if you're a supporter of the video gaming community. Oh my god, I apologize. We've been getting calls all morning. I, I apologize, and yes. Fantastic. Yes, I am. Great. Uh, are you a supporter of the beat running community? Yes. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Great, because a former decorated speedrunner needs your support. And his name is T3. <laughs> oh, I can't believe you're still calling me. I'm about to lose my After almost two years of honing the speedrunning skills necessary for Metroid Prime by playing Pikmin, T3 came back and notched a 47, 46, 45, and a 44 on the record boards. Good lands. By now, you should be able to anticipate the things that save T3 time. We've seen all of the patterns before. Lining up these astounding five runs side by side, it's clear where many of the mistakes that Justin was talking about in his comments on the 48 were, and how plenty of time could still come off, as he said. T3 cleaned up many of the mistakes that Justin made while following the same route, including hitting the genius strat, which Justin had missed, uh, faster power bombs before bombs by about six seconds, a faster Chozo ghost fight, skipping an E-tank and Magmore that Justin opted to get for some reason, a shorter power bomb maze, shorter Omega Pirate fight, and finally the biggest and most important time save which T3 kind of notched down run after run was executing Exoskip faster and faster each time. 
Uh, each run got a bit better. Justin's benchmark to beat from the entrance of the impact crater to the start of the essence fight bypassing Exo was 3 minutes and 31 seconds. In the 47 minute run, T3 shaves 10 seconds off of this. In the 46, he takes a whole minute off of his previous time, down to two minutes and 10 seconds. He shaves another six seconds off in the 45. In the 44, he takes it down to a mere one minute and 47 seconds to go from the entrance of the impact crater to the start of the essence fight. So, as with Claris's multiple world records in a row, we find that by cleaning up execution alone, the time can be further notched down using the same route. Although Justin said there was time to come off his 48, he estimated that the fastest possible time with that route was 46 minutes. In actual fact, T3 would squeeze two additional minutes out of the same route, bringing the time down to a 44. One of my favorite things about lining up runs like this though is just seeing the astounding level of similarity there are among certain sections of the game between T3's four runs as well as between T3 and Justin. Many of the micro splits, the kind of the space between cutscenes that I've been using to time these routes, vary by a second or less, giving and taking back small fractions of a second each time. Even in this late stage, stage of optimizing the game 20 years after it's been released, we still see the contrast of perfect gameplay and amazing tricks contrasted against some small errors that still slip through but still manage to eke out a world record time. Even T3's 44 isn't perfect. Though there are no glaring errors, there were still 10 micro splits out of the 90 that I broke the run into that were the slowest of the five using the same route. Interestingly, Justin's 48 contained 13 splits that were the fastest out of the five runs. So again, I've, I've broken each of these runs up into the segments between the cutscenes, like using that as, as points of synchronization in order to figure out where different runs deviate in time. And if we take only the best micro splits out of each of these five runs, we see an ideal time of approximately 43 minutes and 15 seconds using this route. Now, 15 seconds is a tantalizing number. It seems as if a marginal 42, like a 42.59, might be possible given the current knowledge of this route, but who knows? Now, 15 seconds is a lot of time, but it's not a lot, a lot of time, so who knows? Maybe 42 is possible, or lower. We can look back at Calfulio failing a bomb jump nine times and think, oh, well, that's just where optimization was at the time. But to see sections of T3's 45 minute world record where he has to still try a few times to enter the secret world for early newborn and it's still a new world record, we remember that as runners push the envelope more and more, there's always going to be a mix of astounding execution with a few reminders sprinkled in that these are mere mortals playing a game. A game that is a cathedral of movement possibility with a ceiling that seems to be infinitely high. Let's close out our timeline and bring ourselves up to the present day, shall we? Picking up from where we left off at the close of the undramatic year of 2020, we see a new world record just two weeks into the hot new year 2021. This project started about a week later when I realized that there was not going to be a Metroid Prime any percent world record history video unless I made it. So. I started making it. I thought it would be done in a few months, like midsummer, and well, here we are. I wrote an awesome script and I started doing some work on editing, and then T3 just dropped three more records and I had to rewrite the script entirely. And also, another Metroid game was released and this one was pretty good. Astute viewers may remember that I mentioned that there seems to be a trend of new Metroid Prime records being set right before new Metroid games are released. On a somber note, as we enter 2022, we see the invasion of Ukraine and the beginning of unprovoked aggression by Russia in February of 2022. Later, in the summer of 2022, I thought it would be a good time to get this Capitol Trail bike ride done for this video, hence why I don't have any cards for the events after this day because they hadn't happened yet. I was hoping to get the project done by November of 2022 to coincide with the 20th anniversary of Metroid Prime's release, but that didn't happen. Instead, the Queen died, T3 set a new world record, and the 20th anniversary of the game that started this all quietly passed by the notice of almost no one outside the community of passionate people who all love this beautiful game.
Here's another thing to add to the pile of things that happened while I was still working on this project and made me rewrite the script. If anything though, I think that this is a testament to the longevity and sustained interest in this game that things keep happening with a 20 year old game even as I was working on the history video. Metroid Prime Remastered was released on February 8th, 2023 and it's awesome. It's an entirely accurate remake, bringing Metroid Prime up to the graphical standards of the Switch. There are no cut corners, and the game looks and feels amazing. Playing it again brought back many of the same memories and feelings that I remember from the first time I played it when I was young. I, I get it. This may make it sound a little bit like nostalgia bait, but in my opinion, the care and attention given to this game makes it very special in its own right. And I think it's the best way to experience Metroid Prime for the first time. Nintendo doesn't often release entirely remastered and updated versions of their IP, so I think that the fact that this game even exists is quite special. I mean, it's not, it's not Metroid Prime 4, but... It'll do. No, it's really good. It's really good, I promise. With all that said, and in all seriousness, I will say, the Metroid Prime gameplay loop is, in some ways, a bit dated. But in my mind too, that also makes it special in its own way. To experience a first-person puzzle platformer adventure game built on 2023's graphical capabilities actually felt really cool and rather unique. There are no updates to the mechanics, objectives, story, or gameplay, but I think that's actually a testament to the evergreen quality of the source material itself. Now, that doesn't mean there are no non-graphical changes to the game whatsoever. Those who are quite familiar with the game, and that includes you at this point if you've made it this far, will notice a few changes. First and foremost, uh, and most importantly for speedrunners, there's no more uncapped sideways dashing. No more releasing a lock on and sending Samus careening across the room. The physics engine was completely rewritten and updated to make control and movement of the game smoother and more polished. You're also now able to single button hop the morph ball like you can in Metroid Prime 3, which is it's pretty nice. It's not a big deal, but I thought it was nice. Makes some of the morph ball sections less tedious. Uh, it's kind of fun. It's cool. Speaking of nice, it really can be understated that this game just looks awesome. Models and textures look better, lighting and particle effects look way better, and overall the game is just a visual treat. I actually enjoy the look of it so much that I turned the HUD and visor opacity completely down and played the game with no interface whatsoever. It was challenging, yet immersive, having to listen to the audio cues of low health and missiles and keep mental track of my resources as I scoured the world for refillables. And for as long as we talked about the boat controls of Metroid Prime, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Remastered now has three different control options. Classic, motion, and dual stick. I know I spent a lot of time talking about how fitting the boat controls were in the original game, how it didn't detract from the mechanics, and it's still a very playable game. Yeah, 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 I get it. I just have to say the dual stick controls are really nice. They felt, they just felt right after I unlearned some of the muscle memory from the original game. I did try the classic controls at first, but the physical design of the Switch and how it's held in your hand just makes you feel like you should be controlling it like a dual stick shooter. So I did. It was great. Speaking of handheld, I just can't get over how fun it is to play Metroid Prime handheld and on the go. I was a little late, actually like really late, five years late to owning a Switch, so this was one of the first Switch games that I played and so there was still some novelty in that, but it was cool. For as good and welcome as the remastered version of the game is, I still think the GameCube version holds up quite well. If you're interested in speedrunning the game, I also think the GameCube version is still the best way to go. However, if a five hour video has convinced you to give this game a try, I definitely think the Switch is better for the first time player. There's even a good chance you could finish a casual playthrough of the game for the first time while watching this video. One final note on the topic of speedrunning. Interestingly, the community decided early on in Remastered's life to switch to RTA timing for timing speedruns of that game. Since the engine was updated and other changes were made in the game, the in-game timer at the end of Remastered now counts cutscenes and parts of the world transition into its time. Whereas in the original game, you'll remember it only counted the time that you actually had control. Of Samus. Since the new in-game timer was a little bit more fuzzy and included time that Samus was out of your control, it made sense for the community to switch to RTA for more accurate and reasonable timing purposes. Much like the boat controls, IGT remains, for the time being, as an anachronism of the original Metroid Prime. 
As I deliver these lines in August of 2023, the lowest time we've seen on that timer is 44 by T3. Unless a bunch of runners tie or someone sets a new record, this may be the lowest time that we see for a good long while. An eternal theme for me with game design has been to let the players create their own vision. I don't want to just hand players ready-made experiences. Here you go, play this stage we made, solve this puzzle. I want a game that allows players to try to come up with their own solutions and play styles and test them out there on the spot. I think that's the best thing about interactivity. How much time is left on the table of Metroid Prime? Remember Fusion Variety's 37 minute task, which ostensibly seemed like the fastest possible completion of Metroid Prime? It didn't have Exoskip or a bunch of other stuff, and by some estimates is seven to eight minutes out of date, meaning that a theoretical best time in a task would probably be in the low 30 minutes, possibly even 29 with a few new tricks. For all its quirks, and the abundance of secret world entrances, the rotational speed underflows, the tricky jumps, and tiny little bits of standable collision, Metroid Prime is still an incredibly well-made game. There's no ultimately game-breaking trick that's been discovered yet, and it's unlikely to ever be discovered. Tricks like warping to the end of the game and Ocarina of Time. For everything that's been skipped and rearranged, there's little hope of ever skipping any of the artifacts, the morph ball, the morph ball bomb. You're always going to have to get at least one missile expansion. You're going to need the main power bomb expansion, the phase on suit and phase on beam, and the x ray visor. You just aren't going to skip these things. With that said, it's worth mentioning that even 20 years after the game's release, people are still trying to lower the completion percentage. There's only one roadblock left to skipping the wave beam and it probably wouldn't have any impact on the any percent route if that were ever achieved, but it's still amazing the things that people are figuring out in this game. Looking at where you land on Talon Overworld, it's hard to imagine the developers didn't intend for at least some of the game to be picked apart and some of the sequence to be broken. The developers have adamantly denied that they intended for any sequence breaking, but the very nature of the level design, which intentionally sets you up to cross over itself, is just, it's too perfect. It is too perfectly enticing. The ledge behind you leading to Space Jump is just barely out of reach. If you've played the game once, you realize that just behind you is an item which gives you tremendous amounts of freedom of movement. The design of the game itself beckons you to try to pick it apart. In September of 2018, as the sun set on Metroid 2002, and the community had almost entirely moved over to Discord, there was one lonely post with a single reply. The user asks, with several reasons in hand, why not switch to RTA? Another user drops the thread's only reply. He states simply that the community has always been content with IGT, and that the risk of hundreds of tied runners and the speculation of 48 minutes being the lowest time here is good for a laugh. There's not any great risk of hundreds of tied runs anytime soon, unless there's a sudden bevy of new runners that reach the levels of Justin and T3. Will Metroid Prime ever see 10 or 20 years of a single IGT being the final barrier with dozens of tied runners? It's hard to imagine that it will. But part of what sparked my interest as I started this project over two years ago was a new time by Justin, almost 20 years after the game came out. And T3 surprised me again by setting several new records while I was even still working on the project. And the Discord server still hums with discussion, speculation, and new methods of shaving off precious frames. It seems that the only barrier to a lower time in Metroid Prime is the willingness of individuals and a community to grind it down even further. As long as there are people still playing this game, it seems that there is always more time to be found. So that's, that's about all I wrote about Metroid Prime. <laughs> I've had to write like three different endings for this video and I've more or less included all of them. Uh, like if you were to watch a director's cut of this video, you would just watch this video again. I haven't had anyone looking over my shoulder and telling me to cut something for the sake of Time, Dr.
Freeman. Man, Half-Life 2 is great. It's probably the second best game that I've felt to convey the sense of dread and isolation. And I could keep going, but this video doesn't need to be any longer, so maybe I'll make another one about Half-Life 2. Remember five hours of your life ago when I talked about the world of Metroid Prime feeling like it could go on forever? You may have guessed by now the overall thesis of this video. Speedrunning is, practically speaking, a way to make a game go on forever. Speedrunning is in mesh with the depth of the game itself, the level of quality and the complexity which beckons you to investigate it further. Look, you can speedrun any game. You can throw some random Game Boy cartridge in and create criteria for the beginning and end and just say, all right, it's a speedrun game now. But in all honesty, I think that it's not fun to speedrun games that aren't good. You can do it ironically, you can do it for a laugh, but I think what keeps someone coming back to a game over and over again, what, what builds a community, is just a well-made game. It's a good experience, it's, it's depth and complexity and things that make people want to come back. Look, Metroid Prime is one of the most significant video games that I've ever played. It's a great game. But beyond the game itself, if Metroid Prime didn't have such a vibrant community for as long as it's existed, I don't think I would have wanted to make this video, or at least make it in the way that it exists now. Over the last three years, I've thought a lot about the parallels between my willingness to persist in making this ridiculously long video and the persistence of the people that have been willing to speedrun Metroid Prime. Both of these pursuits have been premised on having a well-made game to discuss and play. The passion that people have for the game and the substance of the game itself have always stuck in my mind even since I played it, even since I was a little kid who went on Metroid 2002 and just thought how cool it was that people had assembled all this information. Even with all those things in mind, the question that's just driven this project forward repeatedly is, why do people love to spend time with this thing like I do? Speedrunners throughout the years have made massive investments of their own time into video games because the mechanics of the game, the world and the overall experience of the game itself reward investigations into the depths of the thing itself. The game world beckons you to imagine what ruins and layers exist beyond the walls that you can't explore. The timer at the end of the game and the mechanics of movement itself suggest that maybe you could do it just a bit faster the next time you play. The game's balance of simplicity of objectives on one hand and complexity of the world create a gratifying environment to explore and experiment. Since I began this project in early 2021, I've grown up problem with having an outdoor studio, I guess. I've grown up and I've gotten older. My hair has gotten a little thinner and I feel just a little more tired at any given moment. Metroid Prime, however, did not change in that time. Yet the community and the people that played it change. The people in the Metroid Prime speedrunning community built on the past. They kept playing the game and they kept hanging out and talking about the game and they kept interacting with it and enjoying it. Nostalgia and video games are interesting things. If you go to a restaurant that you went to as a kid and it's closed down and shuttered, you are never going to have, just categorically unable to have, the experience of eating at that restaurant ever again. Or if the restaurant is still around, it's probably the case that the menu has changed or the environment has been updated in some way to refresh the restaurant and bring it into the present. On an even more granular level, food itself is different every time you eat it even if it's the same recipe or dish. In other words, if you're nostalgic for something like a place or a meal or even a relationship, you're just never going to have that experience again. People and places change every day. Trying to grasp at an experience that we had with a person or a place in the past is just grabbing at long departed smoke. But video games, especially the kinds that used to come on discs and not get patches every few months, they don't change. They're finite pieces of art which often serve as experiences in miniature. The game world does not change. A Metroid Prime disc will always have the same data on it. Yet, the people we are when we play a game and what we expect from the game do change. To try to come back to a game and expect the same experience out of it that we had when we were younger, it's a plan for disappointment. But that doesn't mean that the experience and the game itself have no value whatsoever. I think the Metroid Prime speedrunning community and the game itself are testaments to the fact that when a game is made well, it's a springboard and a reference material for a whole world of possible relationships and experiences. This isn't of all-encompassing importance, but there are real friendships to be formed, real playful inquiry to be done, and a gratifying world to explore in well-made games. 
I mentioned earlier that when I was young, I believed that Metroid Prime had some value for me as I became interested in art. I believe that well-made art, such as video games, should enliven and expand our imaginations as we look out at the world and the people around us. The most exciting and gratifying part of this project for me has been getting to know a community of people that weren't content to merely play and enjoy the game for themselves, but felt compelled to share, discuss, showcase, laugh, argue, and just experience the substance of a thing together. Because you want to share well-made things. You want to enjoy good things together. Speaking of real friendships, I want to close this video by talking about my friendship with Tom. In fact, I'm actually going to go visit Tom because a video this long doesn't feel complete without a road trip montage. Hey, yeah. I'm going to do that later. That's in a few weeks. Uh, I'm going to finish talking about this. Tom is around my age and first played Metroid Prime as a kid like I did. He's been a part of the speedrunning and sequence breaking community of Metroid Prime ever since. After almost three years of talking to Tom almost every day about this project and just life in general, it feels entirely fitting to end this project with a conversation with my friend Tom. Thank you for joining me on my road trip. As you can probably piece together from what I said just like a few seconds of video ago in the forest studio, it took me more than a few weeks to get here, but I'm on my way to see Tom. And while I have your attention on this little road trip segment, uh, I just wanted to say a few thank yous, read a few credits, and give my sincere gratitude to everyone that helped out. First of all, I want to personally thank my wife. I could not have done this project without you. Thank you over these last few years for all of your support, encouragement, and thank you for taking this project seriously. I can't understate how important that is to just have someone by my side who takes these uh, otherwise crazy ideas seriously. I also want to say thank you, Tom. I'm gonna thank you in person in a few hours. I just want to reiterate now how much this project would not have happened without your just wealth of knowledge, experience. Thank you. I cannot wait to meet you in person and to interview you and I think it's gonna be a great way to close out this video. I also want to thank my brother Joe for just the many years growing up of enjoying video games together and appreciating them. I don't think I would have done a project like this without my little brother just over the years as we've bantered and gone back and forth about how awesome video games are. Also, thank you to my parents for letting an eight-year-old play a teen game about shooting space creatures. I don't, I don't know how that happened, but Thank you, mom and dad. In a very recent thank you, uh, on the way up here, I wanna thank Eli and the Gatesburg crew for giving me a place to stay and break up the drive. Uh, it is much appreciated. Uh, I want to thank my friend Shane for his illustrations and also for his enthusiasm and support. And I also want to thank my friends, Josh, Nate, Justin, Gareth, Cody, and anyone else that I showed clips or talked about this project to over these last few years. Again, I'm probably forgetting a bunch of people. Again, this project would not have happened without your personal support and encouragement, so thank you. For my GoFundMe patrons who made this trip to Canada possible, Gareth, Josh, Lucas, Alexander, Luke, and Ryan, as well as an anonymous donor, thank you so much for allowing me to come to Canada and to interview Tom. This has been an amazing experience so far, and I'm really looking forward to meeting him. I also want to thank anyone who did an interview in this project. Um, first of all, the three people that are on camera interviews. Thank you to Oats and Goats. Thank you, Justin DM. And thank you, Tom, although that interview hasn't happened yet. It, is, it means the world to me to be able to include the actual people involved in this community on camera for this project, so thank you. Um, however, I also want to thank uh, Fusion Varia and Caveberry for your help. Um, just chatting through some of the finer points of Metroid Prime speedrunning with me and explaining some stuff to me. Um, your guys' uh, kind of informal interviews were invaluable to make this project happen. I want to thank the edit gang. Uh, that is East, Metroid 0925, Pan, Skull64, and Tom Lube. 
These guys gave really specific feedback, tons of line-by-line -line comments of the script before I started editing. Making sure that this project was accurate and faithful to the Metroid Prime speedrunning community and the wealth of knowledge about this game was so important, so thank you for your time in reviewing this script. I want to thank uh, several Fiverr artists I used, uh, Knight for the Zach and Edgar drawings. I want to thank Dylan for the M88 and Mills uh, avatar work. And I want to thank Will, Ermek, and Hendrix for their performances as Nate, Mills, and Banks, respectively. Um, that was a fun section to work on, and I want to thank you guys for uh, helping out with that. I want to thank Home, Oliver Buckland, and Knit Effect for uh, amazing music. Um, I think the feel that the music of this video provides was an awesome addition and made me really excited to edit everything. These guys are way more popular than me, so I don't really know how much it does for me to say go check them out, but their music is amazing. Go check them out. Finally, I want to thank the Old Games Plus podcast for letting me use that interview section with uh, Zoid Kirsch. I want to thank Zoid Kirsch for making an amazing game and being such an amazing friend of the community over the years and all of Retro Studios for the amazing work done on Metroid Prime. Uh, the older I get, the more amazing it is when something really good exists rather than something bad or mediocre. If you haven't put it, pieced it together already that Metroid Prime is an amazing game based on the circumstances of its development and the passion that the team put into making it, it is definitely something that is abnormally good. So thank you to Retro Studios for making an amazing game. And the Metroid Prime community. Thank you for loving this game over the years. Thank you for making some amazing history that's worth talking about. Thank you to everyone on the Discord server uh, nowadays that has been supportive and encouraging during this project, and just thank you to everyone. I also want to specifically thank Nate for developing Metroid 2002 and keeping it online while I was working on this project. I couldn't have done all the research and gotten all the quotes and just history without the Metroid 2002 forum still existing, so thank you. And I'll just throw it out there, Nate, Kip, Radix, if somehow you ever see this and are willing to talk to me, I would love to interview you. I would love to make more content, not only about Metroid Prime, but about speedrunning and just the crazy history that people have made over the years with stuff like this. If any three of you or anyone else uh, involved in this story saw it and would love to be interviewed, reach out to me, I'd love to talk. On to Canada, my hands are freezing, getting real cold. So thanks for, thanks for sticking around so far. It really does mean the most. Go through all this effort and then to have something not be yeah. good is like very yeah, yeah, you don't want to should i put my phone away does it matter yes yeah it'll be good we need our just our human mugs right here look here at us are. here we are a couple of cards i believe that. this is a bad time to be um having a lack of sleep catch up to me here we go here we are <laughs> <laughs> hello welcome <laughs> <laughs> thank you for opening your country to me yeah absolutely <laughs> it's been I'm glad we got here. Yes. I'm glad we made it to this point. It's, it's crazy a, seeing you. It's been a journey. Let's talk through the first hours of this documentary. <laughs> how did how did a, we how did we connect of, and how did how did we get here? How did we connect? Well, I got I think Justin texted me mm. first because you you like made an appeal in the Prime Discord for like people and talking about people and I'm pretty sure Justin texted me and was like hey. Um, there's a guy that you should talk to. Oh, this guy's doing something that I've been hoping would happen for five years. Yeah, my memory was I, um, yeah, I messaged the, the Discord and I was like, hey, has anybody made this? Is anybody working on it? And someone was like, yeah, you should, you should talk to Tom. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And so I messaged you in Discord. I think it was the same night we talked to like two in the morning. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, wow. So uh, one thing I really loved that you mentioned was talking about the idea of nostalgia. And yeah. in, in Oates' interview, he talked about, it's like, okay, when you, come back to a game and you decide to speed run it, uh, suddenly it's not the nostalgic feeling you had anymore. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, you were like, I don't feel that way. Prime came out November 18th, 2002, and we got it for my dad's birthday a couple weeks later um, that year. And I've watched them, like I watched my, my father and my sister play it. And I was like, this game was just like very, I mean, visually very different, like very striking. And um, so I searched up and I found uh, Metro 2002. I was like reading like all the forum posts and I was like looking through everything and I was like these guys are like gods. And so I was like taking in all this information. So like my like my nostalgia of playing this game is going on the family computer and looking at 
videos on Metro 2002 and like go looking through forum posts and looking at people like theory crafting, like how to skip boost ball. As a child, like attempting these like really complicated things that like few people had ever done that I thought was just like the coolest thing in the world. The game is just fun. Like it's super challenging, it's super frustrating, but it's really fun and like really rewarding when you can actually nail it. And it is super nostalgic like to just play and just be like, this is like how I spent so many hours. Like I am slightly annoyed but also slightly thankful that the GameCube never tracked hours because my <laughs> final numbers would be terrifying, I'm sure. <laughs> like beyond upsetting, like summers as a kid where like I would just wake up and like, you know, I like eat stuff and like spend time with my family. But like, if I wasn't doing that, I was just playing Prime for like eight hours, nine hours a day. I, I will say again, like we talked about um, with, in terms of Prime, I think if you're looking at like in context of when a game came out, I don't think there is a game that has a better trifecta of like aesthetic, graphics, and art direction than Prime. One thing, so I love I love art, as you know, and mm -hmm. one of the things that really is like, when I look at a painting, um, you know, I say, oh my gosh, this is a good painting, when like, every time I look at it, I see something new in it. Yeah. You know, every time I like, you know, I look at it closer, or just like, oh, I'm just gonna look at this corner, mm -hmm. or like this stroke of pain, and like everything kind of knits together in a certain way that just like makes sense, and like, that's one of the things you know I've, I've alluded to, obviously in the documentary, and, and I hope has kind of come across. It's just like the sense that, like Metroid Prime is a is a finite amount of code, mm -hmm. and like in theory it is, you know there is a, a a finite amount of knowledge to be had with it. But like in the sense that it's interactive, it's a video game. Like you're always going to be able to find new permutations or new like yeah. new combinations of how certain things There's... interact and stuff. And it's like, you know, in, in one sense that's not unique to Metroid Prime. You know, no. any video game can have that, but like I think that just the There's co a... cohesiveness of the thing just as it's meant to be interacted with yeah. is, is amazing and it like invites that sort of like, you know, there is more stuff to be and done there's, with it. There's a certain feeling to it as well. And I think we've kind of talked about it like before, like we set up and everything, we were talking about it, where it's just like, it really has this sort of undescribable sort of feeling to like it just there is something about it that like you said is like feels like it is much greater than the sum of all of its parts the whole world i mean like you say in the doc as well like the whole world just really feels extremely alive and lived in and real and like it does go on past what you can just see we've talked a lot about metroid prime <laughs> <laughs> once or twice yeah we've yeah. <laughs> As an, as an outsider to this game, you know, there's part of the joy of this project for me has been discovering the depth of knowledge that there, there mm -hmm. is to be had in the game. And, you know, at, throughout the, the video so far, you know, I've really tried to kind of give my best shake of like explaining these things. Um, is, is there like a, a broad category that you think is, is missing from the story so far? Because um, like there's a lot of stuff to do with the game. Boys, there are a lot. <laughs> But um, like there, there's like, I mean, the human history is one of the more interesting parts of it because there is a lot of it and it's all been preserved borderline neurotically well. And even stuff with like them adding like Secret Worlds to Metro 2002, like I, like I said, when we were watching it, I was like, I, I remember that. I remember also feeling much like Mills and being like, I think I like this, but also I hate it. And like, it's very, it's very funny seeing that as be like, I mean, it wasn't quite a footnote because you actually did spend a good amount of time on it, but like, it's very weird seeing that like very visceral moment of my life that I lived through and being like, had very strong feelings about at the time being like, oh yeah, and also this happened one day. But like, in terms of what I think is like, important for the grand picture and to paint like a good, mosaic of the whole game as much as is reasonably possible with any actual ability to be able to complete a project or anything like that. I think you've done a very good job. I don't think there is anything I would really say that's in the scope of this video that hasn't been really looked at or fairly looked at, at least certainly not that comes to mind. Talk to me a little bit over the years about, because you've met tons of people in the Metroid Prime community. Yeah, so yeah like, absolutely. Tell me about some of the, the friendships. I don't know, what has it meant to kind of form friendships and relationships? Over yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was honestly thinking about this on the way here. I was like, it's so ridiculous realistically to me that like if this game didn't exist, I'm not meeting up with you to do an interview about said game. You know, like I'm not meeting up 
with our off-camera friend currently, Hazel. <laughs> I'm not meeting up with Justin. I'm not meeting up with like, like Chris. Like Prime is, I mean, in a lot of communities and like there's, you see all types and there's just something about Prime where it's very like, I don't know, people feel, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. Like, it just, it's just so different. Um, That's it, I like that. That might actually change the title of the YouTube video. I was like, I've heard so many people say, there's something about Metroid Prime. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the thing that everyone. <laughs> there, there is, like, no, it, it just is very, it's so weird to think about like a video game facilitating something like that. Like, it's so, disgustingly outside the scope of what a video game is for. At least that video game is for. I mean, yeah. there's some video games that are built around community, of course. But like, it just, yeah, it's so crazy outside of the, the spec of what that, what the game is for. Well, especially Metroid Prime is like yeah. a single player game. a single game. player, it's atmospheric, like, you're on your own. It's the yeah. whole point of the game is that you're on your own. Metroid Prime is like, I think it's far it's as into far the other end of the spectrum. It's as like, as you could be from it, yeah. Let alone the subject matter of like being a, a single person on a planet. Yeah. <laughs> it is so silly <laughs> that this is happening, that I'm like meeting like someone or going somewhere doing something because of this game. And it's like, I don't know, there's just something about it, like it just, it just keeps happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 20 years. Well, it's a very, it's a very problem-oriented game. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. I, I mean, that's true too. Like, it's, it does have a certain, like, despite how organic the game feels, it has a very rigid sort of, like, problem set to be solved, which makes breaking it so much more fun. That's a fun game and sort of thing, but, like, you can make it an open-world game if you want. Mm -hmm. You can play it in literally almost any order. Yeah. Like, there, there is really very, uh, as long as you're patient and skilled enough, there is a very small limit on what is possible in the game. But that's kind of the thing, too, about Prime, is like, it doesn't feel particularly naughty most of the time. Mm -hmm. And like, even like, in the scope of like, reality, like suspension of disbelief, Samus being epic and fast and cunning and using like everything to her advantage and like doing all that sort of stuff just feels very in line with the narrative. It's the same for basically every other game that I've broken like that. Um, they're, they're all very fun. And like I said, playing games incorrectly is a great joy. If you've never done it, please do it. It's wonderful. So another thing that I think is important, is there anyone that you want to thank in the video? Oh man. Um, I really, <laughs> I really want to thank Nate. I want to thank Andrew Mills. I really appreciate Kip uh, for being incredible and always being like, just pushing the bar. Like the, the 104, I think for its time is the best speed run of all time. Honestly, it's so, so ahead of the game. I think Justin for being a good friend. I want to thank Chris for being a good friend and great people that I met because of this game. A uh, quick addition to this I would like to make is uh, I'd like to give a big thanks to one of my friends, Sam, also known as Bomb Chew Bunny, for being another amazing person I've met in the community because of Metroid Prime. Um, you've always been a fantastic friend and a great person and entertaining and wonderful. So thank you as well. Um, the community as a whole, it's yeah. really great. Yeah. It's been a fantastic thing. If someone wants to play Metroid Prime right today, after watching this, what's the best way to play Metroid Prime right now? <laughs> best play to play, oh, like, the best way to play, <laughs> the best way to play Metroid Prime is the way that you can play it. So if you have any interest in anything you've learned about in this video, <laughs> get a GameCube or ideally a Wii, but a GameCube is fine and possibly easier to obtain depending on where you live. Um, and get a copy of the game, ideally the 000 version of it. But again, whichever one works fine and just play the game. It's super fun and super worth it. If you have a Switch, Pick up Remastered. Well, you want to go play Metroid Prime 2? <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Amazing. Cut.